The Senate will come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Senators Baisley, Present. Bridges, Present. Buckner, Present. Coleman, Cutter, Danielson, Exum, Fields, Gardner, Senator Gardner. Excused. Janal. Gonzalez. Hansen. Henriksen. Huckas Lewis. Kirkmeyer. Senator Kirkmeyer. Kolker. Liston. Lundin. Senator Lundin. I'm sorry, Lundin. Senator Lundin. Marchman, Michelson Janae, Malika, Pelton B, Pelton R, Priola, Rich, Roberts, Rodriguez, Simpson, Smallwood, Sullivan, Van Winkle, Will, Winter, Excused, Sensinger, Gardner, Here, Thank you. Mr. President. Here. Just a second. Morning roll call is 34 present, zero absent, one excuse. We do have a quorum. Senator Cutter, would you please lead us in the pledge? Approval of the journal. Senator Rich. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate Journal of April 3rd, 2024, be approved by and, and corrected by the Secretary. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Senate Services. April 4th, 2024, correctly printed Senate Bills 196 and 197, correctly engrossed Senate Bill 131, <coughs> correctly revised House Bills 1017 and 1256, correctly revised House Bills 1037, 1071, and 1150. Committee reports. April 3rd, 2024, Committee on Health and Human Services. After consideration of the merits, the committee recommends the following House Bill 1149 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. House Bill 1222 be referred committee to the, to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation and with a recommendation to be placed on the consent calendar. House Bill 1332 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. Committee on Agriculture and Natural Resources, after consideration of the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 185 be amended as follows and is so amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1117 be referred favorably to the Committee on Appropriations. Message from the House. April 4, 2024, the House is adopted and transmits herewith. House Joint Resolution 1021 is printed in the House Journal April 4, 2024. <laughs> what, Jeff? We're going right now. We're going to do them right now. Mr. Majority Leader. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I, I request to move out of order to take up a couple moments of personal privilege. The motion is for the Senate to proceed out of order for moments of personal privilege. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? The ayes have it, and the Senate will now proceed out of order for moments of personal privilege. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a moment of personal privilege. Granted. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, the Senate of the Colorado Le State Legislature um, convened here in the 74th General Assembly hereby extends sincere commendations to the Delta Psi Lambda, Iota Omicron Lambda, and Omicron Tau chapters of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated in recognition of Alpha Day at the Colorado State Capitol in remembrance of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on April 4th, 1968. Dr. King was killed by a sniper in Memphis, Tennessee. Dr. King was an icon and a Baptist minister who led the civil rights movement in the United States from the mid-1950s until his death. Dr. King's efforts, nonviolent tactics, and leadership led to the Montgomery bus boycott and the founding of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which helped end legal segregation of African Americans in the South and other parts of the United States. Dr. King's leadership led to the massive march on Washington and the passing of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Since his death, the legacy, message, and contributions of Dr. King had not only been recognized in America, but worldwide, so much so that a federal holiday recognize him, recognizes him, as well as monuments, streets, murals, and stamps that bear his name and images. Educational scholarships are given in his name towards higher education throughout the country. Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity members operate under the guiding principles of scholarship, fellowship, good character, and the uplifting of humanity, and proudly recognize and support the legacy of their fraternity brother, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we offer this recognition of Alpha Day at the Colorado State Capitol in remembrance of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. on request of myself, Senator Buckner, uh, Senator Exum, and Senator Fields, given this fourth day of April 2024, State Capitol, Denver, Colorado, signed by our president, uh, Steve Finberg, president of the Senate. Members, please join us in giving a round of applause and recognition to the members of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. Thank you, Mr. President. I also just wanted to share, um, you know, we, um, uh, many of the members of the, of the Black Caucus are blessed. Please take your seats, y'all. It's all good. Uh, many of the members of the Black Caucus are blessed to serve in fraternities and sororities. Uh, I'm a member of Cap Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated, one of the uh, Divine Nine uh, fraternities and sororities that we have here. Um, we also have um, the good senators from Aurora, got to be careful not to say your names, uh, who also <laughs> represent um, their sorority, Alpha Kappa Alpha um, Sorority Incorporated. Senator Exum is a part, uh, the good senator from Colorado Springs, is also a part of a fraternity. It's called Me Phi Me <laughs> Fraternity Incorporated. All are welcome to be a part of that. But his brother's so cool, he, he's on his own doing his own thing. Now, but we just want to uh, thank you all for your contributions, the work that you do in the community. Um, you know, we appreciate you even working civically uh, and being here to support the work that we're doing in the Capitol. So I just want to acknowledge you and say thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Fields. Good morning, Mr. President and colleagues. I, str I stand in strong support of this tribute and this acknowledgement of my brothers who are here today, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity. It's one of the oldest collegiate historical fraternities. And what's significant about their work is the voice for the struggle of equal rights for not only for us in Colorado, but for our nation. For, for those who don't know, Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity was also the organization that built the national mon monument that we see in Washington, D.C. Because MLK, Martin Luther King, was a member of this fraternity. And what I appreciate about you all is that your support for freedom and for humanity and dignity for the manhood and the personhood for all people. 
You've never forgotten the struggle because the struggle is not over. And your support here today just shows how important it means for us that we all make sure that we are a service for all as it relates to equality, justice, and fairness for all. I want you all to know how much I appreciate you all being here, and I appreciate all the work that you do in our community. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Danielson. Just a second. Grab this. Uh, do you sponsor one? Senator Mike Sinjane. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a moment of personal privilege. Granted. Um, hello, members. Thank you for participating in the Denim Day fundraiser. Today is Denim Day. And Denim Day was created to raise awareness about rape myths in our society. It started in 1998 when an Italian Supreme Court was overturned because the justices stated the victim's tight jeans were indicators of her consent. Since 2013, Colorado recognizes Denim Day to continue a much needed con conversation about the injustice survivors face and encourage efforts to combat the myths and stereotypes that remain pervasive in our society. With recognizing Sexual Assault Awareness Month and Denim Day, we can show survivors and those who support and serve them that we stand with survivors today and always. Senator Danielson. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a moment of personal privilege. Granted. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm going to first make the pitch. If you haven't yet, here's the bin. Please chip in. Um, this benefits CCASA, the Colorado Coalition Against Sexual Assault. They provide critical services for our community and advocate here in the Capitol on behalf of survivors of sexual assault, and uh, they, they need and deserve your support today. I, um, my, my colleague said it all. Thank you for standing with us today. And if you, if you, like me, forgot to wear jeans on the one day we're actually allowed to wear jeans, um, it's no problem. Um, please pitch in, donate, and you're doing your part. And for those who did, we typically try and, and get together and take a photograph um, so that we can show that we're doing Denim Day. I know it's budget day and everybody's very busy, so maybe we'll come around and kind of visit with you on your own. Thank you for doing this today. Thank you for your attention to this critical issue and supporting uh, CICASA and survivors of sexual assault. Senator Bridges. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a moment of personal privilege. Granted. Thank you. Colleagues, today is a very important day because obviously the budget is coming to the Senate, but that is not the most important one of the uh, things that I have worked on over the last year that is coming home today. Uh, Kit is on his way home today from the NICU. So many of you know uh, Kit was born January 30th, earlier this year. He came earlier than we expected, and so he has been at the NICU at Rose uh, since his arrival. Um, it has been a very strange journey to be a parent to a child who does not live at home, um, but he has lived with some of the most... <sighs> One second. He's lived with some of the most impressive Coloradans that we have. I uh, want to say thank you to all the folks at Rose that have provided such excellent care. His doctors, uh, West Greeby Hayashi and Lee, uh, Dr. Prouse, uh, provided excellent care for Ree uh, before and after Kit came along, and I have a tribute here I'd like to read. Thank you. The Senate of the Colorado Legislature convened in the second regular session of the 74th General Assembly, hereby extends heartiest congratulations and commendations to neonatal intensive care unit at Rose Medical Center. The members of the Colorado Senate honor the doctors, nurses, and staff at the Rose NICU for their excellence in newborn care. By treating the Rose babies, oh, <laughs> it's 
been a big week, haven't slept a lot. By treating their rose babies like the individual people they are, the NICU team builds genuine personal relationships with these tiny patients who can't speak for themselves, but certainly have a lot to say. <laughs> the caregivers do double duty by simultaneously caring for NICU parents, investing enormous time answering questions, I had many, and providing education to build confidence and allay concerns during a period marked by extremes of joy and fear. This support extends beyond medical advice, touching hearts with thoughtful gestures like personalized crafts that reassure parents their baby is cherished and celebrated even in their absence. We got a Valentine's Day card from Kit for his first Valentine's Day. We're framing it and putting it on the wall. The Senate would like to extend special thanks for the care provided to Cassidy Kit Bridges, especially by his NICU primaries, Claire, Matt, and Amy. <sighs> Kit's first friends and the greatest source of comfort to Kit's parents during his first months of life. On the request of Senator Jeff Bridges, given this fourth day of April, Kit's homecoming, 2024, State Capitol, Denver, Colorado. Thank you, everyone. Third reading of bills. Consent calendar. Consent calendar. <laughs> Will the clerk please read the title of the bill on the consent calendar? House Bill 1256 by Representatives Duran and Weinberg and Senator Janal concerning the continuation of the Senior Dental Advisory Committee. Mr. Majority Leader. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. I move for the passage of the, the bill on third reading of bills consent, final passage consent calendar, which is House Bill 1256. Is there any discussion on the bill? Seeing none, the motion is the passage of House Bill 1256. Are there any no votes? Senator Beasley. Thank you, Mr. President. I request to be counted as a no vote on House Bill 1256. Senator Baisley will be recorded as a no vote on House Bill 1256. With a vote of 33 ayes, one no, zero absent, one excused. House Bill 1256 is passed. Co-sponsors. Senators Priola. Third reading of bills. Final passage. Will the clerk please read the title to House Bill 1017. House Bill 1017 by Representatives Darty and Parenti and Senators Zenziger and Michelson Janay concerning Bill of Rights for Youth in Foster Care. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. I move House Bill 1017 on third reading and ask for your aye vote. Is there any discussion? Senator Zenzinger. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. In 2011, we put protections for foster youth uh, in our Colorado statutes, but over time, it has become clear that those protections that are currently in statute fall short, partly because of a lack of notice and a lack of enforcement mechanisms that are affiliated with those protections. It was highlighted in an issue brief by the Child Protection Ombudsman in 2021 
This bill takes those protections, converts them into true rights, and modernizes the language and concepts, pulls various rights and protections from these various statutes or Volume 7 regulation, and uh, puts these rights into one place for youth to be able to access. Uh, this is a very important bill to our foster youth in our state, and it does a couple of real key things. Um, again, all of these protections are already in statute, uh, but we are converting them from protections and guidelines that are in our statute into uh, rights. And so for that, we ask for your support. Further discussion, Senator Basley. Thank you, Mr. President. So just talking to my, uh, to my constituents, we seem to be, I know, obsessed in this building with sex and race. It comes up all the time. And well, this one, this bill begins, for good or bad, that, with the statement that uh, children and youth in foster care temporarily or permanently separated from their parents and are the responsibility of the state of Colorado. So, um, when the state of Colorado then steps in with this bill, the emphasis is on areas that a young person might be struggling with, especially when they've been in a situation not of their own making or choosing that has caused them to be separated from their parents. Page three of the bill describes that 30% of children and youth in foster care nationwide identify as LGBTQ+, and these children and youth have an additional layer of trauma that accompanies being rejected or mistreated because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. Research shows that children and youth in foster who, who identify as LGBTQ+, are more than twice as likely to be reported as being treated poorly by the foster care system. Then it goes on to give rights to those youth, to those children, including the right to attend or refuse to attend cultural, ethnic, and religious services and activities, the right to the expression of the child's or youth's gender identity and to be referred to by the child or youth's preferred name and gender pronouns. And we just heard about that in a separate bill a couple days ago. The concern that I have with this is when there's parents who step up to, to be the foster, to be the replacement, even temporary parents, to try to rescue these kids that need a home, who've had trauma, who've been in, through a rough moment, this bill restricts those parents from being able to give them the guidance that perhaps they need the most. And it's for the sake of something that's may not be in the child's interest, but the state is making that as a restriction, and I think that's just a terrible shame. So I think that this bill will do far more harm than good to these children who are in a very vulnerable moment, and then they need those parents, they need the guidance, even religious guidance, as opposed to the religion of the state, to help them through this trauma. So members, I hope and pray that you all see fit to vote no on House Bill 24-1017. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Zensinger. Thank you, Mr. President. To be clear, this is a foster youth bill of rights. Foster parents already have a bill of rights. Their rights are already outlined in statute. However, the youth's rights are also outlined in statute. Everything that is in this bill is already in statute as guidelines and not as rights. They are protections that are already outlined in statute, but they are listed as protections. They're listed as guidelines and they're already there. They're not listed as rights. So what's the problem with that? If there is a violation of these protections that are already in statute, there's no recourse. There's no 
way to address those items because they're not rights. To be clear, foster parents are not parents. They're caregivers. They're caregivers that are stepping in and being paid by the state of Colorado to care for these children while they are temporarily separated from their parents. Their parents, no matter what the situation is, still have rights to their children. And the violation that is occurring is not to the parents, it's to the youth. So to be clear, this is what we are saying that should be guaranteed. We're saying that a youth who is in foster care should have fair and equal access to freedom from discrimination or harassment. That they should be able to have freedom of thought an expression of their gender identity. And this one in particular, I want to focus on because for some reason it's become the sole focus of this bill. If something were to happen to me and my child ended up in foster care, I absolutely, 1,000% would not want the caregivers, while I am temporarily separated from my child, to start calling my child Sophia. Because my child's name is Soren. And when they go to foster care, they should be addressed as their name, as who they are. And they don't have a right the caregivers who are temporarily taking care of my child while I am separated from them for whatever reason, they don't have a right to force Soren to be called Sophia. They don't. They don't have that right. They are caregivers paid by the state to temporarily take care of my child. We are saying in this bill that they have fair and equal access to freedom from threats. That they have, they should have fair and equal access to services. We are also saying in this bill that they have a right to appropriate placement and care. that they have a right to the freedom from physical, sexual, emotional, or other abuse. They have a right They have a right to access and communication about their care. They have a right to basic essentials, and they shouldn't have to fight for them. It should be outlined in statute. We should give it to them because it is their right. They have a right to health care. They have a right to education. They have a right to participate in their own legal proceedings, and they have a right to participate in their own case planning. To be clear, caregivers who step up to become foster parents already know this, because it's already in statute. They already know this. And foster parents already have their own 
Bill of Rights that spells out very clearly what their rights are as caregivers. That's already there. What we have not done is enshrine these rights for our foster youth. They are protections. That's how they're listed right now. They have a right to the necessities to become self-sufficient when they transition out of foster care and into adulthood. Why wouldn't we want to set them up for success? Now I understand that people think that this is gonna scare off foster parents. But again, I will remind you, they are already aware of these things because they already exist in statute. And we haven't scared anybody off yet. This bill is not about the foster parents. This bill is about the foster youth, ensuring that when they are plucked out of their lives, taken away from their families, moved away from their friends, usually because there is a situation involving abuse, or maybe it's a situation in which is totally out of their control because of their parent has a problem that needs to be addressed. Maybe their parent is incarcerated. Maybe their parent has a substance abuse problem. Whatever is happening is not their fault. They are not responsible for this situation. They're being placed in a foster care setting while they are temporarily separated from their parents and sometimes they never go home. They get pulled away from their school. They get pulled away from their activities. Did you know that they're not allowed to continue in their sports or their activities that they love and cherish? I mean, I know this is going to be a surprise to you, but I was really into speech and debate. It would have devastated my life if I had not been able to continue that activity because my parent made a poor choice and I was separated from my family and having to live with strangers. In this bill, we say that when you transition into foster care, you have a right to not have your belongings put into a trash bag. You actually have the right to have the respect of a suitcase. That is what is in this bill. So to be clear, everything that is in here is existing law. The foster parents already know it. But if there's a violation of these protections, if there is a violation of these guidelines, what do they do? What does the foster child do? What does the foster youth do? Who do they go to? I don't know. Do they know these rights? Probably not. But we're, we're making sure they do. That's part of this, is we're saying, you know what? Not only do you have these protections, but we're gonna tell you about them. We're gonna educate you about them. We're gonna let you know these are your rights. We're gonna do it in a developmentally appropriate manner with your team, with your CASA, with your lawyer, and with your foster parents, whomever they may be. You will be told your rights, and you will be told what to do 
if they are violated. It's already happening, and we're going to make sure it's happening. If you can't tell, I'm pretty passionate about this. Because it's not theoretical. My family were foster parents. I have foster brothers and sisters whom we adopted that are now my siblings. I have family members who serve as foster parents. And I have a transgendered child. It's not theoretical. This is an incredibly important policy, particularly to the youth who took the time to come down and share their stories, talk about their struggles, talk about how meaningful this is to them. Because when they enter the foster care system, their lives are turned upside down. And just because their parent can no longer take care of them and they are temporarily separated from their parent does not mean that they have to give up their very essence. And oh, by the way, you can't turn around and exert your religious preference on children and youth who are in foster care. You don't get to do that. <laughs> it's in the Constitution. So I'm sorry that this bill is so offensive to some people. But I can't think of anything else that I am more proud of than this bill. Senator Cutter. Thank you, Mr. President. I heard something that was uh, rather disturbing to me, that we were obsessed with sex and race. And I can assure you that what I'm obsessed with and why we're here is to protect and uplift every single Colorado and every person, create compassionate spaces where our young people and all the people of Colorado can grow to be who they want to be without imposing anyone else's beliefs or whatever upon them. That's what I'm obsessed with. And that's, that's why I support this bill. Senator Fields. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to thank the bill sponsors for their labor and passion and compassion for foster youth. I've seen my good senator from Arvada, be a champion for foster youth in their care over the years. I celebrate your passion and your legislative agenda as it relates to dealing with foster care youth. My message is simple. Not every child lives on Easy Street. Some children are born into complex families. And these kids, to no fault of their own, find themselves in foster care system. It's baffling to me. Look at the numbers. 
Look at the numbers of kids that we have in foster care. They deserve our undivided attention, and they deserve to have a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights that are identified in this bill are simple rights. I remember two sessions ago when we passed a, them, these foster care kids to have access to know where their siblings were. Because when you are a foster care family, sometimes they separate you. You go in different directions. And if you're the oldest of that foster care family, you might not know where your sister or brothers may be. We passed legislation to make it possible for them to connect and to engage with their siblings, despite them being in foster care. This is about fair and equal access to those who find themselves in these difficult situations. And what's so great about the state of Colorado is that we have so many foster parents and people that raise their hands that says, I'll take in this child. Because sometimes this is immediate. I've talked to people who do this work social workers and others, hotlines, when they call and say, something's happening in this family, help us. They rush to those homes. They remove the child. And they put him in foster care. These children didn't do any wrong, anything wrong. circumstances of the family. We're trying to protect these kids to make sure they have the essential needs that they need, they, 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 de they deserve to have, health care, helping them transition out of foster care into, into adulthood. We need to support foster care youth. This should not be complicated. And what this bill does, it builds a support system for our foster care youth who are growing up in these systems based on complicated situations and circumstances in their family. What I appreciate about the bill sponsors and about the state of Colorado is that we have always prioritized kids that are in foster care. This is what this is about. These kids can't take care of themselves. It's up to us to prioritize their well-being. It's up to us. These kids don't have bank accounts. And most times, these, their parents are just not accessible for whatever is going on in their lives. This is about advocating for our youth who are in foster care who didn't live on easy street. And they find themselves in a circumstance where they need help. They need advocacy. They need resources. Our children are our future. We don't have the luxury of turning our back on kids because of their family circumstance. I urge an I vote on House Bill 1017 because we need to provide for our youth, and we're talking about ages five and older, 
What, a five-year-old? When their parents can't take care of them? Foster youth are not invisible, and they're not disposable. And we have an obligation to prioritize their rights as foster youth. Just because they're youth doesn't mean they shouldn't have rights. What? What's next? If our youth can't have rights to take their place in society tomorrow, how do they vote yes on House Bill 1017? Senator Baisley. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to uh, agree wholeheartedly with uh, the good senator from Arvada regarding uh, the constitutionality of the establishment of religion, First Amendment to the United States Constitution that we all started out in agreement with first day of, of the assembly. Um, my concern is that the state has become the church in violation of that, of that uh, constitutional amendment. But let me step aside for a moment and share personally that my wife and I have four kids. Two of them came into the world in the usual way, to quote Harry Chapin. And two of them um, arrived at our home as, uh, as young teenagers. I don't remember which two. They all call me dad. And amongst all four of them have been, been married. There are seven kids of theirs that all call me Papa Mark. We did not go through a state system for that inclusion, but this past Sunday, they were all over at our house. They're over our house every, every holiday, all of them, and some others that need a, need a meal. And my point is that this, this bill is specific to those kids who are put through the, the foster care system. But for those of you who have a heart for making a home for kids who need a home, you don't have to go through that system. It never occurred to us to contact the, the state about the kids that showed up on our front porch. Right, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Michael Sinjane. Thank you, Mr. President. And I think there's one thing that we can all agree on. We all love our children, and we love the children of this state. And what I'm asking for is that you look at this bill and know that we are bringing together common sense rights for these children, and that together we can love them into adulthood. Please vote yes. The motion before the body is the adoption of House Bill 1017. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Will, Baisley, Rich, Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Smallwood, Kirkmeyer, Liston, Pelton B, Pelton R, Simpson, With a vote of 22 ayes, 12 noes, zero absent, one excuse, House Bill 1017 is passed. <laughs> Co-sponsors. Senators Mollica, Hansen, Gonzalez, Coleman, <clears throat> Colker, Janal, Bridges, Sullivan, Cutter, Henriksen, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Fields, Marchman, Priola, Danielson, Hakez Lewis, Buckner. 
Please add the president. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would like to make a motion that general orders second reading of bills be laid over until Monday, April the 8th. And then we need to take a little pause so the specials will be passed out. <clears throat> Members, the motion is to lay over the general order second reading of bills. I believe that does not include the general order second reading of bills consent calendar, which I think will be added to the special orders calendar, just to clarify. So the motion is to lay over the general order second reading of bills calendar until, but, until Monday, April 8th. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no? The ayes have it, and the bills will be laid over until Monday, April 8th. Mr. Majority Leader. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate take up, let me read off all these bills. Hold on a second. I move that the Senate take up House Bill 1161, House Bill 1385, House Bill 1386, House Bill 1387, House Bill 1388, House Bill 1391, House Bill 1393, House Bill 1396, House Bill 1397, House Bill 1398, House Bill 1399, House Bill 1402, House Bill 1404, House Bill 1405, House Bill 1406, House Bill 1407, House Bill 1409, House Bill 1411, House Bill 1412, House Bill 1414, House Bill 1422, House Bill 1423, House Bill 1424, House Bill 1427, and House Bill 1428 on special orders consent calendar at the hour of 10.25. The motion is that the Senate take up all of the bills listed by the Majority Leader and listed on the special order second reading of bills calendar. Special order second reading of bills consent calendar. At the hour of 10.25 a.m., this does require a two-thirds vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will now take up all of those bills previously listed on special orders consent at the hour of 10.25 a.m. Special order, second reading of bills. Consent calendar, Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm with the Senate Resolve of Seventh Committee to hold for consideration of the special order, second reading of bills, consent calendar. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no? The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole for the consideration of the special order, second reading of bills, consent calendar, and Senator Coleman will take the chair. The Senate will come to order and the court rules relaxed. Will the clerk please read the title of all the bills on the special order, second reading of bills, consent calendar? House Bill 1161 by Representative Ortiz and Senator Henriksen concerning basic access for individuals with disabilities using motor vehicles. House Bill 1385 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning the deadline for the Department of Corrections to submit a request for an appropriation related to changes in caseload. House Bill 1386 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning the creation of the Broadband Infrastructure Cash Fund in the State Treasury to be used by the Department of Corrections to install broadband infrastructure at certain correctional facilities in connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1387 by Representative Sirota and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning modifications to the preschool program's cash fund. House Bill 1388, Representative Sirota and Taggart, Senators Bridges and Sunziger concerning an increase in the percentage of money transferred to the nurse home visitor program fund 
from the Tobacco Litigation Settlement Cash Fund in connection with making an appropriation. House Bill 1391 by Representatives Burden, Sirota, and Senator Zenziger and Kirkmeyer concerning extending the continuous appropriation authority for the Educator Licensure Cash Fund. House Bill 1393 by Representatives Burden, Taggart, and Senator Zenziger and Kirkmeyer concerning measures to reduce the cost of the Accelerating Students who Concurrent Enrollment Program and in connection with making and reducing an appropriation. Third, uh, House Bill 1396, for Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer, concerning the transfer of money from the General Fund to the Advanced Industries Acceleration Cash Fund, and in connection therewith, extending the Colorado Bioscience and Clean Technology Innovation Reinvestment Act for an additional eight years. House Bill 1397, by Representatives Sirota and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Senziger, concerning cash funds that provide funding for the Creative Industries Division in the Office of Economic Development. House Bill 1398, by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer, concerning a transfer to the Procurement Technical Assistance Cash Fund. House Bill 1399 by Representatives Sirota and Taggart, Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer, concerning discounted care for indigent patients and in connection therewith, repealing the Colorado Indigent Care Program, creating the Hospital Discounted Care Advisory Committee, and addressing disproportionate share hospital payments. House Bill 1402 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Bridges and Zunziger, concerning an evaluation of the Department of Higher Education's Information Technology Functions and Services by the Office of Information Technology and in connection therewith making appropriation. House Bill 1404 by Representatives Sirota and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Zunziger, Concerning an exception for appropriations of less than $2 million in new legislation to the requirement that appropriation increases for student financial aid align with appropriation increases to institutions of higher education. House Bill 1405 by Representative Burden, Sirota, and Senators Bridges and Sensinger, concerning the increased money received pursuant to the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act used for health services at the University of Colorado in connection therewith reducing an appropriation. House Bill 1406 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning the creation of the school-based mental health support program and in connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1407 by Representatives Sirota and Taggart and Senators Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer concerning the creation of, community, of the Community Food Assistance Provider Grant Program and in connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1409 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Bridges and Zenzinger concerning the funding of employment-related services in the state through the Department of Labor and Employment in connection therewith making and reducing appropriations. House Bill 1411 by Representatives Sirota and Taggart and Senators Kirkmeyer and Zunziger concerning an increase in the amount of fees paid to the property tax exemption fund for filing property tax exemption forms. House Bill 1412 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning clarification of the scope of the authority of the Adjutant General to disperse state money for capital asset related purposes. House Bill 1414 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Zunziger and Kirkmeyer Concerning repealing the COVID Heroes Collaboration Fund in connection therewith, transferring the balance of the fund to the General Fund. House Bill 1422 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senator Zenziger and Kirkmeyer, concerning the cost threshold of controlled maintenance projects for capital renewal. House Bill 1423 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer, concerning money administered by the Division of Parks and Wildlife in the Department of Natural Resources and in connection therewith, reducing an appropriation. House Bill 1424 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senator Zenziger and Kirkmeyer concerning the transfer of $1,496,000 from the College Opportunity Fund to the General Fund. House Bill 1427 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Zenziger concerning a requirement that the state auditor retain an actuarial firm with experience in public sector pension plans to conduct a study regarding the Public Employees Retirement Association and connection therewith making an appropriation. House Bill 1428 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning evidence-based designations to exist to assist the General Assembly in determining the appropriate level of funding for a program or practice. Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, on the record, I want to, there has been a request to remove House Bill 1420, 1422 off of the consent calendar to be moved to the second, uh, the second reading of bills, special orders, not consent. So on that, I move for the 1422, House Bill 1422. Page three. On that, Mr. Chair, I move for the passage of all the bills on special order second reading of bills consent calendar, which includes House Bill 1161, which includes the Transportation and Energy Report, House Bill 1385, House Bill 1386, House Bill 1387, House Bill 1388, House Bill 1391, House Bill 1393, House Bill 1396, House Bill 1397, House Bill 1398, House Bill 1399, House Bill 1402, House Bill 1404, House Bill 1405, House Bill 1406, House Bill 1407, House Bill 1409, House Bill 1411, House Bill 1412, House Bill 1414, House Bill 1423, 
House Bill 1424, House Bill 1427, and House Bill 1428. Is there any discussion on the committee reports? Seeing that a motion for the body is the adoption of all the committee reports on special order, second reading of the bill's consent calendar. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the committee reports are adopted. Is there any discussion on any of the bills on the consent calendar? Seeing none, the motion for the body is the adoption of all the bills on the special order, second reading of the bill's consent calendar. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the bills are adopted. Troy Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion is for the committee to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The committee will rise and report. The Senate will come to order. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee has had a number of bills in consideration. Would the clerk please read the report? April 4, 2024, Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report it has had under consideration the following attached bills, being the second reading thereof, and makes the following recommendations. There are on House Bills 1161, 1385, 1386, 1387, 1388, 1391, 1393, 1396, 1397, 1398, 1399, 1402, 1404, 1405, 1406, 1407, 1409, 1411, 1412, Motion is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? Motion is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? With a vote of Thirty-four ayes, zero no, zero absent, one excused. The committee of the whole report is adopted. House bills: 1161, 1385, 1386, 1387, 1388, 1391, 1393, 1396, 1397, 1398, 1399, 1402, 1404, 1405, 1406, 1407, 1409, 1411, 1412, 1414, 1423, 1424. 1427, 1428, passed in second reading in order to revise and place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I request a senatorial five. The Senate will stand in a senatorial five.
Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Colleagues, we are going to recess so we can go meet to go over the amendments. Uh, the Senate will be meeting in the old Supreme, the Senate Dems will be meeting in the old Supreme Court. Um, 15 minutes upon recess? Um, do I have to do 15 minutes? I think we can just go right away. Okay. Uh, immediately upon recess, we will head over to the old Supreme Court to go through amendments, um, and then we will return and go into the special order second reading of bills. Uh, on that, Mr. President, what, on that, Mr. President, I move that the... No, no, no. Do I, would, would the minority party like to announce, announce. where they are going to meet? Paul. Senator Smallwood. Senator Smallwood. Thank you, Mr. President and Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, the Senate Republican Caucus will be meeting in 15 minutes in, in five minutes, because we're allowed to do that here, in uh, <laughs> Senate Conference Room 357. <laughs> Members, to clarify, the committee meeting, the, the caucus meetings will be informal. There will be no action taken. It's a discussion. We will come back to the floor uh, um, shortly after both of those meetings are uh, complete to continue our work. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate recess until 10.50 a.m. Motion is for the Senate to recess until 10.50 a.m. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no? No. That's fair. The ayes have it, and the Senate will stand in recess.
Majority Leader Rodriguez. Start, to... Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move a call of the Senate. A call of the Senate has been... Great. A call of the Senate has been moved and probably sustained. Will the sergeants please close the doors, allow no senators to leave, and return those who are absent from the chambers?
Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the call be raised. No. Motion for the call to be raised. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. The call is raised. <laughs> Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the Senate take up. Colleagues, I will be reading one of the bills you have posted out of order, so we will be doing Senate Bill 188 first, House Bill 1430, House Bill 1389, House Bill 1400, House Bill 1401, House Bill 1403, House Bill 1408, House Bill 1410, House Bill 1415, House Bill 1416, House Bill 1417, House Bill 1418, House Bill 1419, House Bill 1420, House Bill 1421, House Bill 1425, House Bill 1426, House Bill 1390, House Bill 1392, House Bill 1394, House Bill 1395, and House Bill 1413. <clears throat> Oh, and, and also House Bill 1422 at the end of the calendar that we pulled off for consent. The motion is that the Senate take up Senate Bills 188, House Bill 1430, House Bill 1389, 1400, 1401, 1403, 1408, 1410, 1415, 1416, 1417, 1418, 1419, 1420, 1421, 25, 26, 1390, 1392, 1394, 1395, 1413, and House Bill 1422 at the hour of 1204. This requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will take up those bills on special orders at the hour of... 1204. Special orders. Second reading of bills. Senator Henriksen. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the Senate resolve itself into the Committee of Whole for consideration of special orders, second reading of bills. You heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. That wasn't convincing. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The Senate will resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole for consideration of special orders, second reading of bills, and Senator Henriksen will take the chair. The committee will come to order and the cult rule is relaxed for all. Mr. Hubler, will you please read the title to Senate Bill 188? Senate Bill 188 by Senators Zenzinger and Buckner and Representatives Byrd and McLaughlin concerning the financing of public schools. Senator Zenzinger. I move Senate Bill 188 and the Appropriations Committee Report and the Education Committee Report. To the Appropriations Committee Report. We to appropriated. The sorry, to the Education Committee Report. In the Education Committee, we made a number of amendments. Uh, in particular, we modified the high cost special education audit timeline. We clarified uh, some issues around the total program reserve repeal. We also um, added to the legislative declaration in order to accommodate uh, our uh, support for the at-risk collection uh, data for the at-risk factor. We also, um, in uh, another amendment, exempted the teacher licensure cash fund from the cash reserve limitation requirements, and we modified the assessment language by removing it. Further discussion on the Education Committee report. Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of the Education Committee report to Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. To the Appropriations Committee report. We appropriated money for the collection of the at risk factor socioeconomic data, as well as the Mill Levy Override Matching Program, as well as the rural factor. Seeing no further discussion on the Appropriations Committee report, the motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report to Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Once again, the two ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted to the bill. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this is our Public School Finance, School Finance Act uh, bill for this year. Uh, every year, the funding for our Colorado schools is a collaborative effort between school districts and the state. And in recent years, the stabilization of the state budget has required a reduction in the amount of the annual appropriation to fund the state's share of total program funding for all school districts and institute charter schools. Now, this reduction is commonly referred to as the budget stabilization factor, herein known as the BS factor. And it has created significant deficit in resources, thereby limiting our students' ability to achieve their full potential. With this bill, the General Assembly declares its commitment to finally eliminating the budget stabilization factor this year. In addition to that, Senate Bill 188 increases the statewide base per pupil funding for the 24-25 budget year by approximately $419.97. This increase takes the statewide base per pupil funding up to 8,496.38 uh, uh, cents. Uh, it also uh, sets the total program funding for the 24-25 budget year for all school districts and institute charter schools to not less than 9.7 billion. Now, the bill does some additional things that are broken up into five categories. First off, the bill does fund our schools and eliminate the budget stabilization factor. Number two, it repeals various sections of statute that are connected to the budget stabilization factor. Number three, it makes uh, one-time funding for rural schools permanent. And number four, it delays the implementation of the at-risk factor for one more year and outlines how we will calculate the at-risk factor for this year. And then lastly, it performs a number of technical changes that were requested by the Department of Education. As you know, um, this bill uh, does touch a number of provisions that are tied to the budget stabilization factor. Uh, in particular, there are two areas that we are repealing. Uh, that is the total program reserve and also the use of the contingency reserve for the purposes of the budget stabilization factor. So um, the, the second one, the contingency fund, will still remain. However, we are repealing its use of that fund for the purposes of the budget stabilization factor or the BS factor because we're eliminating it. Uh, in addition to that, our amendments indicated that what we do with those funds that are remaining in those um, uh, reserves uh, clarified where they will then henceforth uh, be um, able to use those funds. Uh, we are not repealing these provisions of the um, total program reserve or the contingency reserve right away. We are giving our school districts a year uh, in order to unwind and uncouple from these um, reserve components that were established entirely for the benefit of the budget stabilization factor. Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am so proud to be standing here with Senator Zenzinger. Um, this whole process started years ago, and she has been a champion for schools. And as chair of Education Committee, I am more than proud to be standing here with her. I'm also excited about the fact that this is going to be the most exciting year because of one-time rural school funding. This bill is adding rural funding to the district's total program formula to provide additional funding to small rural schools, schools or large school dis rural districts. Section three of the bill lists the definitions of rural schools that will be used in section four to make the one-time funding for rural schools permanent, permanent. Large rural districts means at least 1,000 students, but fewer than 6,500 funded pupils. Small rural district means fewer than 1,000 funded pupils. 
Section four of the bill creates a new rural factor also referenced as district rural funding that makes the distribution of one-time rural schools part of the funding. The funding for rural schools was first established with Senate Bill 18-217 concerning the sustainability of rural Colorado. When the funding expired, the legislature chose to continue the funding temporarily two more additional times in the SFA. Then, Proposition EE that established universal preschool also distributed temporary funding for a few years, but has also since expired. Last year, we temporarily continued the rural schools funding in the SFA for just one more year. In this bill, the rural factor will be calculated whereby small rural districts will receive $470.75 per pupil or $100,000, whichever is greater. Large rural districts will receive $177.80 per pupil or $100,000, whichever is greater. Small rural districts will receive 55.7% of the funds and large rural districts will receive 44.3% of the funding. The factor is a standalone factor that is added at the end of this formula, funding formula. Thanks. Senator Zinzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I spoke about uh, the delay of the implementation of the at-risk factor. Uh, our current law requires that our new definition for at-risk uh, in the public school funding formula be implemented this year, but unfortunately we have to delay that. Uh, the reason for that is, is that part of the new definition is to incorporate some socioeconomic data which we need to collect from the districts, but there isn't currently a mechanism to do that. Uh, in the fall of last year, we uh, did some pilot districts to experiment with the collection of that data. Uh, this year, we need to pause uh, until we can move forward with collecting that socioeconomic data, and um, there is a small appropriation to allow allow the district to be able to do that. Um, and so then, if we're not going to follow the new definition for the at-risk factor, how are we funding our at-risk students this year? Well, what the bill does is it outlines how the, the at-risk factor will be calculated, and it takes uh, the number of students that are calculated as being at risk, or uh, the greater of the school district's at-funding amount that they received last year. So whichever one is higher is the one uh, that they will use. Uh, this is just for one year temporarily. Next year we hope to be fully operational uh, utilizing uh, the proper definition. Senator Buckner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now let's talk about the Mill Levy Override Match Program. Um, the exciting part about this section is the fact that with the Mill Levy Override Match Program, for the budget year 2024, the bill requires a transfer of over $15 million from the state education fund to the mill levy override match fund. Here's what's really exciting about this. The mill levy override match program offers low wealth school districts that receive approval from their voters to approve extra taxes, a match in order to address the inequities between districts. Senator Zinzinger. And lastly, the technical updates. I will just uh, run through these very quickly. It delays a third-party evaluator report to the facility school's work group, and that's because the data is not available yet, so they can't produce the report. It also delays the facility school evaluation measures and recommendations report. That's because the data is not yet available, so they cannot produce the report. Um, also in section 13, where uh, we repealed that through an amendment, so that section no longer exists in the bill. Section 14 is conforming language for facility schools that serve detained juveniles. We changed the facility school funding model last year, but we neglected to align this area of the statutes with those changes. 
The facility schools are amazing, by the way. Also, in section 15, we increased the cap on how much can be spent on the administration for the ninth grade uh, success grant program. We adjusted it from 5% to 8%, and the reason for this is last year, we inserted the ninth grade success program into the math grant program, where we adjusted the cap for the math grant portion, but we neglected to adjust the cap for the ninth grade success program. Uh, and so we are catching up and doing making that adjustment this year. In section 16, we are amending the definition of concurrent enrollment so that uh, students with disabilities can be included. And in section 17, we clarify that students with disabilities who receive transition services and have post-secondary goals that are outlined in their IEPs are eligible to uh, participate in concurrent enrollment courses. And then lastly, the, the end of the bill is our safety clause. Um, with that, uh, that is your School Finance Act this year. Um, headline, we are paying off the budget stabilization factor, Yay. and uh, we are permanently breaking up with you, <laughs> and we are never, ever, ever getting back together. <laughs> I love it. Minority Leader Lundin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to speak briefly about three things. Process, priority, and performance. And they are all in support of Senate Bill 188, which is the School Finance Act. Um, the process piece that I want to speak to, and boy, there are so many elements of process associated with a bill of this nature um, that it would take me hours if I were going to speak about all the elements of process. I do not intend to speak to all those elements. The one piece of the process I do want to speak to is associated with the second P that I've said I will speak about, and that's priority. It is my personal opinion and I believe it should be the law and practice of the land that since funding public education in the state is the highest priority of the state, the School Finance Act should always be considered before we consider the state budget. Why? Because the habit and the pattern over the last number of years, many years, has been to do what wants to happen in state government, which since the creation of the budget stabilization factor, now gone in this particular law based on the law we passed last year that said it must be gone this year. The pattern and practice for years and years has been to create and grow new elements, new programs, new offices, new departments of state government before funding public education. And we've done it because the bills were run in the reverse order. It was not always that way. Back in the day, the School Finance Act ran through this building before the state budget was brought. That has not been the pattern over the last number of years. Quite frankly, during my service, both in the House and now in the Senate, the process was to run the long bill, the state budget, and then run the School Finance Act kind of at the end of the session. So running this bill before we run the long bill is in my mind, even though they are bunched up against each other now on the calendar, it's a step in the right direction. I would have preferred that we run the School Finance Act two weeks ago, a month ago, at the beginning of the session, saying this is what we need to do for public education. We'll get to the state budget and the balance of it later, meet our constitutional responsibilities, and then go home. It's my perspective we could do that in 60 days or less. And in fact, you all know that in my first several sessions, all four of the sessions I served in the House, I ran a referred measure that would have changed the process, made a wholesale change. 60-day session in the odd-numbered years, 90-day session in the even-numbered years, a biennial budget every other year, cut it down, less mischief, better for the people of Colorado and get it done. Anyway, back to the point. The point is, that the process that we are honoring here by running 188, the School Finance Act, before the long bill is something I acknowledge, I am grateful for, I have argued for, and we now need to get more daylight in between the School Finance Act and its provisions, and then the balance of the state budget. Because the first priority must be fully funding public education as we move forward. 
The uh, budget stabilization factor, now gone, an artifact of history, let's keep it that way, after we passed this bill, which was prescribed in the law last year, is critically important. It has been a matter of advocacy. The Republican Party has been arguing for the elimination of the budget stabilization factor for a long time to the discomfort of the governing party, quite frankly, because we didn't have to balance the budget and we wanted to be really clear what our priority was and eliminating the budget stabilization factor was a higher priority for us, apparently, than for other individuals. I remember on opening day in 2019, my predecessor, Senator Chris Holbert from Douglas County, got up from this desk right here, walked to this podium and said, it is one of the priorities of this legislative session of our caucus, said Chris Holbert, to eliminate the budget stabilization factor. That was in 2019 that we were that direct and that forceful on the issue. I am therefore grateful today to be in support of what is happening for the permanent elimination of the budget stabilization factor and its linked partnership, the elimination of this idea that schools that are funded in the 179th school district we have 178 typical normal order school districts. The 179th school district are all the students who are served by CSI. Those students deserve the same level of funding and in the law we wrote last year and the law we are writing this year that eliminates the budget stabilization factor, we must not lose sight of the fact that there is a linkage, there is a couplet there is a second part, a second shoe that drops with the elimination of the budget stabilization factor, and that is the fully funding of CSI school students at the same level as all the other students in Colorado. So I turned now to the third P that I said I'd speak about, performance. I think it's critically important now that as we get to the Amendment 23 required constitutional funding of school, that we focus on the fact that it's, at the end of the day, actually not money, but leadership, accountability to highly held standards that is critical to lifting the Colorado K-12 system from a system that currently, writ large, serves well about 50% of the students and fails about 50% of the students when you measure the metrics of performance. 50% of our students, grade three, grade five, grade eight, graduation, are proficient or above. And 50% of our students, a larger proportion than that of black and brown children and children from economic challenge are below not attaining proficiency and that is unacceptable. So the third P that I speak to as we go forward is performance. And what we must call for, we must partner with our school districts. We must, must partner with the schools themselves and the educators in those schools, the student-facing teachers, that performance must be the clarion call to which we hearken must be the element that we all focus on. Performance in our schools that raises us up away from and beyond a 50-50 proposition. We can, we must do better. And let's be clear, the literature is clear. The knowledge is present. It is leadership that makes that difference. It is leadership that will lift us up. Dollars are important, but dollars are not the defining characteristic. Leadership in our public schools is critically important. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your attention. Colleagues, I'm grateful for the process of putting the School Finance Act at the head of the list when we have these budget conversations because public education must be our number one priority. And as we move forward, we cannot lose sight of the fact that performance is absolutely 
what we must be focused on as we create policy, as we support the leaders of our public schools. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hansen. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, members, I have three ideas I want to share with you when it comes to Senate Bill 188, our School Finance Act. And I want to start in joining in the celebration for us eliminating the BS factor and appreciate the Taylor Swift references. And I hope the Vice Chair of the JVC is correct that we can permanently break up with the BS factor. But, but I want to be careful we're not rewriting history today. I so enjoy being a colleague of the minority leader, the good senator from Monument. But I think it's important for us to understand how we got here. We got here because of careful stewardship of property tax. We got here because we repealed Gallagher and did bipartisan property tax relief in its wake while uplifting local share. That is why the BS factor is zero this year. It is not a proclamation made in 2019 by the former minority leader. It is not, we should wipe this out. It is careful stewardship of our entire revenue and spending system. Property tax reform was the key to eliminating the BS factor. That is how we got to zero. To stay at zero or better, we must not repeat the mistake on the ballot in November. We could quickly be back to more than a billion dollars of negative factor in a very different School Finance Act next year if we do not carefully steward our property tax system. We are in danger of doing that this November. There are ballot initiatives that have been brought forward that would immediately put us back into a giant negative factor, not a couple hundred million dollars, billion plus. I celebrate today with everybody else in this chamber that we got BS factor down to zero. Let us not forget history or we are likely to repeat it. We must carefully manage property tax system to properly fund our local districts, period. We cannot take a step backward on the ballot this November. Second point, this bill includes a permanent provision for rural district top up and extra money for rural districts. That first started several years ago when we made a temporary agreement to put $30 million extra for rural schools, a temporary agreement that is now on the verge of becoming permanent. I certainly understand rural school advocacy on this. Don't blame them for a minute. But I think it's important to understand what we're doing in Senate Bill 188 is taking a temporary deal that was meant to expire after two years and making it a permanent part of our school finance system. Now, it's fine if this body wants to make that decision. Certainly understand why folks might be in favor of making that permanent. But the third point that I want to make is what happens when we make that permanent. And I urge you to think about a couple of county examples, one large, one small. Let's start with El Paso County. 15 school districts in El Paso County. 15. Jeffco, Denver, et cetera, Douglas County. One district, folks. What does one district help you do? It helps you reduce overheads per pupil. We have a giant amount of extra administration, software, accounting, back office dollars that are a drag on the money we put in classrooms. We are continuing that. In fact, we are double down. We're having a double down on that problem in the current version of 188. I think that is something we should correct. El Paso County, 15 districts. 15 superintendents, 15 accounting departments, 15 HR departments, 15 sets of software that have to be purchased separately. Why do we continue this? Second example, a smaller county, Otero County. This is not to pick on El Paso or Otero, but Otero County, relatively small population, has six 
school districts, many of them just a few miles apart. Now, I grew up in a small town. I understand how important it is for the school district and the football team and the basketball team and all the great things that go with high school activities for your community. I get that. I grew up in that situation. My dad was a coach and, if you can believe this, my teacher for three out of my four years in high school. Imagine that for a second. But I survived. But here we are in Senate Bill 188 continuing a huge amount of overhead expense that is not ending up in classrooms. So that means the good students in the Swink District in Otero County are going to receive double the per pupil funding than the students in Jeffco, Denver, Adams, and the larger districts around the state, Douglas County included. Now, I certainly understand there are reasons why the rural districts need some extra help. I'm not arguing against that at all. What I'm asking for is that we get serious about reducing overhead expenses in these small districts around the state. The state can play a leadership role in helping to combine things like the HR department, the software procurement, sharing superintendents. There are so many ways that we could do better when it comes to supporting our rural districts than simply putting an extra 35 million in the pot so that a few districts get significantly more per pupil. We need more cooperation, we need more sharing of resources. So to summarize, point number one, I hope we can never go back to the BS factor, but we're in danger of it this November. Let's not, re let's not repeat history. Point number two, rural funding was meant to be a temporary measure to be replaced by something structural that would make our system more efficient. We have failed to do that in Senate Bill 188. Point number three, I gave examples from Otero and El Paso County of clear ways that we can do better when it comes to supporting our rural districts. Members, I plan to support 188 today, but I want us all just to take a moment to think about how we can improve this together over the next couple of years. I think we've missed an opportunity here and I look forward to working with everyone to address this problem in future sessions. Minority Leader Lundin. Oh, get Minority Leader Lundin then. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I rise to, in, in many ways, align myself with the, the comments the good Senator from Denver has just um, laid upon the table, so to speak. Um, but before I dive into the policy conversation, I want to point out that apparently three years of what was kind of a homeschooling situation was not something that the good senator from Denver just survived. It's clear that the young man thrived and is now a leading light in the policy conversations of the Senate. So to engage on the, the issues where I think we have um, heard cautionary notes that uh, we have gotten here by careful stewardship, I would say careful stewardship is always the hallmark of what we should do and be as we craft the policy of Colorado and fund the efforts of Colorado. Um, and I want to call out and make clear that as we're talking about this School Finance Act, which is about a $9.7 billion proposition, it's a lot of money, um, the, the conversation around careful stewardship of property taxes and general fund dollars in this bill, about $5.1 billion of state fund, about $4.5 billion is local share, um, which is an echo of property taxes. The, the careful stewardship is, is critically important. And the way I would begin the conversation around careful stewardship is, well, let's pick our priorities. We today in Colorado, as we pass this budget later today, the long bill, will be creating a budget for the state of Colorado, all measures included, of about $40 billion. $40 billion. Big, big number there. But that's only part of the efforts of the state of Colorado, because we have this thing that happens in Colorado called enterprises. When you combine the state budget and the enterprises budget, it's about an $80 billion proposition. 
We've got $40 billion in the budget that we're all going to vote on, and we've got another $40 billion plus with the growth of the four or five new enterprises created under 260 a few years ago of almost 40, more than $40 billion. So for the, the conversation around careful stewardship, and I so enjoy personally the meaningful, challenging, important policy conversations that we can occasionally engage in here in this well. As we engage on the careful stewardship, I say the careful stewardship begins with prioritization. Prioritization. Start with schools. Start with public education. Don't go out grabbing every dollar we can possibly get, but take the dollars that we have, the money that is raised, taken from the people of Colorado, by the, earned by the sweat of their brow, the return of their thoughtful and intelligent investment, the growth of the enterprises and the profitability of those enterprises so they can reinvest in Colorado. As that money is taken from them, from the marketplace, from individuals, the $80 billion plus, I would argue, we're talking about in this conversation, let's make sure we are using and prioritizing education first and using those dollars wisely. To the question of the permanence of rural funding, I, I truly, truly wish that I could stand here and say to you as, as the outcome of years and years of careful work and careful consideration, a process that uh, uh, the former Speaker of the House, um, now the uh, Chief of Staff to the Governor, Alec Garnett, and I as co-sponsors, co-prime sponsors, years ago created while both of us were serving as members of the House, a school finance formula re-envisioning, rework. I, I wish I could say I'm sanguine that we will have a great school finance formula re-envisioning, rework. I, I, I'm, I'm not incredibly optimistic about that, but I still hold hope eternal. I'm an optimist that we can do something on that. And it should have done something about the fact that sparsely distributed students across rural Colorado, you can't turn your back on rural Colorado. It is part of the ethos. It's part of the ethic. It's part of who we are as a state. It's the place where people travel from around the country and around the world to understand what it feels like to be in Colorado. The feeling of who we are as Coloradans comes from those rural districts and the students in those rural districts. It comes from all the students, let me be clear. It comes from all the students, but what people think about who don't live in Colorado, they don't think about the Front Range. They don't think about, oh boy, I want to go visit downtown Denver and, and see how the homeless crisis is proceeding. They think about, I want to go to the mountains of Colorado. I want to go to the rural area of Colorado. So it's critically important that we support and maintain the <laughs> rural ethos of who we are. And to do that, we have to support the schools. So the point is, Permanent funding for the rural schools is critically important in this measure as 188 drives forward. And I wish, quite frankly, that we had a formula that we're considering in a more meaningful way sparsity and supporting students that come from that rural area. To the final point, I find myself in perfect alignment and perfect agreement. Um, and I, I don't mean to put words in my colleague from Denver's mouth, that would be unsanitary. But leadership in the policy making around public education and leadership in the districts and in the schools, leadership starting here that looks at these hard questions of as administration grows and grows and grows and grows faster than the paychecks of school teachers individuals, actually student-facing teachers, as the administrative expense of the districts grows dramatically faster than the paychecks of student-facing teachers, we must consider what can we do, what should we do, what must we do to improve those metrics and make sure the money is going where it needs to be going in the classrooms to 
engage and accelerate enthusiastic students, support engaged parents, and reward exceptional teachers. That would be the call. That would be, those would be the markers I would lay down as we think about what public education should look like. What are we doing to recruit enthusiastic students? What are we doing to engage parents? And what are we doing to reward exceptional educators? Thank you, Mr. Chair. There is quite the uh, queue that has formed. I'm going to give the sponsor uh, the right of response, and then the order of hands I saw were Priola, Pelton R, Kirkmeyer. Okay, so we'll go. We'll go. Ze we'll go. Priola, Kirkmeyer, Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this will be my 16th and final school finance debate and uh, budget debate today. Um, it's, good, it's good to finally see the BSF zeroed out. I, I could even like tell you some history on the term. You know, it's changed through the years. These 16 years, it wasn't always called the BSF. Um, I do want to speak to the fact that I think attention needs, or I know attention needs to be brought to the fact that there, in my opinion, and I spoke to this in appropriations, and I've been on record through the years, I think the cur current school finance formula needs to be looked at and tweaked because the current school finance formula was only changed in the 90s because of a court case. But in my opinion, it inherently um, benefits small rural districts to game the system and, and remain small and from discussion I had with others a number of years ago, uh, they act, some districts actually split before, I, I can't remember the law that went into effect. But I even ran a piece of legislation back in 2019, here it is, uh, SB 19-183, where there is current law that would allow these schools to, to merge without uh, going through the, the usual discussion that we have of how, how difficult it is, how difficult it is for us to find economies of the scale. Um, first of all, uh, one of the, okay, dissolution and annexation exempts from school district organization planning process, notwithstanding any provision of this article 30 to the contrary, the school district board of education and one or more of the contiguous school district boards of education may follow the procedures and requirements su sufficed in this section for the dissolution and annexation of the territory of the school district if at least one of the following conditions exist. Uh, the main thrust for me running this piece of legislation back in 19 is in Adams County, we have two districts that have been struggling for years, I will not name them, but to me, as a businessman, it makes perfect sense for them to merge and uh, leverage those economies of scale. But this, this bill would also help out rural schools who are interested in leveraging economies of scale. So let's go to the, the at least one of the following conditions that exist. The state board pursuant to the provisions of this section 22-11-209 declares the school district is no longer accredited, that's one, or the school district to re uh, reorganize. So the state board could do this. Or B, the school district does not provide within the school or school district a full 12 grade educational program or the school district enrolls fewer than 50 students. And I remember we set that number of 50 because at the time there were a number of districts that had below 50 students. And going through the, uh, the Appendix A and the, the Canary Sheet, I realize now a lot of the, these rural schools, they're all just above 50. And I mean, good for them. Maybe enrollment's gone up 20, 30 students in the last five years, but, um, or maybe it's, maybe it's, they don't want to have to uh, be triggered by this, this piece of legislation. The point is, there are many opportunities that currently exist, and I think it's an insult to the students of the state of Colorado that we are wasting resources by having five school districts in Kit Carton, Carson County, 15 school districts in El Paso County. The city and county of Denver has one school district. 
the re why does El Paso County need to have 15 school districts? Jefferson County has one school district. Uh, Los Animas County has six school districts. Lincoln County, which has a population of 4.7 thousand people, has three school districts. Otero County, as the good senator from Denver mentioned earlier, has six school districts. There, the population of Otero County is less than 27J, which was one of my districts. Otero County receives 20,000 plus and then 18,000 plus per pupil, where Adam 27J, uh, one of my districts, receives near bottom in per PPR and has for the years I've been down here. The school districts, many of my school districts do not uh, qualify for the size factor. They don't qualify for the rural factor. They do qualify for ELL and, and others, other factors as well. But my hope is in the coming years, a hard look is foist upon this issue. I know in the past, in the 50s, I think they consolidated them from a number much higher than the current 178. But I think in the modern age, there's still work that can be done to do more with less for the benefit of our students, for their education, and economize back office and administration, which the statistics will bear out, has grown exponentially over the last decade or two. So with that, I still rise in support of Senate Bill 188 and uh, appreciate the sponsors for working so hard on this piece of legislation. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I rise in strong support of Senate Bill 188, and I want to thank both of our sponsors for bringing this bill forward, because this, as we talked about in education, is a monumental day. It's a monumental bill. It's important. One, we are doing the School Finance Act before the long bill. That's important. No longer, we're saying no longer are we going to balance this budget on the backs of students. We're going to put them first. So thank you for doing that. I, I greatly appreciate it. You know, I sat in on the Education Committee again this year for the exact purpose that I could be here and vote on this bill in committee and talk about this. Because between last year and this year, we have pushed through being threatened. We have pushed through short-sighted budgetary requests. And we have assist, insisted on adhering to the Constitution. We not only are finally eliminating the BS factor, totally. I mean, we got to vote on this in the Joint Budget Committee first as well. But we're fully funding charter schools. We've increased funding for special education. We've increased funding for gifted and talented. We've just done so much, and now this year we have the added bonus of addressing the need of rural schools and making it permanent. No longer playing politics with rural Colorado and rural students. We are taking them into consideration first as well. You know, there's been discussion up here about um, consolidation and how we should be doing things in our rural districts. I just want to mention a few points. First, um, I read through this National Education Policy Center. They put together a report about consolidation. And I will just give you the highlights. It said, consolidation is not a reliable way to obtain substantive fiscal or educational improvement. So all this talk about how we, we need to consolidate rural schools, I don't know where it's coming from because it's not about educational improvement. It's not about substantial fiscal improvement either. In fact, what happens with consolidation is you still have the same students. You won't have less students. You won't have less travel time on a bus. And you don't have less taxes. But what you do have is, in rural districts, is you have less extracurricular participation. You have less parental involvement, and you have less community support. 
Consolidation takes us backwards in what we're trying to encourage with our parents to be involved in their students' education. Where we're talking about the community needs to get behind their schools. And I appreciate the conversation about that we don't want history to repeat, that we don't want to get back to where we have a budget stabilization factor. Agree 100%. And I heard the discussion that we can't stay at, we won't stay at zero if we don't pay attention to the property tax bills that are coming or initiatives that are coming up this year. I would say we need to look at ourselves first. First of all, we can't expect to stay at zero and no budget stabilization factor if we think it's a good idea to deplete the state education fund and become reliant on overexpending general funds for things that aren't education. We can't expect to stay at zero and not have a budget stabilization fund if we think it's okay to balance the budget on the backs of students. We heard about the tax initiatives coming forward. Well, folks, you need to start thinking about what portions of our budget is funded with severance taxes and federal mineral lease royalties. Those state lands that are all over my county and Weld County that provide funding to education, you know, those best grants, those best dollars. At one point, over $100 million a year was coming from off of those state lands and oil and gas activity on those state lands that was going into the permanent trust fund. That's where those funds come from. We put money into an operational account in the Department of Natural Resources that's severance dollars. We put money into a perpetual base account in the Department of Natural Resources. Those dollars this year are helping us balance this budget. Oil and gas, you know what their assessment rate is? 87.5. Residential is at 7.1. It's lower right now because of our actions, but typically it's at 7.1. Oil and gas is at 87.5. Without oil and gas, there are at least three school districts, and I didn't add them all up, but there are at least three school districts that would lose close to $200 million in property tax revenue just from oil and gas. So when you're thinking about driving oil and gas out of the state, an industry that actually is not our number one source of air pollution problems, you should also think about, and you can go look at, you can go look at, You should think about the loss in property tax revenues that goes to schools through the BEST program, through the Department of Local Affairs that has an energy and mineral impact grant program. You should think about the loss of property taxes there before you go trolling off down that path again. And if you expect to stay at zero, you can't sit here and try and reconfigure a formula and work in the dark. You can't think that we have to add a half billion dollars to make your formula work. Because otherwise, we will be right back here trying to figure out how we balance this budget. And I'm afraid because of your over expenditures and your over reliance on general funds for other programs, that we will get back to a budget stabilization factor. You know, you make it sound like it can't happen that we can't figure out how to prioritize, that we have to be careful stewards of property tax, we need to be careful stewards of the general fund revenues that come into this state. And I will just remind you all that Amendment 23 was passed when there was a Republican governor in office. And for his last four years of his term, we didn't have a budget stabilization factor. We adhered to the Constitution, and we funded education first. And we made it a priority. So to say that we can't do it, 
It's all about priorities. It's all about saying education is first. It's been proven it can be done. You just need to adjust your priorities and think about what you're doing with all of your other bills. Again, I am proud to be able to stand up here. I was proud to be in committee last year when we put in the School Finance Act that we would eliminate the budget stabilization factor in 24-25. I was proud to be in the Education Committee a couple of weeks ago when we got to vote on what I called last year was the best day. This time in the Education Committee, it was a great day because we kept our commitment. We kept our commitment to the students and the people of Colorado that said we are putting our students first and funding education. So I am greatly thankful to our bill sponsors for having the tenacity, the guts, and the courage to push back against all of the negative stuff you were getting and bring this bill forward. I urge a strong I vote on Senate Bill 188. Senator Zenzinger. Senator Pelton R. Followed by Senator Smallwood. I told you I could never forget you. And Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's some talk about rural schools need to learn how to consolidate a little bit. I've got some numbers here. I picked out six of my counties. I, my counties are all rural or frontier, most of them frontier. So I picked out six of them. Cheyenne, Kiowa, Kit Carson, Los Animas, Lincoln, Baca. There's 21 schools currently in those counties. There used to be 42. They've already done a lot of consolidating. A lot of these kids, these schools don't have a certain athletic program, so they travel to other schools to be in athletics. Some of them hour and a half one way just to participate in sports. El Paso and Otero were singled out as kind of extreme examples. So I thought I'd bring those numbers just to kind of show the reality. There was a statement, rural schools are just gaming the system. That is falsely wrong. We have huge transportation costs. Amongst other costs, we have at-risk students higher than the city schools. So I really appreciate this bill and the, uh, the part of it that is going to make the extra funding for rural schools permanent. Uh, since I've been here, I have either sponsored or supported the amendment to add the extra money to rural schools. So this is very much a, a needed part of our school finance, and I take exception with some of the statements that have been made up here. The unforgettable senator from Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, we will not be referring to Title 18 today. Um, I do want to. I do want to say. A few words. I think it's important. I think you heard from the senator from Weld County this already, but it's. It. I had to s just briefly mention. It's. Um, it just seems so hypocritical, to hear from, this spot, so many people complaining about, the lack of funding available, for education for our schools, and these very same people, are. The, the folks who are driving the initiatives to, drive, to, to, to take out tax revenue in our state. The very same people. The very same people that say there's not enough property tax revenue coming in, not enough severance tax revenue coming in, are the exact same folks that are dr doing their best to drive, for example, oil and gas out of our state. Oil and gas who provide millions and millions of local tax dollars, tons of money towards education, and so we're speaking out of both sides of our mouth now. Want more money for education, but don't want to give anything up. When it comes to budgeting priorities, when it comes to running bills, what do the bills say? Get rid of oil and gas, 
replace it with other industries that don't bring in a fraction of the amount of revenue. That's the solution. Plowing money, grant program after grant program after grant program into the nonprofits around our state, which do a great job, which are worthy. But then to have the nerve to come to this podium and say the problem that we have in this state is that there's not enough revenue. So we're taking the revenue dollars that we do have and I mean, again, no offense to the not-for-profits, they do a fantastic job. I think their state, our state is far better with them than without them. But what, what do the nonprofits themselves do for bringing in revenue into our state? So you can't have it both ways. If you want to support the not-for-profits in our state, if you want to support the grant programs, and you want there to be ample money for Medicaid, and you want there to be ample money for corrections, and you want there to be ample money for this, and you want there to be ample money for that, then let's be smart when running bills and do our best to not destroy industries that help bring in those revenue dollars that we so desperately need in our state. Let's certainly not be hypocrites and let's not speak out of both sides of our mouths. Um, I rise in support of uh, Senate Bill 188 and would ask for an I vote. Senator Zenziger. Are we done? Senator Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to come forward and just um, express my gratitude um, for eliminating the budget stab stabilization factor. It's a huge accomplishment for which we should all be proud. Um, I also want to um, uh, appreciate uh, the education, haha, that I received um, from the good senator from the east side of Denver, um, Senator Hansen, for, because the good senator from Hansonville um, has um, raised uh, an important point um, about uh, the need to further discuss um, the ways in which all of those tiny little rural districts um, go forward and then lead to um, less money being available to the actual instruction of children in this state. It's worthwhile of a longer conversation. I'm certainly, um, in my six years here in this um, august body, have never really delved into education, um, the structural issues um, uh, regarding education. Um, but now that we've meaningfully addressed one big structural challenge, being namely the, B, the BS factor, now let us um, move forward and tackle the next. Um, and so uh, grateful and appreciative to the education um, and to the leaders um, of this important work. Um, I look forward to further and continued conversations. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the sponsors of this um, critically important piece of legislation. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, members. Um, I very much appreciate the conversation that we've had today. Um, I just wanted to kind of wrap up um, our, our conversation so that we can move on um, to some very important bills that are still ahead of us, uh, one of which is the budget, which contains the funding for the School Finance Act. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, I just want to point out um, that currently Colorado does make a, a significant effort in its formula to support small school districts uh, by applying what is called a sliding scale multiplier uh, known as the size factor. So uh, the way that we apply the size factor, it's uh, to base that per pupil amount in small districts, um, then what the state does is that we increase funding to address diseconomies of scale. And uh, these diseconomies of scale are faced by these smaller rural districts. Um, and, and we do a pretty good job of it already within our size factors. But there are a number of options and uh, there have been a number of critiques over the years. Um, as a, a, a member of the School Finance Task Force um, that I served on for many years with um, several people in this room, 
What we learned in examining our formula closely were some of the inequities that were built into our formula. And in particular, our current size factor does not necessarily um, uh, represent all of the challenges right now that we are trying to address through the size factor. Um, so there have been lots of different efforts uh, in order to address this. Um, and that's because the unique costs in these rural and remote districts are not merely due to their, those districts' small enrollments or size. It has to do with their uh, remoteness uh, their lack of urban center to draw from for a number of things, goods, services, educators, um, and so on and so forth. So, for example, um, some of these unique costs in these rural remote districts that are not merely due to their district size or small enrollments um, have to do with things like teacher attraction. Uh, we know that right now, um, I have the most recent report from CDE that uh, uh, the close to 90% of our teacher shortages in the state, which to be clear is approximately 3,000 teachers, occurs exclusively in our rural districts. Um, we also know, um, based on uh, data that I have from CDE, that the majority, uh, the higher majority of at-risk students also are in our rural communities. Um, and uh, so um, that makes it difficult to be able to provide the services that are needed in, a, in order to support those students' education at a, a rate that is oftentimes more expensive than um, an urban area. Uh, in addition to that, um, at the same time, uh, we've also noticed that there are some greater transportation needs. In particular, if they are a sparsely populated uh, district um, or that is um, uh, populated or has poorly uh, connected areas. So for example, I lived on the Western Slope and um, even though I, am in, I uh, grew up in a fairly large district, I do have to note that there was one mountain pass <laughs> between me and the neighboring town that happens to be in the same district. Um, it was, you know, it, it's, it's difficult, it's challenging when you have those types of uh, barriers inside and contained within a, a single district um, because then you can't just share uh, uh, an, an, an SSP. You can't just share an audiologist in those instances, uh, which is how you try to get around those diseconomies of scale. So uh, recognizing that we have those challenges, Colorado is uh, one of many states in the country that addresses uh, these uh, challenges through some sort of uh, funding um, that helps to deal with these diseconomies of scale. Um, and for, uh, in particular, um, the, the area that we are trying to address with this one-time funding, which we are now making permanent, is to get at those sparse and remote qualities that are not currently represented in the size factor. So um, that, that's a little bit of background about why it is that we uh, made the decision um, to include it. Also, um, in these districts where they are experiencing these diseconomies of scale, um, one of the, the greatest challenges is with teacher recruitment, retention, and salaries. And you can't uh, increase your teacher pool, you can't increase your teacher salaries on one-time money. So while districts have been enormously grateful for um, those additional dollars um, over the last eight years that we have um, chosen to distribute those um, dollars, uh, they can't use it to their highest and best use. Uh, they're, they're restricted in being able to employ those dollars for what may be actually their greatest need, uh, which is somewhat inefficient, 
uh, with the scarce resources that we are um, offering these districts. So um, that's a little bit of background. Um, I do want to um, thank all of the individuals that have come down here to speak um, on this issue because it is quite complex and I know that everybody is coming from um, a place of good intention and, and that's why I appreciated the conversation that we had today. But with those um, uh, wrap-up comments, um, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone and remind you and renew my motion for uh, the passage of Senate Bill 188 in order to finally pay off the budget stabilization factor and fund our public schools. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll just kind of highlight um, some of the points that the good senator from Arvada pointed out and reiterate those. And sorry, missed the cue and the, and the conversation <laughs> didn't unfold perfectly, but um, Stan then, again, proud to be here and part of this body where we did eventually and finally um, eliminate the BS factor. Really proud to be part of this body and, and accomplish that, that significant feat. I, I couldn't let, I could not miss the opportunity to come up here and challenge the assertion that small school districts are gaming or manipulating the system. That's absurd. I'd go, go to these rural schools and communities where I'm, I have students in the, in the oldest high school in Colorado, constructed in 1903 or 1906, still going to school there. Or go to a school where the principal is also the bus driver. He's also the coach. He's also the janitor. He's also, he or she is also the server. It's just um, challenging, and the good senator from Arvada really did a good job of outlining that diseconomy of scale and the challenges in rural Colorado. I'm, I'm proud to represent 30-something different school districts, and consolidation does happen and is currently happening today where it's the right thing for the students. As long as student outcomes drive this conversation, we'll, we'll, we'll end up in a really good space. And I'll, I'll highlight the good senator from Denver's conversations about where we could find opportunities to be more efficient and effective. I talked to him and fully supportive of that, advancing that conversation, and can think of higher education, particularly in rural schools, set a good example between Adams State, Fort Lewis, and, and Western, where they can come together and secure one software um, provider to do student services. And I think there are examples there that we can follow in the K through 12 space as well. So um, stand in full support of, support of 188 and thank you to the chair of the Education Committee and everybody else for all their hard work on the School Finance Act. Thank you. The motion, Senator Buckner. I just have a couple of uh, comments and thanks for the vigorous conversations we've had. We hear you, we hear the comments you've made. We just wanna get better and I want to thank uh, JBC committee. I want to thank Senator um, Kirkmeyer for being fearless and standing with us to make sure this gets done. And I grew up in rural America. I went to a tiny little school. So I know what it's like as chair of education, I know what it's like to be ignored and making sure that we need to focus on those districts with at-risk students in our rural districts and small districts get overlooked too many times. So with this bill, we're making sure that that doesn't continue to happen. But this is an amazing day to get rid of the BS factor, make, making sure that we serve all of our children the best we can. So we are asking for your support and an I vote on this important bill. The motion is the adoption of Senate Bill 188. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and 188 is adopted. <laughs> Mr. Hubler, will you please read the title to Sen or House Bill 1430? House Bill 1430 by Representative Byrd and Senator Zenzinger concerning the provisions for payment of the expense of the uh, expenses of the executive, legislative, and judicial departments of the state of Colorado and of its agencies and institutions for and during the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2024, except as otherwise noted. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 
1430 and the Appropriations Committee Report. To the Appropriations Committee Report. We stripped out all of the House amendments and appropriated money. That is a very brief description indeed. Uh, further discussion on the Appropriations Committee Report? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee Report. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the committee report is adopted. <laughs> Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, before we get started on um, the debate here and the amendments to the long bill, first thing I want to do is thank the JBC staff and our director, Craig Harper, and all the staff for all of the work that they have put into this, the late nights, the early mornings, the good times, the maybe not so good times, um, all the arguing and stuff that they heard. Um, but they've been phenomenal and helping us to put everybody to put together your amendments. They have really come together and been phenomenal on putting that together. I also want to thank Ted, who was out there making the hamburgers, barbecuing the hamburgers, flipping burgers, and doing the hot dogs. Thank you, Ted, and the staff here for putting lunch together for us. Appreciate it. And then lastly, I just want to say this. Today is your day. The Joint Budget Committee has had the long bill since about November 1st, somewhere in there. And we've been working on it, and yeah, we kind of think this is like our baby and our, our deal. But today is your day. This is the day that you get to have your impact, put your fingerprints on the budget. Make your priorities known and make your comments known. This is your day. So I am looking forward to the robust discussion. And what I would say to all of you, I want you to give it your best shot. Let us know how you feel. We're looking forward to hearing from all of you. There is. <laughs> and. Amendment. Amendment number There's a member on the desk. Would the clerk please read J126 to 1430? J126. Senator Gonzalez. Amend the appropriations. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move J126, Amendment 1, and ask for an I vote. It's a proper motion. Any discussion? Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, colleagues, I want to um, explain um, and, and help lay some foundation as to why I am running uh, this amendment, um, which I will note uh, was uh, adopted by the House with bipartisan support. I am grateful uh, to the work uh, and the diligence of our Joint Budget Committee. Um, a few pieces that I will note uh, from the figure setting document uh, for this upcoming fiscal year 24-25 as it relates to the Department of Corrections budget. The staff recommended that the Joint Budget Committee select the larger of the two prison population forecast uh, projections, um, whereas the LCS, the Legislative um, Council staff, uh, request demonstrated a 24-25 surplus of 73 beds uh, for the male prison bed forecast. Um, the DCJ, the Division of Criminal Justice um, forecast, advocated or demonstrated a need for an additional 116 beds. Now, um, 
you may think, okay, well, um, that's not that many beds, and so let's go forward and, um, you know, budget conservatively, and, um, and uh, that way we can prevent having to, you know, potentially swallow um, a uh, large supplemental later on down the road. However, just look at what happened in 23-24, where um, because DOC um, had actually watched its prison population fall, um, in 23-24, the um, supplemental re resulted in a reduction of um, several uh, hundred beds. Now, part, uh, 286 to be exact, um, because that prison population growth was lower than projected. Guess what? Maybe I buried the lead. Crime's falling, colleagues. And um, DOC, in its methodology, excludes nearly a thousand prison beds from their what is termed to be operational capacity. And that's what JBC uses to determine how many beds are needed, even though many of the beds are actually used. DOC excludes 516 restrictive housing beds that are used, 312 male beds and 31 female beds to maintain their 2.5% vacancy another 115 male beds for maintenance, and other beds used for the infirmary, for investigations, uh, and for holding. That methodology artificially then increases the need for even more beds. So this budget for 24-25, um, House Bill 13, the, the long bill, House Bill 13, 1430, includes an additional 300 plus beds. But that's not what you see reflected in, in terms of reduction in J126. You only see a reduction of 116 male beds, 50 female beds. Where would we direct that cost savings to? Three places, one, uh, J126 would uh, redirect uh, that funding to other public safety priorities. One, continuing the Grand Junction in Trinidad um, crime prevention pilot programs at their current funding levels. Two, reducing the weight for competency restoration for people when they are um, deemed uh, unable to stand trial. The wait lists are absurdly long, and this would help ensure that people receive treatment more quickly. And three, providing resources to expand childcare for people who are in treatment and recovery support services for folks on parole. So, I think over the past several years, you all certainly remember last year's um, uh, budget discussion where we raised questions about DOC's methodology. We said, y'all, why do we continue to expand our Department of Corrections? This year, the overall budget for the Department of Corrections is 1.17 billion, with a B, dollars. Amendment J126 takes but three million of that billion plus budget and puts it towards other incredibly important public safety priorities. The last point that I will um, raise and I will um, extend appreciation for is the fact that um, the DOC um, is creating a new uh, unit to house transgender inmates. This amendment doesn't reduce that, the funding of those beds in any way. Whether you agree with it or whether, it don't, whether you don't, J126 doesn't address that. 
But what I think we all can agree on is that there are significant um, public safety needs, and this amendment moves in a, in a pretty nuanced way to ensure that we are actually addressing those, those public safety needs by reducing the um, artificially inflated um, uh, methodology for prison bed capacity. I ask for an I vote on um, Amendment 1 uh, or J126. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion on the amendment? Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Sincerely appreciate the good senator from Denver, the other good senator from Denver, um, and their amendment that they're bringing forward. And I know um, the good senator from Denver spent a lot of time at the Joint Budget Committee, especially when we were having discussions with the Department of Corrections. Uh, not sure if she was there when we were going through figure setting or even the hearing with them, but um, nonetheless, she was there and she's been deeply involved in this, so I appreciate her comments. I will just say this with regard to this amendment and um, would request a no vote on the amendment. Prison caseload was heavily, heavily negotiated between the department and the JBC during figure setting. And the JBC significantly cut funding from the department's request. Believe me, they didn't get out unscathed. We had them in front of us for quite some time. Um, and we got to the point where actually uh, we made changes in made changes with regard to when the Department of Corrections has to get information to the Joint Budget Committee and can no longer wait 24 hours or even 48 hours prior to the hearings and such before we get the information that we need. So um, we went over this quite a bit. Um, the JBC action on the caseload in the long bill does not increase prison beds. It funds existing beds, it funds closed beds that are not in current use. There is actually no bed expansion. Um, does fund closed beds and existing beds that are currently not in use. <clears throat> the whole discussion about reserve of prison beds, um, that was a discussion we also had at the JBC. And the DOC, um, the Department of Corrections came through and said that they, we worked it through that they don't have a surplus of prison beds. Describing these beds as surplus is actually inaccurate. Um, a surplus is more than what you need. And the DOC made it very clear on what they actually need. And in fact, our JBC staff analysts went through this with a fine tooth comb, feel pretty comfortable to, with where we got in our negotiations with the Department of Corrections and their budget. And then lastly, I would just say that if we are going to remove funding for both state and private beds, it will require that inmates remain housed in county jails. And I think we would have some issues with our counties and with our sheriffs with regard to that. Um, <clears throat> we don't want that to occur. Counties don't want that to occur. It causes other problems in the county jail when there are DOC inmates that are within the county jail. Um, a lot of county jails do not have the capacity, the programming, or other resources um, to indefinitely house DOC inmates. So it could lead to overcrowding and worsening conditions in our county jails throughout the state. So again, um, reducing decreases overall bed vacancy levels, and if the vacancy levels fall below 3%, it triggers an action through CRS 17-1-119.7, um, and we don't necessarily want to get to that position either. So again, appreciate the good senator from Denver, but I respectfully ask for a no vote on amendment number one. Further discussion on amendment number one. Seeing none, the motion before the body is the adoption of amendment number one. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. The noes have it, and amendment one is lost. Any further discussion on House Bill 1230? 1430. On 14:30. Uh, it looks like there might be an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read amendment number two? J-168, amend the Appropriations Committee report dated April 3rd, 2024, page two, strike lines 19 through 23. Purpose retains House Amendment number 14, J-91, which increased the appropriations to the Department of Education by $2 million cash funds from the State Education for the, for the ninth grade success grant program. Senator Will. Mr. Chair, I move uh, Amendment J-168, 
Commonly known as Amendment 2 to House Bill 1430. Very good. To the amendment. Yeah, go ahead. Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Members, in 2019, the Colorado State Legislature allocated $800,000 annually for the ninth grade success grant, uh, which provides schools with four-year grants to execute ninth grade on-track programming data from the Center for High School Success, and it has shown tremendous progress in helping students, schools, and teachers develop systems and programming that ensure our ninth graders are able to succeed. What this would do is increase funding for the Colorado ninth grade success program uh, by $2 million. There are approximately 72,000 uh, ninth graders in Colorado public schools. The current grant cohort only serves about 1,800 students. Um, if we estimate $250 per student to run ninth grade on track programming, we can reach closer to 10,000 students. Uh, we do have a bill this year, House Bill 241282, uh, in conjunction with this budget amendment, uh, based on the passage of this budget amendment would impact um, how that bill moves forward in terms of its funding. But the goal ultimately is to collectively, either between 1282 and or this budget amendment, have uh, the, um, the uh, $2 million uh, from the cash fund from State Education Fund for the ninth grade student success program. We ask for an I vote. For the discussion, Senator Will. Yeah, and that'll, that'll make it serve about 10,000 students, I think you said. But, you know, the main, main part of this, this is a critical time for, for our students and our kids, but, uh, and it'll prior, prioritize services for these ninth graders that, that are at risk of academic failure and providing instructional support is when it's needed. And this is critical for ninth graders. I strongly support this. Any further discussion on Amendment 2? Senator Zinzinger. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, while I do like uh, the ninth grade success program, uh, last year we plussed this up enormously with um, a, a significant amount, I think it was $8 million of one-time funding, and they have not even yet gone through all of that funding. So um, if this were to pass, um, I very much look forward to taking it out of the legislative pot and uh, with that, I would ask for a no. For the discussion on Amendment 2, seeing none, the motion before us is adoption of Amendment Number 2. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, and Amendment 2 is adopted. Mm. Mm. Take that. Further discussion on 1430. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read amendment number three? J147, amend appropriations committee report dated April 3rd, 2024, page two, circling Senator Coleman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We move uh, J147, otherwise known as amendment three, to House Bill 1430. To the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This amendment adds $1.5 million from the Marijuana Tax Cash Fund for economic development programs in the Office of Economic Development for deposit and continuously appropriated marijuana entrepreneur fund created in Senate Bill 21111, programs to support marijuana entrepreneurs. We ask for your I vote. For the discussion on Amendment 3. Senator, oh, yeah. that's it. All right, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, respectfully ask for a no on this one. Uh, marijuana tax cash fund is something that's been overused quite a bit. Um, in fact, it got to the point where we had several discussions with regard to the marijuana tax cash fund and how we um, need it to trim down and cut some things out. And that's what we already had to do at the Joint Budget Committee. The other thing is with regard to this, the governor's office from the economic development programs um, in edit, they actually came in and they wanted $2 million and we told them no. We not only told them no once, we told them like no three times because again, we're having issues with solvency of this fund. We're having issues that the marijuana tax cash fund, the dollars in this account are decreasing to the point where we didn't have enough money in the funds to be able to fund appropriately the enforcement division in the Department of Revenue. So again, I just respectfully ask for a no vote. This is something, we, did, we didn't talk about it just once, we talked about it three or four times at the Joint Budget Committee and said no. Uh, because the funds are just not in the marijuana tax cash fund. Seeing no more discussion, the uh, question before us is the adoption of amendment number three. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. Ayes have it, and amendment three is adopted. Will the clerk please read amendment number four?
J167 by Senator Hawkins Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 4 to House Bill 1430. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this would appropriate uh, $108,000 uh, to the uh, CU School of Medicine for the purposes of uh, specialized module training of uh, faculty in an intensive um, uh, module training format. Uh, the project is called ECHO Colorado. I've actually used this uh, telehealth training. It's excellent. It's a way of connecting disease experts with doctors, and it is very much used in the rural setting. In fact, we saved lives for veterans who had hepatitis C, and I will save some comments for my colleague here. Senator Malika. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, members, we know what position we are right now in Colorado in regards to healthcare providers and really trying to attract healthcare providers and make sure we have enough healthcare providers to take care of the people of Colorado. Uh, this helps with that. This helps with training. It's a relatively small investment when we look at the overall budget. And I'm proud to stand up here with uh, uh, Senator Hawkes Lewis and, and advocating for this because this will help us get more providers out there, give the training that they need uh, to take care of the people of Colorado. And I ask for an I vote. For the discussion on amendment number four, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, respectfully ask for a no vote on this. Uh, again, I wouldn't be doing my job if I said that we should vote for it. <laughs> so just asking for a no vote. I'm sure there are some good ideas here, and I see where it's, you know, for $88,000 for a one time fee for service contract. Just want to make sure that we all understand when we say one time that it really does mean one time. We're in that type of budget situation. One time's one time. So respectfully ask for a no vote. Further discussion on amendment number four. Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of amendment number four. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Ayes have it, and amendment four is adopted. Will the clerk please read amendment number five? Chairman 52, amend the Appropriations Committee report dated April 3rd, 2024, page four, strike lines five through nine. Purpose retains a portion of the House amendment. Senator Coleman. 28. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move J-152, otherwise known as amendment number five, to House Bill 1430. Please continue on the amendment. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. This amendment adds $2 million from the general fund of the Tony Gramps' youth service program, the Department of Human Services. And as a footnote specifying our general assembly's intent that half a million dollars of the increase would support the 2023 grant cycle, ask for an I vote. For the discussion, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know for a fact that the Tony Gramps' Youth Services Program is a good, good program. I also know for a fact that we don't have $2 million of general fund monies just laying around. So uh, my question for the sponsor of this amendment is, do we take this out of the governor's priority pot, or do you want it out of the legislative pot? Hello, for the Mr. Sponsor. I just, I just explained that we don't have $2 million laying around, so I want to know if you want us to take this out of the governor's priority shared priority pot, or do you want it out of the legislative pot? Just need to know. Senator Coleman. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Governor's shared priority pot. <laughs> all right. Any further discussion on Amendment 5? Seeing none, the question before the body is the adoption of Amendment 5. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 5 is adopted. Will the clerk please read Amendment number 6? J-130. By Senators Rich and all, Michael and Janae, amend the appropriation Senator Rich. report. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I move Amendment J-130 to House Bill 24-1430. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment will add 6.1 million a general fund to the state funding for senior services line item. State funding for senior services provides funding for all 16 area agencies on aging throughout the state. The AAAs provide the following services. Nutrition, which is home delivered meals and congregate meals. Transportation, in-home services, which could include chores, personal care, and homemaker. 
adult daycare and health, respite care, caregiver support, case management, material aid, audiology, vision, and dental. Senator Janal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So how did we come up with the uh, $6.1 million? The Joint Budget Committee asked the Department of Human Services how much it would cost to eliminate the wait list. Yes, there is a wait list for seniors, um, and it's growing every day. Um, the department reported back to the JBC and said $6.1 million, and this is why we're asking for $6.1 million. Uh, and we're hoping that it will come out of any combination of set-asides that come out of the long bill. Um, you know, our seniors have done so much for us, and um, they've waited and waited, and their waiting list is growing longer and longer, and that group of folks is growing, and uh, we're asking for a yes vote. Sarah Marcus and Janae. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I will just add to what my colleagues said and say that seniors should not be set aside. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you to the three good senators that were up here presenting this. Um, definitely appreciate that we need more funding for the Office of Adults, Aging, and Disability Services for funding of senior services. Um, in fact, uh, the JBC fought pretty diligently for this um, as it is in the long bill, and we have about 57.5 million going for the older Coloradoans. Appreciate that you're willing to take it out of any of the pots that are listed on 180, page 181 of your budget. But members, members, I want your attention. I want everybody to understand something in case you missed it in the budget overview. On page seven, line 28, you're in reserve above or below the requirement. We are at zero on that line. So when you come up here, I need to know which pot you want it to come out of because if we were just to fund this out of general fund, we would end up being $6.1 million out of balance. Um, so, and I heard you, you said whatever pot is available. So we'll take that into consideration. Uh, hope the governor's office is listening as well because this will be part of our negotiations. Thank you. Ask for a no vote. For the discussion on Amendment 6, Senator Liston. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members, as, as a member of the Pepsi generation, the younger generation, the Pepsi generation, uh, I fully support this amendment. Uh, and just a little fact, uh, the uh, funding uh, uh, for something like this has, uh, has not been raised since 2018. So the Pepsi generation supports this amendment. Any further discussion on Amendment 6? Seeing none, the question before the body is the adoption of Amendment 6. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Ayes have it, and Amendment 6 is adopted. Will the clerk please read Amendment 7? Chairman 35, amend the appropriation. Senator Roberts. Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move J135 or Amendment 7 to House Bill 1430. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Colleagues, this amendment adds a modest uh, amount of money and was already approved by the House last week to the Colorado Access to Justice Commission. Uh, the Colorado Access to Justice Commission was created several years ago and was formally codified by this legislature last year in a nearly unanimous bill. And they do important work for low-income Coloradans across the state. They help provide civil legal services to people in our state who cannot afford a lawyer to help them with things like divorce, custody, eviction, protection orders, public benefits, veteran services, health care, and many other legal issues that often uh, render people bankrupt when they, uh, when they come across them. This uh, funding will help the Access to Justice Commission do some very important services over the next fiscal year um, and help really continue the momentum that we've given them. And I think it's right to make sure that they have the financial support to continue the good work that we've asked them to do all across our state. Again, this is help for civil legal assistance for low-income Coloradans. The amendment is $434,000 um, to allow the Access to Justice Commission to continue doing great work. I'd ask for an I vote. Senator Zinsinger. Oh, pardon me, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you. Jeez, I have to keep following all these tall people. Stop <laughs> moving the microphones. Um, I'm sure this is a great program. I understand that in the House, we're working to retain a House Amendment number 35, 
I understand that it's for $435,000 approximately um, general fund. I didn't hear which pot you would like for this to come from if this gets through because um, I understand you want to appre and appreciate that we want to serve low income Coloradoans across the state so that they have civil legal defense. But um, remember, I just got done saying we have zero. Our line 28 is zero. And we did add a bunch of additional aid to the public, our dollars to the public defender's budget. So um, yeah, yes. In fact, the Joint Budget Committee, not all of us, but the Joint Budget Committee <laughs> voted to add 80 additional FTE to the uh, Office of the Public Defenders. So um, again, I'm sure this is a great program, but I'm gonna ask for one, which pot do you want to think that you think this should come out of? Because uh, we don't have any general fund money laying around, not even $435,000 and um, would respectfully ask for a no vote, but thank you. Seeing no further discussion, Amendment 7, the question for the body's adoption, Amendment 7, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The no's have it, and Amendment 7 is lost. Okay. Will the clerk please read Amendment number 8? Chairman 31, amend the Appropriations Committee report. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment number 8 to, to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So Amendment 8 deals with the Veterans Service to Career Program. We have made great strides uh, nationwide and in Colorado in the last 15 to 20 years in uh, helping veterans when it's time to leave service and transition into the civilian world. Um, we've done a lot of great work with mirroring credentialing so that they get uh, credit for the job skills that they, have al that they already have and have learned in their military service. We don't always do a great job of connecting the dots. That's where the Veterans Service to Career Program comes in. It will, you have counselors that will meet with you, uh, help understand what skills you have in the military. Let's say you're in 88 November in the Army and you've been using TC Ames. You would have no way of knowing that that is an almost identical logistics information network as FMS or AS400 with log dev application the common applications in the civilian trucking world. They'll help you put that together so that you can classify that on your resume correctly and get access to the jobs that you're truly qualified for. We have funded this for years out of the Marijuana Cash Tax Fund and through federal grants. Those federal grants are no longer available and there's no longer money in the Marijuana Cash Tax Fund. So we are asking for your support to continue this program that has been serving our veterans so well. Uh, please vote yes on Amendment 8. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Truth is, members, we don't do enough for our veterans. This is just a small thing that we do for them. And I think that this is a great program and we keep moving forward with this program. And I ask the JBC members to take this out of the governor's shared priorities to be able to fund it. So thank you. Further discussion, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Chair. Um, I just realized I must be one of the shortest people in the General Assembly, because I have to keep moving the microphones yeah, down. Yeah. I thought it was just on the re on the Republican side, but apparently it's amongst all of you. I am one of the shortest people here, and I even am on two inch heels. But anyways, uh, I just want to say first of all, thank you to the two good senators who were up here um, from Peltonia and Pueblo. I know that they were veterans themselves, and thank you for your service to the state of Colorado in that capacity. Um, appreciate this one. Veterans are important to us. In fact, that is why. Um, through the uh, Joint Budget Committee that we put dollars into veteran services and into this Veteran Service to Career Program. Uh, however, as I said before, this, this amendment will put the budget $1 million out of balance, unless, of course, we take it out of the governor's shared priority pot. And remember, the key word there is shared. Just want to point that out for the governor's office staff who's listening. It says shared priority pots. Oh, and, uh, anyways, I just also want to point out to you, yes, that the veterans are a priority service population for federal funds designated in Colorado through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, the WIOA funds. And as such, veterans have the opportunity to work with highly skilled professional workforce center staff to find a job that maximizes their potential. And I do know for a fact that in several of our workforce, um, uh, workforce department, workforce areas, that workforce centers, that um, they do put a high priority on serving the veteran population. It is extremely important. The Jobs for Veterans State Grants is another resource through the federal government, and it funds veterans employment specialists and local workforce centers. 
And then we also have Senate Bill 24109, which I think maybe you were talking about a bit, that continues Colorado Veterans Service to Career Program. That bill should be considered by the General Assembly through the regular process. I believe it is, but I appreciate, again, our two veteran senators that were here and that um, you're asking for additional funds. At this time, though, I'll have to respect, respectfully ask for a no vote. Question for the body is the adoption of amendment number eight. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it, amendment eight is adopted. <laughs> Will the clerk please read amendment nine? Chairman 28 by Senator Malka. Amendment Senator Malka. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move amendment nine. To the amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Amendment nine members uh, provides $1 million one-time funds for the school nurse grant program. Uh, these funds will fund four nurses for four schools over five years. Uh, really prioritize rural and uh, Title I schools. I do have uh, a member of the, the body here from the other side of the aisle um, who I believe is supportive of this amendment as well. Uh, this money, uh, just to be clear, is coming from the general fund. Um, a similar amendment was ran in the House uh, and, and attempted to uh, find some money in a different location. This is, uh, uh, we decided that this is best that this comes from the general fund. Um, though there are some grant recipients here that have already benefited from the school nurse grant program. The Alamosa District, the Hayden District, um, the Eagle County District, uh, and I can let the, uh, the good senator from the San Luis Valley um, uh, read some more. But uh, members, this is a really good, good amendment. This is a good program that we have that funds school nurses. School nurses are important. Um, you know, the, the services they provide to our students uh, are important. Um, these funds go to some of our hard to serve schools uh, in rural and Title I schools. Uh, we should be having more school nurses in our schools rather than having our secretaries uh, play that role. Uh, and what this uh, amendment does is allows us to get more school nurses in schools. So I ask for a yes vote. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of amendment number nine as well. Um, the good senator from Thornton did a good job of explaining it. Just highlighting this was a grant program originally started in 2020 where there were 26 requests for funding. 11 of those were funded for a five-year grant cycle, which included Alamosa, La Vida, Mountain Valley, Sargent, Vilas, Moffat, Norwood, and the Upper Rear Grand District. And then again in 2022, um, there was more funding plus some ARPA dollars that made it where, where we could expand this and it included another 10 or 12 or 15 school districts across the state both uh, uh, largely largely rural school districts and a number of them in my Senate district. So I think this is a good program, um, trying to reduce the ratio of uh, nurses to students would be uh, very helpful all across Colorado. So ask for your I vote on amendment number nine. Senator Mullica. Thank you, um, members. And, and just can't probably see it right here uh, between uh, Senator Simpson and myself, but this is a bridge. A bridge bridging the urban rural divide. <laughs> right here. Oh, no. Erase that from the way up like that. Senator Kirkmeyer. <laughs> okay, guys. You did this on purpose. Damn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree. That's not very nice. That's not bridging any kind of divide. I just want you to know. All right, well, first of all, thank you to the good good senators who are bridging the divide. Um, thank you so much for bringing this one forward. Amendment number nine. Yes, um, the school nurse grant program in the Department of Public Health and Environment is an important program. In fact, the long bill currently includes millions, millions of dollars to improve the health of Coloradoans by strengthening our healthcare workforce, including programs that aim to increase our supply of nurses, improve the resilience of healthcare professionals, and provide for more comprehensive training resources. Um, I appreciate that you said this was one-time funds, but again, remember I told you. Page seven, line 28, that balance is at zero. So I need to know where you want this general fund money to come from, and everyone, I hope you're paying attention to this as well. Anytime you come in and ask for, anytime you're asking for an amendment that has uh, general fund monies on it, our staff um, will put in a 15% general fund reserve requirement. So it bumps up your request, essentially, or it takes from it. So just want to make sure that you understand that as well. But right now, as I see no offset, um, and it'll put the budget out of balance, respectfully ask for a no vote to keep the budget in balance. All right. 
Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of amendment number nine. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The no's have it, and the amendment is lost. Please read the, if the clerk would please read amendment number 10. J179 by Senators Will and Pelton R. Amend Senator Will. Page 10. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move Amendment J179, also known as Amendment 10, to House Bill 1430. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what we're attempting to do with this amendment, uh, we want to take uh, 2.8 FDE and $560,000 from uh, the Division of Animal Welfare uh, and put it in the AgriAbility Program, which helps farmers and ranchers with disabilities. So I'd ask for a yes vote. Further discussion on Amendment 10? Senator Will. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just I want to add, you know, that just the mental uh, mental illness part of this uh, for ag producers as well. So uh, this is a great this is a great amendment. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, we, we really need to we're, fund rural mental health, and this is part of it. We're, you know, I understand that there's people out there that like animal welfare, which so do I. But this is, this is one of those amendments that is really taking the money from one place, putting it in another place for the good of rural Colorado. And I would really appreciate an I vote. And again, if we need to take money from somewhere, I'm sure the governor's shared pot would be a great place to go. So thank you. For the discussion, Amendment 10, Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, the funding for staff to support the Division of Animal Welfare will free up the state veterinarian to focus on pressing animal health issues such as avian influenza, which has uh, severely impacted Colorado poultry producers. It's now impacting, I heard this on the news just the other day, uh, dairy cattle in uh, numerous surrounding states. So uh, this is something that we are very worried about. Uh, funding for the Division of Animal Welfare will allow the state veterinarian to continue to prioritize a safe and healthy food supply. Um, and I, I just need to respectfully ask for a no vote on this amendment. Um, but furthermore, it, the, the damage wouldn't be just to the Division of Animal Welfare if we pass this amendment. Um, in addition to that, we are impacting uh, the Agra Ability uh, Program, which is currently funded through the UST, uh, uh, USDA grant to CSU, and it's operated through a partnership with Goodwill, Goodwill Industries. So Agra Ability uh, participants are often um, also eligible for services from the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation because of their um, disabilities. And um, this program is a wonderful workforce program for that community, uh, ensuring that farmers with disabilities can continue to earn a living is really important. Um, but um, the existing funds um, that are in the state budget and through the federal USDA grant uh, right now that are supporting agribility, and it's just really important that we maintain that and that we um, continue to support this um, amazing program. So I, I would caution against uh, defunding um, these two areas for those reasons, and I would uh, sincerely ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment Number 10. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. The no's have it. Amendment 10 is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 11? J157. Senator Will. By Senator Will. You can't run me off. I'm not good. Amendment 11. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move uh, Amendment J157 to House Bill 1430. To the amendment. So what, what this is doing is um, <clears throat> taking um, it's multiple line items from the Department of Ag uh, that's related to the non-lethal 
wolf deterrence and adds new line items and appropriations of $500,000 from the general fund and it's reappropriated to the Department of Natural Res Resources for wolf depredation conservation funds. And as you know, if you just read the headlines in the, uh, in the papers here lately, uh, as of yesterday, we had a, uh, another wolf kill. Uh, don't know yet if it's from the uh, reintroduced wolves or wolves that were already currently in the state. But uh, this amendment is a preventative and forward-looking proposal that, uh, you, know, we've, you know, since we've officially reintroduced uh, wolves into, the, into Colorado, we did that in December, as you know. Um, but uh, we haven't reinforced protection and compensation to help farmers. We did uh, Senate Bill 255 last year for the compensation. But for all these preventative measures and all that's required and that they're requiring to do preventative measures, an additional 500000 towards um, towards wolf depredation will go a long ways for uh, agricultural producers here in the state of Colorado. And I'd strongly ask for an I vote on this amendment. Any further discussion on Amendment 11? Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gosh, I like this amendment. And if I wasn't on the JBC, I'd probably be down here voting or supporting it. <laughs> but, I, but alas, I am. So I would have to ask respectfully for a no vote on this amendment. Um, and in, in addition to the Department of Natural Resources and the Colorado Parks and Wildlife already having ongoing funding in the budget for wolf deprecation compensation, um, the cash fund itself has $175,000 that were transferred from the state's general fund in its balance currently and will receive an additional $350,000 general fund transfer per fiscal year to keep a healthy balance in the fund on an ongoing basis. So again, I respectfully ask for a no vote on this amendment. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of amendment number 11. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Noes have it, and Amendment 11 is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 12? J172 by Senators Pelton. Being Senator Pelton, Pelton, and you get to choose. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move uh, Amendment J172, also known as Amendment 12. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what this does is we are taking monies out of the, the animal welfare uh, Division of Animal Welfare and putting it to rural hospitals. You know, let's let's keep our rural hospitals whole, uh, saving um, human lives. <coughs> Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What this amendment is doing is that we're just prioritizing people's lives over animals' lives, and I just really would appreciate an I vote. And if we need to take it from somewhere, we can take it from the governor's shared pot. A priority pot. That's for yes vote. Further discussion on Amendment 12. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, we too uh, really appreciate this uh, amendment and we like the goals of this amendment. We like the goals of this amendment so much that we actually already beat you to the punch because we plussed up the Department of Public Health and Environment an additional $4 million beyond their request this year. So um, it, it was actually five at one point, and then we had to scale it back um, because of some uh, challenges within the budget. But we have already gone uh, to great lengths in order to provide uh, money to the Department of Public Health and Environment, in particular for our local public health agencies. So for those reasons, we'd have to ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion on Amendment 12, all those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, no. The no's have it, Amendment 12 is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 13? J-153 by Senator, Senator Pelton. Pelton. Lucky 13. Mr. Chair, I withdraw J-153, also known as Amendment 13. That has been withdrawn. Will the clerk please read Amendment 14? J-178 by Senator Pelton R. Amendment reading gross bill, page 198. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment J-178, also known as Amendment 14. All right. Uh, just for everyone's edification, I, I think we could probably skip the J numbers here. So if you okay. want to just do the uh, amendment 14, the two digit, that'd be great. And to the amendment, sir. Thank you. Uh, what I seek to do with this uh, amendment 
is down in Bent, Bent County and our county jail down there. We had in inmates that would uh, sneak out through the roof in the evening, go spend the night at home, get drunk, and sleep with the wife, come back before uh, morning check, climb back in the roof, and then they were there during, during the day. Uh, it's a public safety issue down in, in Los Animas, so uh, uh, what I'd seek to do is take a half million dollars uh, from the governor's shared pot and ask for a yes vote. Further discussion on MF 14, Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, unfortunately, we have a process down here at the state legislature called the Capital Development Committee, and um, I am sure that this is a worthwhile project, but unfortunately, if you are going to be devoting resources to these types of capital improvements, uh, we, we think you need to go through the process. So um, I'm going to have to ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is adoption of Amendment 14. All in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. No. The no's have it. Amendment 14 is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 15? Amendment 15 by Senator Will. Amendment Senator Will. Bill. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. And I uh, move uh, Amendment 15, which is J154 to, to House Bill 1430. To the amendment. Thank you. So what, I, what I'm doing here is uh, taking $5 million general fund from the Workforce Development Placeholders and increase the appropriation to House Bill 24, 1389 with intent that these funds go to our rural schools. And um, this is stuff I've heard from my rural schools is uh, the school funding for 23, 24 for the new arrival students and it increases assistance and alleviate the cost pressure resulting from significant increases to these new arrival students or migrant students in our public education system. This makes it clear that the intent of the General Assembly is to increase the funds to, to be directed to our rural schools. These are local small communities we've talked a lot about today that are welcoming and supporting these students the best they can, but the cost is, in, you know, in training staff and the bandwidth, they just don't have the bandwidth to do it and uh, it's, it's pushing the budgets and they need new materials, teachers, everything. And uh, it takes a uh, valuable teacher to student time away from so, these other, yep. from these other students. So, and you know, in one of my school districts who went from uh, having eight, 18 of those students, yeah, like during when the count was done to 230 and they just don't have the bandwidth. So this is a small $5 million thing that I want to help out rural yeah, schools cool. and uh, Hopefully we can uh, uh, get some more staffing and help for them, which is much needed. Thank you. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, appreciate the conversation, appreciate the good Senator uh, from the Western Slope who's talking about this and the, the needed um, dollars for the rural factor. Um, and apparently everybody thought it was a pretty good idea because we just passed the School Finance Act on second reading and it has $32 million in it and permanent ongoing funding for rural schools. So um, while I think we all think this is a great idea and a great amendment, I think we've already worked to fully fund K through 12 schools for the first time in 14 years. And then also within the School Finance Act, thanks to the good Senator from Jefferson County and the good Senator from Aurora, we put in $32 million of ongoing permanent funding for schools for rural schools. So I respectfully ask for a no vote. See no further discussion. The question for the body is adoption of Amendment 15. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The no's have it, and Amendment 15 is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 16? Amendment 16 by Senators Pelton R. Senator Roberts, Pelton. Andrew Gross Bill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I move Amendment 16. To the amendment. Thank you. Uh, my co-prime on this amendment isn't here, but uh, what this does is it, uh, there was a delay to some of the best funding, and uh, what this is doing is uh, taking that money that's delayed, go ahead and move it to uh, uh, the Capital Construction Assessment uh, Assistance Board, so uh, I'd ask for a yes vote uh, for the best grant. Further discussion on Amendment 16? Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I understand that we all appreciate the BEST program, and it is important to all of our schools throughout the state. Um, and I know that those funds come from the permanent trust 
um, and that a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, we started putting in money from the marijuana tax cash fund into the BEST program as well, which was great when we had money in the marijuana tax cash fund. Unfortunately, as we went through this this year through the Joint Budget Committee, um, the solvency of this fund is coming into question because of all of the amounts and um, programs that thought it was a great idea to use the marijuana tax cash fund for their program. And all of a sudden, we just don't have enough money to even fund the um, this year to fund the request to do the enforcement division, which is extremely important. We're talking about the marijuana enforcement division that goes out and, and ensures that um, things are happening the way they're supposed to and they're following the law. So um, again, I appreciate this. Best grants are important. I think we all would love to be able to fund as many public schools as we possibly can through the best grant program. We did, um, even though we were we needed to um, delete the $20 million out of the marijuana tax cash fund for the best program this year. We delayed that transfer so that it would occur um, two years out from now. Um, folks, we had to cut a lot of stuff out of here. And uh, so this isn't something that we took lightly. We had to go through and I mean, I can remember working on this, gosh, on a Wednesday night at about 11 o'clock, actually it was about 10.30 at night, uh, going through and figuring out what we needed to do within the marijuana tax cash fund to make sure that we met within the appropriations. And we had to delete a bunch of stuff. And this was one of them. And, but instead of completely deleting it, we just delayed it. We delayed it by a couple of years. We need to see the amounts coming into this uh, marijuana tax cash fund, are um, they're going down. So we left funds in for um, the transfer of well, we left funds in for a um, O-Edit business office modifications. We left funds in for the IT capital, Meta marijuana enforcement division, seed to sell software. We left funds in for the um, medic marijuana educate, oh God, marijuana enforcement. enforcement division to support funding for their revenue that they needed in R5. Um, and so we did what we possibly could do as we went through here, but we just, it's okay. Um, we just had to uh, get this program, this fund, back into solvency. So um, I respectfully ask for a no vote. I definitely appreciate how much everybody likes the BEST program, but in this Thank case, we don't have the money in the Thank marijuana tax cash fund to fund this. So respectfully ask for a no. All right. Any further discussion on Amendment 16? Seeing none, the question for the body is adoption of Amendment 16. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. Noes have it, and Amendment 16 is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 17? Amendment 17 by Senator Lesson. Senator Lesson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move uh, Amendment uh, J166, otherwise known as Amendment 17, to House Bill 1430. To Amendment 17. Very good. Uh, members, um, uh, what we're looking for with uh, Amendment 17 is a study of uh, thorium uh, advanced nuclear uh, uh, molten salt reactors, um, uh, $300,000. Uh, it is ultimately going to come, there'll be an amendment uh, later on to a bill uh, when this passes that will uh, take, uh, move a little bit of money, 300000 from the uh, severance tax perpetual base fund. So the money is there. And uh, the exciting thing is, is what's happening in the nuclear industry today. All of the talk is about uh, 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 thorium molten salt reactors, which you've heard me say uh, they're, uh, it's not if they're coming, it's when they're coming. Uh, just a little bit about thorium. It, it's, it is one of the uh, uh, periodic elements. Uh, it is very abundant in nature. It's more abundant than uh, uranium. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, what a thorium molten salt reactor does, it does not use uh, pressurized water. It uses molten salt. Um, all of the uh, 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 waste, which there is none, stays within the loop of the, uh, of the type of the reactor. Uh, and once again, the advantage of, uh, of something like this is there are zero carbon emissions. Zero carbon emissions. Um, and uh, so that you get all of the advantages uh, with no disadvantages. Uh, so we respectfully ask for an I vote um, on Amendment 17 uh, for a good, thorough study. Uh, so um, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Senator Marchman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to my um, co-prime on this amendment. 
Um, so Colorado is currently undergoing an energy transition. Um, our economy has traditionally supported really good paying jobs for local communities, and a study of reliable and affordable energy technologies, um, including advanced nuclear, um, is necessary to help support the development of rural economies and to create jobs. Um, in the past, the issue has been the cost. Um, these are very expensive. Um, what this bill will do is it'll be, a, or this amendment would be a $300,000 um, study. We'd work closely with the Governor's Office of Energy to make sure we structure it appropriately and safely and in the neighborhoods that want it. And, um, and then we'd study it and see if we can, um, can roll this out in broader form in the future. So with that, I'd ask for an I vote. Further discussion on Amendment 17, Senator Liston. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One, one other point that I might add, uh, uh, members, is that these uh, uh, thorium molten salt reactors are far, far less expensive to build. Um, uh, we have talked and heard from people who are extremely knowledgeable. Uh, they can be scaled to literally build a, a, a reactor of this type uh, for in the vicinity of, uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's not, uh, $300 million compared to the billions of dollars for a conventional nuclear power plant. So with that, we, we uh, respectfully ask for an I vote on Amendment 17. Thank you. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, appreciate all the comments from the good senators and appreciate your amendment. Uh, I do understand from the comments that were made from the good senator from El Paso County that we will be seeing an amendment later that will um, actually take this money out of the severance tax transfer bill that's coming up. So it's a $300,000 amendment that will be coming up again later. Um, with all that being said, um, again, uh, appreciate the comments and where you're trying to get to, but at this time, I just have to respectfully ask for a no vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the question before us is adoption of Amendment 17. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 I believe the no's have it, and Amendment 17 is lost. Will the clerk please read? We'll take a senatorial five. Senator will, Senator will come back to order. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Having voted on the prevailing side, I ask for a reconsideration. Motion before the body is to reconsider the adoption of Amendment 17. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. Ayes have it. Amendment 17 will be reconsidered. Will the clerk please read Amendment 17? Amendment 17. By Senators Liston and Marchman, Amendment Rain Grass Bill, page 123, line 2. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move Amendment 17 to um, House Bill 1430. Any further discussion on Amendment 17? Seeing none, the question before the body is the adoption of Amendment 17. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. Amendment 17 is adopted. Will the clerk please read Amendment 18? Amendment 18 by Senator Peltonar and Liston. Amendment and Gross Bill, page 123. Senator Liston. Insert. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we respectfully withdraw Amendment 18 and 19. Those two amendments will be withdrawn. Moving to the next amendment in our packet, will the clerk please read Amendment number 20? Amendment 20 by Senator Michelson Janay. Senator Michelson Janay. Yeah. Senator Marcos and Janae. I move Amendment 20. To the amendment. Um, amendment 20 is in service to the Denver Health and Hospital Authority, specifically around areas that have to do with physical plants. 
Um, this is a very old building, 57 years old, and it serves almost all of our districts. Um, I have a list if you want to see who is served and where they are served. Um, I believe that this is very urgent um, to the extent that their fire alarm system went down and they have actual real live people whose job it is now to stand in the hallways and look for fire because they are unable to ch put change their fire alarm system. So this is critical, urgent funding. I ask for an I vote. Further discussion of M20, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, we, first of all, um, definitely appreciate the comments with regard to amendment number 20 from the good senator from Commerce City. Um, and I think, I, I think we all under, can appreciate the importance of the Denver Health and Hospital Authority, the Denver Health <laughs> Center. Uh, in fact, we appreciate it so much that last year we put about $10 million into this. Um, and then we already have another bill that is orbiting around the long bill that adds an additional $5 million to Denver Health Hospital. So um, we have been looking out for Denver Health. We have funded it appropriately. And at this time, um, I understand that they've got issues as well. But uh, again, I'm just going to remind you all that on page 7, line 28, we're at zero. So if we take money out of the general fund, um, we are out of balance. Um, unless, of course, you're going to tell me that you think I should take this from some other shared pot. But with that, I respectfully ask for a no vote. Further discussion on Amendment 20. Seeing none, the question before the body is adoption of Amendment 20. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. Ayes have it, and Amendment 20 is adopted. Will the clerk please read Amendment 21? Amendment 21 by Senators Coleman, Cutter, and Senator Coleman. Amend. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 21. To the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. This amendment will appropriate up to $10 million from the general funds to the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing for distribution to Denver Health and Hospital Authorities to support the services provided for the migrant crisis. We ask for an I vote. Further discussion, Senator Cutter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so Denver Health has over $150 million in uncompensated care. And this was even before the influx of immigrants. So it's really important to, to try and um, relieve the pressure on them a little bit and help them provide this care that's so desperately needed. Further discussion, Senator Coleman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. One last thing, really glad to have one of the uh, few, but also the most amazing healthcare professionals supporting this amendment, someone who actually works in the industry and knows what he's talking about because I don't work in the healthcare industry. We ask for an I vote. Shocking, shocking. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, members. Um, this is more or less uh, a repeat of the last uh, amendment. Um, it just shifts the purpose. And again, uh, we already made a $10 million investment into uh, Denver Health last year. We are making an additional $5 million investment into Denver Health um, in an orbital that is yet to come. And uh, the issue is, is that um, we are already trying to work with uh, Denver Health to the ability that we can. Um, and uh, in acknowledgement that we also need to make sure that there are other hospitals in the state um, that are struggling um, as well. So um, we would like to be able to fund all the things, but we cannot. And so for those reasons, we ask for a no. Seeing no further discussion on Amendment 21, question for the body is the adoption of 21. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. No. Yeah, ayes have it, and 21 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title, pardon me, Amendment 22. Amendment 22 by Senator Pelton. Senator Pelton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 22. Proper motion to the amendment, Senator Pelton. Thank you. What this amendment does is that it, it pulls $2 million from the Public Defender's Office and, and puts it into the Prosecution Fellowship Program. These funds will help the program expand and fully, uh, and fully fund the current enrollments. Um, Colorado, the Colorado Prosecution Fellowship Program aims to provide new attorneys with practical experience in the public sector while allowing them the personal satisfaction of serving the residents of Colorado and various state agency clients. The fellowship program is a one-year initiative that restarts in the fall of every year. 
The fellowship uh, offers an opportunity for recent law school graduates of those graduating by the um, fellowship or following spring to gain hands-on experience. Fellows... Mic check, mic check. Oh, hello, hello, hello. There we go. Okay, so the fellows work within the criminal justice section of the Colorado Attorney General's office. This experience is not only beneficial to new attorneys, but this program helps provide our rural DA offices with much needed assistance and help. Those DA offices provide constant uh, prosecution of criminal activity all across Colorado. Our DAs are underfunded. And let me tell you, let me, let me tell you a little bit about my DA in, in, um, in the 13th Judicial in there in Logan County. Over 84% of our budget, this is him talking, uh, um, sending me the text, over 84% of our budget goes to wages and benefits. We have one open prosecuting position that I haven't been able to fill for three years running. Um, no special units, not even a diverse, uh, diversion unit. For my 2024 budget, I told the commissioners that I have, I have attorney wages that were, comp uh, that were needing to be competitive to neighboring jurisdictions. I needed $150,000 increase in the budget. They were unable to grant that request. Something like this program could help our rural do do DAs. They are underfunded, understaffed, and the, and the uh, public defenders are, have plenty of staff and are overfunded. They expanded their budget by $7 million this year. I think asking for $2 million out of their budget to be able to fund our rural DAs to protect our citizens and to make sure that crime victims have some security that they are, that when they go to, when they go to court. So I just would like an I vote on this amendment. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, members, uh, I'm going to have to ask for a no vote. Um, I would just point to the fact that um, a, a significant part of our budget this year is making sure that we are properly funding our institutions of higher education. And it was really difficult getting to a number that was going to work within the budget. And unfortunately, even though it seems like this is only an additional $2 million, um, it's, it's just uh, not going to work. So um, we ask uh, that um, you do not support uh, this amendment um, today. Uh, I also uh, want to point to some prior work that we have done. Um, this year, we focused on the Public Defender's Office, but that's because last year, we focused on the DA's offices. And we've already done a significant amount of plussing up in those areas, including making sure that we have competitive wages, making sure that we are filling some of those uh, gaps that exist. And, uh, and because we've already done that work, we are able to move on to other areas of our judicial system. Um, so once again, uh, I, I love um, opportunities in order to increase funding for higher education, but for right now, um, I think we are in the place where we need to be, so I'm going to have to ask for a no vote. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The other thing I'd like to point out is that we have one of our own in the Senate right now, one of the 35 that actually use this program to get into the um, DA's office, and that is the good senator from Frisco. He is somebody that, that used this program. The other thing that I'd like to point out is that there is a bill out to, that's going to be able to um, um, raise the salaries of our DA's out in rural Colorado as well. So we are needing more help in rural Colorado when it comes to our DA's offices, when it comes to crime, when it comes to those victims. We need that help, and I ask for an I vote on this amendment. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. President, Pro Chair Tim. I rise in support of Amendment 22. Um, years and years ago, when I was a much younger man, I served on the House Judiciary Committee. And in the early days of my service on the House Judiciary Committee, and continuing even through to today, the Public Defender's Office has had an inscrutable budget, inscrutable, $64 word meeting, completely non, 
visible. You just, we don't ever know quite what's going on inside that particular budget. And for that reason alone, I would say I'm sure they can come up with $2 million on behalf of uh, victims and law enforcement, and I support this amendment 22 to the long bill. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just would uh, renew our respectful, we ask for a no vote on this amendment. Motion is the adoption of Amendment 22. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. The no's have it. Amendment 22 is lost. The clerk please read the title to Amendment 23. Amendment 23 by Senator Pelton B. Amendment in gross bill, page 172, line 3, and the item in subtitle column, strike 2,449,000. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I move um, Amendment number 23. To the Michael Jordan Amendment, Senator Pelton B. <laughs> Love the Michael Jordan Amendment. That is excellent. So um, what, I'm gonna, what I'm asking with this one is that we want to move the Urban Community Forest Program funding for the FTE to the Health Department for um, photochemical modeling. Uh, um, and Senate Bill 2495 for the first year, the ozone air quality testing. The reason why I'm asking for this is I sat on the ozone committee this year. We heard a lot about um, ozone testing, and I thought that this would be an excellent um, amendment. So what this amendment does is it seeks to withdraw funding from the FTE for the Urban Community Forest Program. The UCF program uh, nationally is quite different and has, much, uh, has a much broader scope. The funding and focus of this line item in HED is not as equitable approach to providing and managing more green spaces in Colorado's urban centers. The national program focuses is a focus is to provide technical guidance to local governments, nonprofit organizations, community group, educational institutions, and tribal governments. Foster research and development to, the, to deepen our understanding of urban ecosystems and to strengthen urban and community forest health and biodiversity for long term health. However, this particular line item is solely focused on marginalizing communities, which is a departure from the broad, inclusive uh, urban communities. This funding will help fund the initial stages to, of addressing the front range high ozone levels through a variety of mechanisms and specifically funding crucial ozone and air quality studies. I ask for an I vote on Amendment 23. You want to talk about it? Senator Zinzinger. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I know that this may seem small, but when you are taking um, even small amounts away from programs, such as the Healthy Forests and Vibrant Communities Fund, um, it's already a small fund. So even though it seems like this is just a little bit here that we're just plussing up over there, it has a huge impact on uh, the program that is essentially being defunded for this purpose. Um, and while you know, we understand uh, the desire to, pu uh, to fund the, the purpose here, we, we don't argue with the purpose of um, or, or the, the good works of um, where you're trying to direct these funds, uh, it's still creating havoc for the program that you're taking it from. So uh, we would ask that you do not rob Peter to pay Paul, or in this instance, anybody with the last name Pelton, and we ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 23. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. Wow, the no's have it, and Amendment 23 is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 24? Amendment 24 by Senator Lundin, Amendment in Grossville. Mr. Minority Leader. Mr. Chair, I move Amendment 24. To the amendment, Mr. Minority Leader. Oh, no. Everyone, look at your phone. We've been hacked. Well, if not today, at some point, we are all constantly at risk of digital intrusion. This amendment 24 is a simple small amendment that would move $5 million to the National Cybersecurity Center at UCCS down in Colorado Springs. This is a program that's been underway for a while. It's a critically important program. It's a program in which Colorado is demonstrating leadership across the region and across the state or across the country. Um, 
we need to support this uh, because this is the way we protect our future. So I would argue this is the most fundamental action we could take of all the actions we'll take this session. I urge the support of Amendment 24 for cybersecurity. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sure this is a very important amendment. I appreciate the good senator from El Paso County bringing it forward. But it does appear maybe you should run a beer bill. Oh, God. And a beer. Grab a beer, run a bill. There we go. Um, but it increases appropriations to the Department of Higher Education by $6.1 million of general fund. And again, in case we missed it, on uh, page 7, line 28, if you look at that table, it shows that we're at zero balance. So any money we take out of the general fund at this point puts us out of balance. Constitution says we have to be in balance. So uh, just pointing that out. Well, if you have an idea of where you'd like us to try and balance, please let us know. Otherwise, I respectfully ask for a no vote on Amendment 24. Thank Seeing you. No further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 24. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it. Amendment 24 is lost. Would the clerk please read the title to Amendment 24. Five. Amendment 25 by Senator, Senator Hanson. Hanson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to withdraw Amendment 25, given the passage of a previous amendment. Amendment 25 has been withdrawn. Will the clerk please read the title to Amendment 26? Amendment 26 by Senator, Senator Hanson. Hanson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Conveniently still here at the well for Amendment 26, and I move Amendment 26. Convenient and proper motion, Senator Hanson. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, it is great to see so few of you in the chamber right now. Um, for this robust budget debate that we are having <laughs> on this glorious afternoon. Thanks again to the chefs and the uh, folks who prepared our wonderful barbecue for our budget day. Uh, I would like to spend just a couple minutes on Amendment 26. Uh, I'll start with an observation. Leaky roofs don't have any lobbyists. Have you guys noticed that? When a, leaf, when a roof is in bad shape or the boiler's about ready to fail, there don't seem to be any lobbyists for such things. What is Amendment 26 about? Amendment 26 is what I like to refer to as the eat your vegetables amendment. Sometimes you gotta eat your vegetables. Why do I describe it that way? Well, because we have a list of projects that has gone completely unfunded in this year's budget. Conveniently, those lists of projects is in the amendment. And I'd like to spend just a moment on those important projects. This is controlled maintenance level two, the most urgent of that category, scoring 12. What does the score of 12 mean? That means it's in danger of failing any day now. We typically fund maintenance as part of our capital development process. Historically, over the last five years, we have done a good job of making sure we fund at least controlled maintenance category one and all of controlled maintenance category number two. This year, folks, we're not doing that. This amendment is designed to address that shortcoming. We have things like a refrigeration system at a prison that is about ready to fail. We have a hot water heating system that is about ready to fail at a DHS facility. We have the need for ADA improvements. We have leaky roofs at many higher ed institutions. We have heating systems that are about ready to fail at Anschutz Hospital. All very important projects that if we don't repair them, likely lead to a building that is non-functional, that we can't use anymore. How would you like to be the patient at Anschutz that's stuck in a building without a heating or cooling system? Or in one of the academic buildings around the state that is on this list where the roof has failed and now your class is canceled or moved? The reason I bring this amendment is not because I think I can do this without any lobbyists. Because, as again, uh, I observed, the leaky roofs don't really have lobbyists. 
I bring this so that we focus attention on a significant shortcoming in this year's budget, which is not properly funding controlled maintenance. We've had a great bipartisan consensus over the last five years to fund maintenance. Incredibly, at the very last moment, this fell off the list, everybody. Fell off the list. So I spend one more moment with you to say, here's what is likely coming. One of these buildings in the next year or two will fail. One of these roofs will go from a leak to a deluge. One of these heating systems will stop functioning. One of the refrigeration systems at one of our prisons will stop functioning. And we'll have to figure out plan B, C, or D for those important state assets. I think it's a mistake in this year's budget. I think we have a chance to fix it with Amendment 26. I think we would be wise to do a better job of funding maintenance. The last thought I'll leave you with is to compare what we're doing at the state level with what typically happens on the commercial side for private sector building managers, building management companies. They typically, every year, put aside 2 to 3% of the value of their portfolio for maintenance, somewhere between 2 and 3%. This year's budget, the one that we will be voting on in House Bill 1430, comes in at about 0.5%. Let that sink in for a second. We're not just a little underfunded on maintenance, we're a lot underfunded on maintenance. Amendment 26 is designed to fix that. Before we build shiny new buildings, we should probably take care of the ones we already built. There's a lot of lobbyists for shiny new buildings. Dozens and dozens of lobbyists for shiny new buildings. I have yet to find a lobbyist who's pushing to fix the refrigerator or the heating system. I ask you to join me in supporting Amendment 26. Let's fix this oversight in House Bill 1430. Senator Rich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I'm going to rise uh, in opposition to this amendment. I used to serve on the Capital Development uh, Committee, and I served on it when the CM CMU Robinson Theater project in its second phase of construction and the current building needs significant repairs and remodeling. The total costs of the continuation project cost $12,288,947 from the co Capital Construction Fund. The project was ranked the second highest priority by the Commission on Higher Ed. We agree controlled maintenance is important. I remember funding controlled maintenance every year that I was on the CDC. But ensuring a building usable after we've already invested both state and CMU resources into the first phase is critical. We agreed to do this a few years ago. I don't think we should go back on our word. I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Any further discussion on Amendment 26? Senator Mullica. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the Senator from Denver for bringing this and uh, the remarks from the Senator from uh, Grand Junction as well. Uh, members, I do serve on CDC, um, and so uh, I'm familiar with this and, and would agree with the good Senator from Denver that we do have to find uh, ways uh, to invest in uh, controlled maintenance. and. Um, uh, the CDC did send over uh, recommendations to the JBC uh, that included um, uh, all of uh, level one controlled maintenance and then a piece of level two. This is not to say anything bad about the JBC. I will make sure, uh, uh, but just uh, just stating the facts. And and um, and we were able to to send that list over with some of these projects. Some of these projects that this amendment is taking out. One of those projects was just spoken about, which is that project at Mesa, which is a continuation project. Um, and I think it is important, and the CDC spends time um, as a committee really looking at those continuation projects uh, to make sure that we are honoring our commitments and that we're not ripping the rug out from underneath some of our institutions. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. 
uh, it doesn't mean that we can't honor those commitments um, and still be able to, uh, to fund uh, what are some really important um, controlled maintenance projects as well. Um, but I do think what this amendment is doing is, is it's taking that away and it's taking that continuation project or one of those continuation projects off of the list that the CDC recommended. And, um, and I do struggle with that. Um, appreciate what this is trying to accomplish, but uh, by taking that off, I, I would be in opposition to this amendment. Senator Simpson. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I likewise rise in opposition to Amendment 26. Also serving on the Capital Development Committee where we go through this exhaustive prioritization effort beginning in de uh, December, early, mid-December, when we're faced with about a billion dollars worth of requests that include controlled maintenance levels one, level two, um, and level three is listed as well. We go through this exhaustive effort and there are, well, they're not lobbyists, every one of the institutions comes forward to talk about their capital construction needs, their capital replacement needs, and their controlled maintenance needs. Um, it's, a, again, a, a detailed, exhaustive effort and trying to figure out how you fit a billion dollars worth of request into a bucket that's somewhere between 150 to 200 million. Um, I, from the, time, the whole time I've served on the committee, recognized there has to be a better way for us to take care of our state assets. We don't do a very good job of that. But the committee, um, in full openness and, and good conversation, tried to figure out how to do this and sent to the JBC a list that included all of Controlled Maintenance One and a portion down to project number 71CM in level two controlled maintenance. Um, then JBD, JBC gets to do what they do and uh, made the adjustments they made in the grand scheme of the entire budget. But th there's a reason these are controlled maintenance level two and not controlled maintenance level one. There's a process the state architect goes through with the institutions to determine where they fit. And then if there's an emergency, there is a process for emergency funding of these um, capital or uh, controlled maintenance repairs as well. Um, I, I just think this is the wrong approach to solve this ever-ending uh, problem about maintaining assets and ask for a no vote. Any further discussion? Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're getting dessert? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. All right. <clears throat> There's a lot to kind of unpack here. I just want to make sure that everybody understands what this amendment is actually doing. Um, it's not just about funding controlled maintenance too. Uh, first of all, before I talk about what this, this amendment is doing, with regard to controlled maintenance true, it's not really accurate to say that they will fail. Because um, if these projects in controlled maintenance two were that bad, that dire straits, they would be in controlled maintenance number one. Because uh, that's how the process works. So, um, and if there is an issue with something that's in controlled maintenance two that does fail, um, there is an emergency process that can go through uh, the state can go through and there are funds there for it. As I explained in the Appropriations Committee when this came up, <clears throat> um, while it was um, at the request of the governor's office to uh, sweep the controlled maintenance trust fund to help balance the budget, we did fund an additional approximately, I think it's somewhere between six to eight million dollars in controlled maintenance, both in the Department of Corrections and also in the judicial agency um, for the Ralph Carr building. I think that one was like five million and the Department of Corrections was an additional two million to create a pot for them so that if they did have an emergency where a refrigerator broke down, they could just go fix it. So we actually did take that into consideration. Um, and then, um, so I don't think there is a significant shortfall in the budget with regard to controlled maintenance. Additionally, I just want to point out that last year we pretty much cleared the deck and we made sure that we funded all of controlled maintenance one and controlled maintenance two. So um, we did look through that and we, we are addressing it and working with the governor's office um, and other state facilities to make sure that we are trying to address the most urgent of needs. And I think if you look through the CDC list, you will see that. You'll see there are projects in there that are actually probably more like controlled maintenance. They're not a bunch of new buildings that are coming on. Uh, I think the CDC has been extremely responsible, at least in this respect, to making sure that one, we fund, fund continuation projects because how ridiculous would that be that you start a project and then you don't fund it in the next phase after you told them that we needed them to phase it so that we could figure out how to fund it. 
Um, and then they've also looked at where the greatest needs are, as explained by the good senator from the Alamosa area, um, especially like if you go back and look at that Adam States project. It's not like we didn't go through these lists and look at them. The Joint Budget Committee met with the um, Capital Development Committee at least twice. And that was after we went through their list and looked at lists. That's after we sent um, things over to the joint, over to the uh, Capital Development Committee and asked them to review it to see where they thought things should fall in place. What this amendment does is, is it reduces the appropriation, total appropriation to the Department of Higher Education by $14 million approximately. And that would include $11.4 million approximately for the public higher education institutions and 2.6 million for need-based grants. That's state financial aid, folks. That's what we're saying that we want to reduce with this. Um, and then it would also modify the footnote that relates to higher education. Right now, after a lot of negotiation, a lot of discussion with not only the higher education institutions, but also with the governor's office, we were able to get this funding up to a place where they can fund their base core standard, their core needs that they have at higher education and cap the tuition at 3%. This amendment would say that tuition would be capped at 4%. This amendment would then, that would put an additional burden on people who are trying to attend college. I mean, what is the point of having buildings if you don't have students because they can't afford college? And I also want to point out to you for the point with regard to higher education, um, that we are seventh in the nation from the bottom for funding for our higher education institute. What we have in the long bill currently keeps us at seventh. Doesn't move us to like eighth from the bottom. Doesn't move us to number 42. It keeps us at number 43. So again, there is a lot to go over here. I appreciate the comments and the need to make sure that we are looking at and funding controlled maintenance. I think the Joint Budget Committee, along with the Capital Development Committee, along with the Governor's Office, has been responsible in trying to address, number one, fully funding at 86 million controlled maintenance, number one, and then looking at other controlled maintenance needs that we had within the budget and funding those. Folks, it takes a lot of time to go through this, as the good senator from Denver knows, when we're on the Joint Budget Committee and when we are talking with and we have to work with the um, Capital Development Committee and the Governor's Office. The Capital Development Committee spends all summer going through these projects. So we didn't just summarily dismiss their list. We worked with them on it and talked about what was the most important things to be funded. The Capital Development Committee had a line drawn at approximately $185 million of needs and at the bottom, at the, just above that line, so at the bottom of the list was controlled maintenance too. So we took into consideration what they said, the Capital Development Committee said, were the priorities that needed to be funded. I would respectfully ask for a no vote on this amendment. Any further discussion on 26? Seeing that a motion is adoption of Amendment 26, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it, Amendment 26 is lost. Would the clerk please read the title of Amendment 27? Amendment 27 by Senator Malka, Amendment Ray Gross Bill, page 234, after line four, insert. Senator Malika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 27. To Amendment 27, Senator Malika. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this amendment is uh, dollars for uh, food security. Uh, I am, this amendment is asking for a million dollars that would go to the Food Pantry Assistance Grant Program and the Food Bank Assistance Grant Program, or any successor programs that may come from an orbital, orbital bill that is uh, currently uh, being considered. Uh, members, we know all throughout our state, uh, groceries have gotten expensive, uh, living has gotten expensive, and, and many in our community, some of our most vulnerable, are relying on these food banks and these food pantries uh, to make it. Um, if it's our families or if it's our seniors, um, it's all of the above. And really what this bill is doing is, or this amendment is doing is it's recognizing that and it's trying to get more dollars to that so that we can make sure that some of the most vulnerable members of our community all throughout each one of our districts has the ability to not go hungry. And so uh, I think that when we look at the overall budget, I think a million dollars um, is not too much to ask to make sure that some of the most vulnerable in our communities don't go hungry. I ask for a yes vote. 
Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is such a great idea. In fact, we already did it. So, uh, over the past couple of years, um, this uh, program has been a temporary, one-time grant program. And we decided that the goals of this programming was so important, we decided to no longer make it temporary and one-time. So we decided to make it permanent. And we, in fact, um, have a bill, an orbital bill, that is coming um, following this budget debate that will take the various uh, food pantry and food bank programs, um, put them all together under a consolidated uh, line item in um, state government, and we'll fund it. Uh, and so we were pretty proud of, um, of that work. Um, we were proud of the community that came and helped us uh, work through the, the consolidation and the collaboration that we received from everybody in order to do that. So um, I would have to ask for a no vote on this amendment, um, but we wholeheartedly support the idea and uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 27. All those favor say aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have it. Amendment 27 is lost. <laughs> Would a clerk please read Amendment 28? Amendment 28 by Senator Pelton B. Senator Amendment Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 28. To the amendment, Senator Pelton B. What Amendment 28 does is that this amendment rolls back $2 million from the Public Defender's Office to be rolled into the CIRCLE program. The CIRCLE program is the Community Innovation and Resilience, Resilience for Care and Learning Equity, and it's housed in the BHA. The program offers, offers comprehensive community-based residential treatment for individuals with co-occurring substance use and mental disorders. The program aims to, facilit to facilitate client stabilization followed by um, engagement in continuing outpatient services and ongoing care to support the management of those co-occurring co uh, conditions. Colorado has seen a drastic uptick in substance abuse since the COVID pandemic, and rural parts of our state have had a harder time dealing with the impacts of substance abuse. These funds will help extend the care provided by CIRCLE, Colorado's managed service organization allocation, $5 million for residential substance use treatment, withdrawal management, or detox, for families with teens and young adults facing addiction and mental health challenges. The Full Circle program offers a long-term, 12-step based enthusiastic approach, alternative peer support group and peer support coaching services at no cost. By granting an additional $2 million, in general, the, the, the General Assembly can continue the life-saving family saving and community saving treatment options that this program provides. I asked for an I vote on Amendment 28. We need it in rural Colorado. We need, um, we need mental health services and substance abuse services in, in rural Colorado. This will be a great program. And again, I'll say it again, and especially in rural Colorado, the public defenders have, are well funded in rural Colorado. And we need to take that money away and give it to someplace else. So I ask for an I vote. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the, the good senator from Weld County and I are just wondering, uh, we have a question for the sponsor of this amendment. Um, did you get in trouble with the public defender in some way in like high school or in your youth? I think this is like the third or fourth amendment where you're trying to defund the public defender's office. And I just gotta say, um, it, it kind of sounds a little personal. Um, nevertheless, uh, I recommend uh, a no vote on this amendment. Um, I have toured the CIRCLE program, I visited the CIRCLE program, it's an amazing program but it also serves a small number of individuals, and our public defenders serve the entire state of Colorado. 
So um, I'm going to have to say no. Um, we don't uh, particularly uh, want to defund our state public defender's office, particularly when this year we're trying to make an investment into the public defender's office in order to close what we see are some pretty serious workforce challenges. Um, we see uh, a tremendous amount of pay disparity um, in, in the office, and so this was one of our um, R1 requests that we received, and uh, we just don't feel like uh, we would like to roll back um, the, the work that we have done um, in order to fund another worthy project, but um, unfortunately, uh, it's just uh, we have to make some choices here, and we are choosing to fund our, our uh, public defender um, office over um, a small program that doesn't reach uh, people in all corners of the state. Senator Zinzinger, thank you for your comments. Let's be sure not to impugn the motives of an individual who may or may not have committed offenses in the past. And in addition to that, Senator Zinzinger, I, I know Senator Pelton B. Senator Pelton B is a friend of mine. Senator, okay, I'm done. Senator Zinzinger, please. Um, I would point out, Mr. Chair, that um, I'm not impugning anybody's motives if it turns out that it's not true. Mm. That's right. Just don't say anything, Senator Pelton B. Anybody, Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to rise in opposition to uh, Amendment 28J142. Um, this isn't the first amendment uh, that we have seen that utilizes um, the Office of the State Public Defender um, as a, as I, I don't know, um, some sort of um, uh, piggy bank for the sen for the good senator from Peltonville. Um, but um, I do just want to remind uh, this chamber um, that the work um, that we have seen in the aftermath of the passage of SB 2217, um, which, uh, cre which um, increased uh, the amount of data uh, that is contained within discovery, uh, particularly as it pertains to um, uh, body camera footage. From 2016 to now, the amount of data has increased by 4,500%. Um, OSPD has stretched dollars out of 15 cents by using paralegals, other uh, less expensive staff members to help accomplish um, that zealous defense in a cost-efficient way. However, this also does um, uh, provide uh, in, in create additional demands on attorneys as well um, to, um, to say, well, let's um, shift money from um, one source in order to try to fund another um, when, quite frankly, um, I think I, I agree with and appreciate uh, the members of the Joint Budget Committee in their diligence um, for um, meeting both the R1 uh, request for the Office of the State Public Defender while also um, going and uh, supporting the CIRCLE program uh, within the Department of Human Services. This amendment uh, goes too far. I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Thank you. Any further discussion on Amendment 28? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 28. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Good. The no's have it. Amendment 28 is lost. The clerk will the title to Amendment 29. Amendment 29 by Senator Simpson. Senator Amendment Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment number 29. To Amendment 29. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment takes $6 million from the General Fund, General Fund Appropriation Placeholder, specifically legislation for other shared priorities and moves it to the underfunded courthouse facilities grant program, increasing it by $6 million from current in the budgets three to nine. And it's specifically for uh, an issue in the 22nd Judicial District and the uh, Dolores County Courthouse. The courthouse was constructed in 1953. It's terribly undersized for the needs of the community. They've gone through a needs assessment um, conducted by Reynolds Ash and Associates Architect and the county's in the process of looking for project managers and 
um, developing plans and sending out for RFPs and RFQs, um, just a, a high need for my community in Dolores County and ask for an I vote on amendment number 29. Any further discussion on 29? Senator Zinzinger. I, I hope you all witnessed that. That was intimidation. Um, all right. Um, so I, I think I might have voted for this one if I uh, had some bacon um, that was offered to me. But seeing as how um, I'm on a diet, uh, I'm uh, encouraging that we do not vote for this uh, project which smells a little bit of pork. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 29. All those favor say aye. Opposed no. no. The no's have it. Amendment 29 is lost. Would a clerk please read the title of Amendment 30? Amendment 30 by Senator Pelton Senator B. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 30. Proper motion to the amendment, Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what this amendment does is it, roll back, it rolls back $2 million from the Public Defender's Office to be rolled back into the general fund. And then it, what, it, what it does is it will um, fund the, the DA salaries that's coming in Bill 24-013. Oh, I'm sorry, $4 million. I'm wrong. That's wrong. It's $4 million, not $2 million. It's $4 million. <laughs> Uh, when the Public Defender's Office grows by 4.6%, which is 48.2 FTE from 22 to 23, and then another 9.8%, uh, 107 FTE from 23 to 24, there's a problem with growth in the department, especially when our DA departments aren't growing in rural Colorado. Of the 107.5 FTE, FTE 90 are for attorney FTE. So. I really think that we need to really rethink on how we're doing this, where we need to start funding our DAs a little bit more so we can help protect victims in our communities, especially in rural Colorado. I ask for an I vote on, S, uh, on Amendment 30. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, let me just remind the good senator from Logan County, where he was a Logan County commissioner, that it is the county commissioner's responsibilities to fund the DA's office. So if they're short of funding, that's on the counties. It's not on us, that's not our bill. So here we go again, Office of State Public Defender. Do I look shocked? <laughs> Four million dollars from the Office of Public Defender. Um, appreciate where the good senator is trying to go to and his comments. I know that he's worked very diligently on budgets in the past, so I appreciate that he has really scoured this budget when it came to the Office of the Public Defender. So anyways, with that, we just um, would request a no vote on Amendment 30. And just want to remind everybody, in case those of you who are listening in that aren't sitting here in the, on the floor, that we are three-fifths of the way done, three-fifths of the way done through the amendments. Uh, you might want to start coming, making your way back here. We're getting close to an end. Any further discussion on Amendment 30? Seeing none of the motion is the adoption of Amendment 30. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. <laughs> the no's no. have it. No, 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 no. Amendment 30 no. is lost. Was that a distraction? Did you do that on purpose? Yes. Yeah. It's good teamwork. Would the clerk please do the title of Amendment number 31? Amendment 31 by Senator Pelton Senator B. Senator Pelton B. B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think this is my last one. So on uh, the public defender side, but I would like to move Amendment 31. Proper motion to the amendment, Senator Pelton B. Uh, so amendment, what this does is that it takes $2 million from the public defenders operating uh, and then gives it to the safety, school safety disbursement program. Just like the, um, um, this amendment is to leverage funds from the over weight outgrowing department to be utilized by making our children's schools and places of learning safer, more secure and hardened. Moving these funds to the school safety disbursement program will provide direct benefit to Colorado and help give more peace of mind to parents dropping off their children at school in the morning. So I ask for an aye vote on this amendment. Any further discussion? Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
This is the one that decreases the state public defender's office by $2 million. Yes. Um, and increases the appropriation to the Department of Public Safety by the same amount for the school safety disbursement program. And as much as I love the school safety disbursement program and would love to see if we could get additional dollars there, um, it's probably just not possible. And I would ask respectfully for a no vote on Amendment 31. Seeing no further discussion and motions, the adoption of Amendment 31. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Polls no. Yeah. The no's have it. Amendment 31 is lost. Would a clerk read the title to Amendment 32? Amendment 32 by Senator Gonzalez. Amendment gross bill, page 313, line 6, in the item and subtitle column. Senator strike Gonzalez. 700. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment L31. I'm sorry, Amendment 31, J143 uh, to 1430. Amendment 32. 32. There we go. To the amendment, Senator Gonzalez. My apologies. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Amendment 32. Um, adds 350,000 general fund to the Immigration Legal Defense Fund in the Department of Labor and Employment. Um, particularly um, in this moment um, when we are seeing asylum seekers navigate an ever more um, complicated and Byzantine um, uh, and broken immigration system, being able to actually help people navigate this immigration system is now more important than ever. Whether you are detained uh, and fighting um, uh, to actually um, ed, um, move your uh, immigration uh, case, or whether you are um, uh, awaiting your next uh, hearing and are trying to apply for a work permit, um, these um, uh, the immigrant. Immigration Legal Defense Fund, um, since we initially created it back in 2021, um, has uh, served uh, hundreds of people, thousands of people in terms of providing Know Your Rights presentations um, and uh, done uh, 928 individual intakes um, with individuals um, trying to uh, seek representation. I ask for an I vote on this important policy. Uh, it is a priority for our uh, Latino caucus and um, now more than ever as we see people who are um, trying to actually um, navigate the legal system um, uh, who are um, doing incredible uh, work in doing so. Um, I, I ask for your support on this important budget amendment. Thank you. Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the good senator from Denver. I understand the importance of her um, amendment, um, and, um, but respectfully have to ask for a no vote on this amendment. I understand it's only, only, we say only, $350,000, that sounds crazy. But it's only $350,000 of general fund. But as I reminded you all earlier, I mean, we went through, and I'm, I'm telling you, on that last night before we closed off the budget, um, and then we thought we were done and came, had to come back on Friday and we didn't get done until seven o'clock on a Friday night. We were looking through everything. I mean, we were going through couch cushions and looking for funds to make sure that we could balance this budget and introduce a balanced budget. So right now, it's like I said, on page seven, uh, line 28 of this budget, if you look at that summary table, you'll see that at the bottom on page seven, line 28, it says zero. So. We have to have an area of where this would come from um, for us to try and figure out where to consider that because otherwise we'll have to go figure out $350,000 of general fund to take away from some other project that is within the long bill. So we need some more information here, but at the same time, we're just telling you, it's very difficult this year to make sure that we balance the budget and um, ask respectfully for a no vote on Amendment 32. The motion is the adoption of Amendment 32. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 32 is passed. Would a clerk present a title to Amendment 33? Amendment 33 by Senators Marchman and Cutter, Amendment Gross Bill, page 331, line 5, strike services and substitute services 72A in the item and subtotal column strike 6,018,145 and substitute Senator Marchman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, withdraw Amendment um, 33. Amendment 33 has been withdrawn. Would a clerk present a title to Amendment 34? Amendment 34 by Senator Pelton B. and Henriksen, Amendment and Gross Bill, page 377, line 13, in the item and subtitle col column, strike 1,757,886 and substitute 4 million. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I move Amendment 34. To the amendment, Senator Pelton B. 
So what this amendment does is it, it, it uh, increases the appropriations to the Ve Veterans Assistant Grant Program for the, for, of the Veteran Military Affairs by uh, $2.5 million. And I asked for an I vote. And if the, uh, and the, if the JBC members want to know where it should come from, the governor's shared pot is where I think it should come from. I ask for an I vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. All right. Um, <clears throat> appreciate the good senator from Logan County to uh, give us the offset of where he thinks this should come out of so that we don't put the budget out of balance. Um, these additional amendments supporting the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs are unnecessary given the existing items already increasing support for veterans in the long bill. Members at the Joint Budget Committee, we do understand the importance of our veterans in this state. Um, and what they have done for us and the service that they have provided. So we have tried to, as best as we can through the budget process to ensure that there are um, items within the budget supporting our veterans. There's 500,000 general fund for the Colorado National Guard recruitment and retention. $195,000 general fund for construction facilities management funding. $73,000 general fund for training and development staffing. $250,000 cash fund spending authority for the Veterans Trust Fund, $193,000 for Civil Air Patrol and the JROTC capacity building. We love our veterans, and we try to make sure that there is uh, support for our veterans within the long bill. So, These items um, already are included in the department's budget. Um, they support overall operations for the department, including training and development and recruitment and retention. So in addition to the DMVA, the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs used $500,000 uh, $500, to the Veterans Assistance Grant from the 23-24 Long Bill to procure a clearinghouse, which renders Amendment 49 especially unnecessary. Finally, the same previous year Long Bill item was made continuous this year. I hope everybody heard that. The same previous year Long Bill item was made continuous this year. That's $500,000 that we made continuous this year in this long bill for a veterans assistance grant, providing, D, providing the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs with a $500,000 top line increase to the veterans assistance grant. It's already there. I appreciate again um, the service of uh, our senator from Logan County, and as he is a veteran as well, Appreciate the amendment. We've been taking care of the veterans. They're important to us. I respectfully ask for a no vote on this amendment. Senate for discussion and motions the adoption of Amendment 34. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it. Amendment 34 is lost. But the clerk will the title to Amendment 35. Amendment 35 by Senator Van Winkle. Amendment Senator Van Bill. Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move J177, other night, otherwise known as Amendment 35. Proper motion to the amendment, Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And what this amendment does is it would move $10 million in the state water plan. As we learned just uh, almost exactly three weeks ago from um, the Colorado Water Conservation Board and the Department of Natural Resources, they approved 52 water plan grant applications and distributed $17.4 million to fund critical projects to manage and conserve water, improve agriculture, spark collaborative partnerships, and much more. But the funding cycle, they received a record 70 applications requesting o almost $26 million, much more than is currently available. And to quote the um, Water Conservation Board Director, quote, water is on the top of many Colorado's minds and the projects in this program funds are critical to meet and mitigate our state's most critical water challenges. We received, and this is very important, we received significantly more applications and we had funding for this cycle for the water plan grants, showing just how much demand there is for this important funding and how critical it is that we continue to fuel this effort. And in light of all of that, I bring Amendment 35 to fuel or to fund those grants and continue to fuel the effort of water conservation in Colorado. Senator Zinzinger. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and we uh, thank uh, the good senator for his suggestion. Um, while we do agree that the water plan and the grant program in particular is a valuable source for support for projects that make progress on measurable objectives that are identified in our water plan, including water storage and supply, uh, this year, as, it, as um, House Bill uh, 1435, uh, which is a bill that is out in the ether, is currently drafted, it will already appropriate $23.3 million of those funds for the Water Plan uh, Grants Program uh, that will be available for next year. Um, and so while investing in our state's water future through the Water Plan Grant Program and other water projects is critically important, um, this additional general fund expenditure will, will put the budget out of balance and uh, when there is already significant funding that's allocated to this program. And in particular, um, we have funding, we have a, a funding source, uh, which is um, from Proposition DD. And so it would be, um, uh, in, in our minds, uh, inappropriate to take money from uh, the general fund in order to, um, to uh, plus up a program that already has its own dedicated funding source. So um, for those reasons, uh, we ask for a no vote. The motion is the adoption of Amendment 35. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it, Amendment 35 is lost. Will the clerk review the title to Amendment 36? Amendment 36 by Senator Peltonar. Amendment Senator Peltonar. Belt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move Amendment 36. To the amendment, Senator Peltonar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, two sessions ago, there was a bill ran to uh, put $60 million into a, a compact compliance for both the Rio Grande River Basin and the Republican River Basin. Uh, both of those uh, basins have almost spent that money, and they've been very successful at retiring wells, uh, shutting down wells, shutting down water use. Uh, so with that success, uh, I think it's only appropriate we kick in another $10 million to that. We're taking it from the general fund, and uh, I would like to take that from the, uh, the governor's shared uh, projects. So uh, please be a yes vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, we're on amendment number 36. We're getting to that top bottom countdown. So we all know we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, respectfully ask for a no vote on Amendment 36, and here's why. The Department of Natural Resources received $60 million of ARPA funds in Senate Bill 22, that would be in 22028, to provide financial support for the retirement of the groundwater irrigated agricultural lands in the Republican and Rio Grande basins. This is a valuable program that strengthens the state's climate's resilience by ensuring groundwater sustainability. Um, the department has worked diligently with a strong group of partners at the Rio Grande Water Conservation District and the Republican River Water Conservation District to plan for and implement the provisions of that bill. Both districts have been incredibly strong, made incredibly strong progress, and are on pace to obligate all of the ARPA funds prior to statutory and federal deadlines. While the state should continue to evaluate the need for future funding to support this important effort, funding from ARPA as well as CWCB cash funds in the CWCB annual projects bill currently remains available for the districts. Additional general funds at this time will put the budget out of balance. I appreciate that you want us to take it out of the shared uh, governor's pot. Um, however, there's still, we've been taking a lot of stuff out of the shared governor's pot. <laughs> so anyways, there's been a lot of money that has gone to programs that help with groundwater and irrigated agricultural lands in the Republican and Rio Grande basins. We understand the importance of um, water projects in the state of Colorado. That's why, like last year, we put an additional $12 million into the water plan. That's why we didn't touch um, the severance funds that need to go into the, that go into the perpetual base account in the, um, that are severance funds that goes into the Department of Natural Resources because we understand those water projects are extremely important. So um, with that, I respectfully have to ask for a no vote on this amendment. Senator Peltonar. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for that. But if the state falls out of compliance on either one of these basins, we're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars of fines from downwater states. So uh, I think this is a very small investment to uh, head off a big fine if they fall out of compliance. So I'd ask for a yes vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of amendment number 36. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. 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 
The noes have it. Amendment 36 is lost. Will, will the clerk please read the title to amendment number 37? Amendment 37 with Senator Pelton. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Senate Bill, or I'm sorry, Amendment 37. To the amendment, Senator Pelton B. Thank you. So what Amendment 37 does is it eliminates the new FTE and CDPHE in the health department and revert those funds back into the general fund. Since Governor Polis has been in office, CDPHE has been one of the fastest growing departments in the state. Since 2018, the department has grown by 21% FTE, and it has grown from 1,361 in, in, in the governor's first budget to 1,867, which is about a 38% increase. Colorado's population growth is about 1.58 annually percent. Uh, the budget for CDPHE has exploded under governor uh, under this governor uh, at um, oh that's a big number fifty four million six hundred fifty seven thousand three hundred thirty nine in his first budget year to a hundred and forty two million nine hundred sixty three to three hundred sixty in this year's budget that is a hundred and sixty one percent increase since twenty nineteen. These funds can be used to bolster the direct impact of pub to public health and environments programs and initiatives. Simply growing the department's FTE is more bloat, causing the state's budget to balloon since Governor Polis took office. One of my biggest problems with the continuing FTE going to CDPHE is that I was the chair of the Northeastern Colorado Health Department during COVID. And we saw firsthand how the state's health department, they like to say in the press that they let the local governments do it, but they didn't. And we could see firsthand how a big a government agency just took over and wouldn't let us be who we were until finally we followed our good county to the west of us named Well County and just started doing what they did. And then the governor sent down the Department of Revenue to shut down our restaurants, which our sheriff said that he needed to leave. This is not the way we should be doing things. Our local health departments, which I'm not touching any of the $11 million that's going to local public health, which is where it should go, and not the Colorado, not CDPHE. This is, this is getting to be a problem with continuing to grow the health department. We need to stop. I ran this same amendment last year doing it this year, and I'll probably be running it again next year when they grow it again. So I appreciate an I vote on Amendment 37. Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank the good Senator from Peltonia for bringing this amendment because it actually raises a very important topic, and it kind of speaks not only to the specific amendment, but to the overarching theme of the budget for the last several years. Actually, dating back until really when Bill Owens was governor. Back then, K through 12 budget was the first priority in our budget. It was the biggest chunk of that pie. And actually, HICPUF and the Department of Transportation's budgets, they were about the same. Now, if you look at a chart, which I have here, but I don't know if I can display it, but it's a very clear chart here that just goes from the bottom left to the top right. You see that the HICPUF has not only taken over K through 12 as the biggest piece of the pie, but dramatically so. And it dwarfs transportation, it dwarfs higher education, it dwarfs everything in our government. And what the net effect that is happening, what is going on here, is that K through 12 is essentially in a fight with a new, um, a new big behemoth in our budget that is now dwarfed even K through 12's budget. And so I ask for a yes vote on this amendment, but more so speaking to the overall uh, theme of our Colorado budgets, really in the last, even since before Jared Polis, before Governor Ritter, uh, going back for the last decade and more, it's been this department, uh, healthcare department growing dramatically faster than any other in really eating away at budgets like K through 12 and transportation. I ask for a yes vote. Senator Coker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you also to the sponsor. I, I, I hear your, 
your concerns um, and talking about the overall uh, public health and environment department, but these, this amendment and the amendments to come, 38, 39, 40, um, are making funding cuts to the Division of Disease Control and Public Health Response. Um, to retract this support is to disregard the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and dismiss collective health security in a detrimental way. The wake of COVID-19 pandemic continues to leave ripples in our daily lives. I have constituents who suffer from long COVID and struggle on a daily basis. It affected many of us deeply. In, in October 2020, a phone call shattered my world when my father had been diagnosed with COVID and was being wheeled into an ambulance. On that call, my dad, breathless and barely audible, whispered, I love you, goodbye. I rushed to the Mayo Clinic to be near him, not knowing if I would see him alive again. The nurses put up my campaign sign against the glass that separated us, hoping he could hold on just long enough to see the possibility of my serving here in the Senate, a dream he cherished. It nearly cost him his life in a state where the measures taken by our own public health and environment were not implemented, such as mask wearing. Now, four years later, we confront a resurgence of diseases like MPOX, syphilis, tuber tuberculosis, highly pathogenic avian flu, West Nile, chicken pox, RSV, group A strep, and pediatric pneumonia, just to name a few. These proposed amendments threaten to weaken our public health defenses to pre-pandemic levels, a time when our readiness was clearly insufficient. The funding at stake maintains a central support team of highly specialized epidemiologists, st statisticians, and health professionals. CDPHE maintains critical services to inform the public through trusted people embedded in their communities, through state-funded regional emergency preparedness staff that responds to emergencies and outbreaks across the state. They integrate support to doctors, healthcare providers, hospital systems, to make sure physicians have the information needed to care for their patients. Such a step back would not only dishonor the lessons learned, but also endanger lives at a time when our community cannot afford to be complacent. I believe in science and the CDPHE's Division of Disease Control and Public Health Response is a testament to science saving lives. And I urge a no vote. Thank you. Senator Pelton B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we are seeing a resurgence in some diseases, I agree. But the reason why we're seeing that resurgence is because nobody trusts the health department. Because they were overbearing, overgrossed, and took and, and acted tyrannically. And, and when that happens, no one trusts them. And when that goes on, people are not going to go back to them. They need to stop growing. It's just like it's just like other departments in, in that we have in the state depart in the state where people need to get to trust them. And the only way they trust them is by growing smaller and listening to the people. I ask for an I vote on amendment. 37. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 37. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have Amendment 37 is lost. We will now proceed out of order to Amendment number 42. Senator Marchman. Thank oh, you. Oh, one second. Will the clerk please read Amendment 42? Amendment 42 by Senator, Senator Marchman. Marchman. Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We would like to pull um, Amendment 42. Amendment 42 has been withdrawn. Will the clerk please read the title to Amendment 43? Forty-four. Thank you. Amendment forty-four by Senator Marchman, amending gross bill, page four eighty, line fourteen. Senator Marchman. Thank yep. you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment forty-four. 
Um, so this amendment is $500,000 toward school-based health centers. Um, the line item has not grown since 2014, and yet we've seen three to five new school-based health centers each year. Um, there are over 50 communities in Colorado based on a Colorado Health Institute report that could benefit from a school-based health center. What these are are healthcare facilities that are located on school grounds. Uh, they provide primary care, behavioral health care, health education, oral health care, and health insurance enrollment. They, see, they serve youth with limited access to care as well as um, community members. Um, so I certainly um, would urge your support on this. I will say that um, this money would come from the shared priorities and there's also a bill that is um, being worked through, Senate Bill 34, um, and we would pull, it's, this matches the same funding, so we would pull that bill, um, at least the funding part of it, if this passes. So I urge your I vote on Amendment 44. Senator, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> folks, we actually at the JBC like school-based health care centers, and that's why we put money in the budget for them. I think we actually funded it at 500000 and or it might even have been a million dollars. I'm not really sure, but I know that we funded it because it was our chair, uh, Representative Byrd, who had a really, she had a lot of comments about this, and we brought forward funding for it. So, um, again, great idea, and we like it. Um, and I appreciate that we identified a pot that it comes from. Thank you very much. Um, but at this point, I would respectfully ask for a no vote. Seeing a further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 44. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it, and Amendment 44 is adopted. <laughs> Members, just to be clear, we will proceed out of order, and we still need to hear when the sponsors are available, 38, 39, 40, 41 and 43. It's 43 here? Okay. Okay, we're gonna come back to 43 later. We need to move forward. We somehow skipped over 43 to go to 44. So we are now on Amendment 45. Would the clerk please read Amendment 45? Amendment 45 by Senator Van Winkle, Amendment Green Gross Bill, page 501. Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 45. To the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And members, what this amendment does is it fun will fund the school security disbursement grant program, which uh, was allocated $16 million this year. This has a long history. It was actually born uh, just after the STEM school shooting in Highlands Ranch, and it has always uh, exceeded the requests coming in from schools have always exceeded what is available usually by more than double um, and it's a very important program what it is and how it works is a school will identify essentially a tier one emergency need a tier one emergency need this is either a wing of the schools that doesn't have any cameras it's locks on a door that are broken it's glass that is faulty um, it's something that is very important, something very needy, and so they, a school will apply and they say, we don't have the funds in our budget, our district doesn't have the funds in our budget for this. It's specifically for school security and keeping our kids safe, and so they apply for these grant programs. This year, $16 million was allocated, and that's very good work from the, from the state of Colorado, and, um, but unfortunately, there are over $43 million in grant applications that had come in. So 66 uh, grants were awarded, it, many, many more. In fact, uh, only 37% of security needs facing the schools of Colorado were able to be funded by the current amount in the account. So what this $27 million I'm asking for represents is it will fulfill all of the grant requests that came in for, again, these are emergency, vital, uh, school security upgrades that are being asked for uh, from our school districts across the state of Colorado, and I ask for a yes vote. Senator Zinzinger. 
Thank you, uh, members. Um, last year, we made a historic investment of $16 million into this program. Um, unfortunately, this amendment will put the budget out of balance significantly, and so for those reasons, we respectfully ask for a no vote in order to keep the budget in balance. Senator, Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and that makes me, I suppose it makes me wonder exactly what we're doing here, because the budget came out of the Joint Budget Committee balanced, of course, and now the other many legislators, the rest of us were able to get, provide our input for the very first time here directly to the budget as a legislator, as someone elected by my district to represent my district. And we're told that we can't amend the original budget because the end result would be out of balance. I don't buy that because of course, after this project, after the Senate version goes through, there's the House version of the bill, there's a Senate version of the bill, and there's a conference com committee that will meet that will bring the two together and bring all the amendments together, and we'll take the budget back and look at all the amendments and bring it to balance before sending it to the governor's office. So yes, this $27 million would take the original joint budget committee bu budget that came from the joint budget committee to us out of balance. But there are many places where this could come from. For example, the $65 million of the governor's shared priorities. This is a shared priority for me, it's for my constituents, it's for everyone that has either a teacher, a colleague, or a school in their district. When we look at the schools that receive this funding, it's like Boulder Valley Schools, Adams 12 schools. There's 66 districts here that received vital school funding, and I believe this is one of them. So when it comes to being told, well, this will throw the original budget out of balance, that's the original budget, that's not going to be the end budget. Of course, the budget went to the House, it got thrown out of balance. Now it comes to the Senate, it will be also out of balance. And then in the end of the day, everything will come together and will be balanced before sending it to the governor. And of course, even next year, early, when we're in the middle of our fiscal year, halfway through, we're going to come back and further balance the current budget that we're passing now, next January, when it comes to um, supplemental requests from this department, either positive or negative. So the budget will be in balance before the governor's office, no matter what amendments we pass here today. And I ask for a yes vote uh, for the kids of Colorado. Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the good senator from Douglas County. Uh, appreciate your frustration. So there are requirements that we have a balanced budget and can demonstrate that when we introduce it. We have to have a balanced budget um, and demonstrate that when uh, we pass it on third readings in both the House and the Senate after we come out of conference committee. So at every point before we vote, we have to be able to demonstrate specifically that we have a balanced budget. Um, so I appreciate that you said there are um, pots of shared priorities on, um, and if you look on page 181 of your budget books, you will see those pots. And I believe that I um, express to my caucus on more than one occasion that we really need to have an offset. If you don't come up here, and it, maybe I did not hear it, and if I did not, I apologize, but if you don't come up here and explain to us um, where the offset is, and you just say you want $27 million of general fund, it will throw us out of balance because we have no idea where you think we should be pulling it from. So that's why I guess I would just ask you if you would want to come up here and give us an idea of where you think we should be pulling it from, um, and then we can go from there. But that is how the process does work. Um, the good senator from Arvada was correct in that I don't believe she heard that there was an offset either. I mean, if you noticed in some of these budget amendments as we have been moving forward, uh, some of them were coming from, oh, I don't know, the Office of the State Public Defender's Office to fund something in a different department or just reducing that one or reducing the health department, the number of FTE that were funded in the health department. Um, other folks came up and said their offset would be is that they would like to see it come out of the shared priority pots um, that, again, that are listed on page 181 of your budget. So um, it would be helpful everybody. I know I spoke about this earlier in the day when we were, I think, on amendment number nine or 10. But again, when you look at page seven, uh, line 28 in that table, you'll see a zero. There's a zero. That means we budgeted every single penny that we knew of when we introduced the bill. We also have to, if it's general fund, 
We also have to have, by statute, a 15% general fund reserve attached to it. So if you ask for $27 million, we end up having to add on 15% to make sure that we cover our general fund reserve. So that ad additionally would come out of, has to come out of someplace, has to come out of something that has either been funded or slated for funding in the long bill, or like I said previously, look at page 181, tell us if you think it should come out of the housing shared priority pot, the workforce and education shared priority pot, the other uh, shared priority pot, or the legislative pot. That would be helpful. If we don't hear that, we're going to let you know that your amendment, should it pass, will put the budget out of balance. That's what we were trying to explain. Sorry for all the frustration, um, but we're just trying to work through this as well. Thank you. Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I'll repeat the speech that I just gave, which is the $65 million in governor's shared parties. And then I said, it should be a shared party. It should be a shared party for the governor. It should be a priority for us here. It should be a priority for our teachers, for our students, for faculty, and for anyone on a K through 12 elementary college, or elementary middle school or high school campus. Because these, again, and once again, it's not me. I'm not asking for this for myself. I suppose I have two kids in K through 12 schools here in the state of Colorado, so perhaps I'm asking for them. But in reality, I'm asking for $27 million in the schools that literally came and said, we have an urgent tier one need for some, something, cameras, door locks, windows. Um, it could be any assortment of things. They said they were tier, they were urgent needs, they were specific needs, so it wasn't like they came, it wasn't like a district came and just said, oh, we need another $5 million for school security. No, it was, we don't have radios that communicate with 911, we know it will cost this much to do it, and this is what we're asking for. And then those came together, they were asked, seeing what can we fund, what can we not, and it turns out only 37% of those requests were able to be funded. And so once again, I'm asking for specifically from the governor's share priorities, the $65 million that is there because I believe this should be a priority for the governor. I hope he's listening. And it should be a priority for us here in the legislature. I ask for a yes vote. Seeing a further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 45. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have it. Amendment 45 is lost. But the clerk will you the title to Amendment 46. Amendment 46 by Senators Van Winkle and Pelton B. Amendment and Gross Bill, page 501. <laughs> Senator Van Winkle. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, if I am not able to get on the previous amendment $27 million for the school safety disbursement program, then the, I move Amendment 46. To the amendment. And Amendment 46 would allow $4 million in, uh, to go to the grant program to bring it up to, for this year's total, $20 million. It would still be well below 50% of the requests that came in, again, for urgent uh, urgent school security needs, very specific needs, and I ask for a yes vote. Any further discussion? Senator Pelton B. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and we ask that it be taken from the governor's shared priorities. Any further discussion? Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, during the last discussion um, about this, uh, a lot was said, um, but uh, I um, remember some new information uh, about this particular program. Um, this was a program that was one-time funding through ARPA funds, and the fund is slated to repeal at the end of this year, so it does not exist in next year's budget, and for those reasons, I'd ask for a no vote. Soon no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 46. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. No. The no's have Amendment 46 is lost. Would a clerk please the title to Amendment 47? Amendment 47 by Senators Gardner, Marcus, and Janae, Pelton B. and Winter. Amend Green Gross Bill, page 511, after, nine, after line 9, insert appropriation to the Colorado Crime Senator Services Senator Pelton Fund. B. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 47. To the amendment. Go ahead. Senator Marcus and Janae. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is um, a serious amendment for victim services. Um, Colorado is set to only receive $13.8 million in 2024, down from $23.4 million received in 2023. Prior to 2024, the lowest amount Colorado had received was $18.1 million. Colorado expects a further decrease of at least 40 to 50% in victims of um, 
and VOCA awards for 2025 funding cycle with future allocations expecting to remain low. Outside of private fundraising, these programs are completely sustainable on the money they receive through these grant programs, which until last session relied entirely on federal dollars. Senator Peltonby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So what would happen without this money? Just let me read some quotes from some community members um, out in Colorado. Uh, we calculate, calculated based on a 40% cut and estimate a possible 860 child victims of abuse uh, will go unserved in Colorado yearly. The Blue Bench serves approximately 2,800 survivors per year. A 40% cut to this funding would mean 1,680 survivors go without support. We would like, likely have to reduce one in, or two positions and have a reduction of at least 50% of emergency funding for clients. 50% would, clo would close our shelters. We can barely cover the shifts we need with the funding we have currently. We would have to become some sort of night stay temp shelter or something. I don't want to imagine. That's what this will do. That's if we don't have this money, these funds that we are losing, we will, victims will suffer all throughout Colorado. I ask for an I vote on 47. Senator Kirkmeyer. Go ahead. Senator Pelton B. Sorry, Mr. Chair, and we would ask that we take it out of the governor's shared priorities. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'd be happy to. <laughs> uh, and I greatly appreciate that. Thank you for letting us know, um, because it is just straight up general fund. Um, believe me, at the Joint Budget Committee, we understand the importance of uh, funding victims, crime victim services. Um, last year, we made a one-time investment of $8 million of general fund um, in this program, and we have yet another well, it's not a one-time anymore. We'll have a two-time transfer of $4 million general fund for this program through House Bill 241420. So appreciate um, what you're all trying to do. We appreciate the programs. Um, but at this point, I respectfully just ask for a no vote on Amendment 47. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 47. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. Amendment 47 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of Amendment 48? Amendment 48 by Senators Pelton R. and Will. Amendment in Gross Bill, page 574, line 4 in the Senator total Pelton column. R. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 48. To the amendment, Senator Pelton R. Thank you. Uh, this amendment, you know, anybody who drives our highways knows how bad they're getting. We're getting money taken from our construction and maintenance and operations funds and they're being used for administration and other things. So what this amendment does is simply takes cash funds away from the administration of CDOT and puts it towards uh, construction, maintenance, and operations in the State Highway Fund. Senator Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so we talked to a lot of our uh, maintenance, maintenance workers and all that, especially on the end of my district, and I know Senator Felton's district, but you know they're down to about 40% of their uh, construction and maintenance budgets of what they used to be. It's not that the funding is down to CDOT, it's just that that maintenance funding is down that much to 40, 50 percent of what they used to get. And our highways need to need that, so we're asking for that uh, 13 million cash Thir funds from the state highway fund. 13 billion. Million. Million. I just want to make sure I heard that right. <laughs> Senator Pelton A lot smaller uh, ask, yeah. We, we would take 13 billion for sure. But again, this is cash funds already to CDOT, no impact to the general fund. So I'd, I'd urge a yes. Senator Zinzinger for the $13 billion. Yes. Um, members, I would respectfully ask for a no vote on this amendment. Um, CDOT's administrative budget currently um, already funds uh, critical functions, including the financial management and compliance with state and federal regulations, which is really important because if we do not stay compliant, then we could potentially be foregoing millions upon, literally billions upon of uh, billions of dollars to our state uh, if we do not manage uh, to um, have the staffing in order uh, to stay 
into compliance. Also, reducing $13 million from administration could mean the elimination of literally 101 FTE, which would expose CDOT to uh, serious risks, including financial mismanagement, noncompliance with state and federal regulations, and misallocation of funds, reduced tra financial transparency, and increased fraud and theft. So um, it's really important that we maintain our current procurement staff uh, rather than eliminate them, because if you eliminate your procurement staff, that would also prevent uh, CDOT from completing contracts with local governments. And I don't know about you, but um, I drive on Wadsworth a lot. And it's really important that uh, we maintain those contracts with our local governments so that we can continue to maintain our roads. So um, this, in my opinion, would uh, harm CDOT's ability to deliver on projects that were selected by local transportation planning region, regions and local governments. And these FTE cuts, uh, quite frankly, um, would have to happen since the rest of the administration funding must be used for legal services <laughs> because there'd be nobody left. Um, and OIT and other contracts. So otherwise, uh, I believe that uh, CDOT would have to use funds in the construction and maintenance line item in order to cover these expenses. And we already know that uh, the state of our roads just couldn't afford that. So um, I, I believe that cutting administrative funding would undermine our ability to deliver on our projects that have been identified um, uh, by our locals as well as our state transportation plan. And it would, quite frankly, put our state in financial jeopardy. So I'm going to ask for a no vote. See no further discussion. The motion is the adoption of Amendment 48. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no is having Amendment 48 is lost. Would the clerk please the title of Amendment 49? Amendment 49 by Senator Pelton B. Amend re Gross Bill, page 5 Senator Pelton R. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 49. To the amendment, Senator Pelton R. Everyone ought to really like this one. What this amendment would do is it would... Uh, you would not fund any FTEs in departments that have vacancies. This is a great thing. We don't need to have that money budgeted. So let's just not fund it. So I'd ask for a yes vote on 49. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you so much. We actually had a really interesting conversation about this at the JBC. Um, and our conclusion was interesting idea, but not practicable. So uh, we are going to have to ask for a no vote. Um, unfortunately, it would have a negative uh, outsized impact uh, negatively on a couple of key operations, in particular uh, corrections, human services, and public health. So those agencies are pretty critical uh, to our state. and. Um, um, those in particular, those agencies whose direct service staff are funded through specific line items, um, this would create uh, enormous challenges uh, in our um, public sector uh, jobs. And so uh, limiting the operations of a department because of vacancies doesn't actually help us uh, uh, complete uh, the work that needs to happen um, by these divisions and agencies. So um, instead, we believe that the amendment would hamstring our agencies from operating other programs uh, that meet important state needs because of factors outside of their control, like uh, national workforce shortages and whatnot. So um, interesting idea. We also uh, debated it, and ultimately we determined that it was just not feasible, and so I'm going to ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 49. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The no's have Amendment 49 is lost. <laughs> Would the clerk please read Amendment 50? Amendment 50 by Senator, Senator Simpson. Senator Simpson. Gross Bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, sorry. Thank That's you. That's cool, bro. Mr. Be like Chair. that sometimes. Be like that. I caught it. I respectfully withdraw Amendment 50. And Amendment 50 has been respectfully withdrawn. Will the clerk go back to read Amendment? Senator Zinzinger. No, no, no. Um, so members, uh, we are at Amendment 50, which would have ordinarily been a very celebratory moment because it's the end of the amendment packet. But we have to go back and do a few amendments um, that uh, we uh, skipped over in order to allow our members some opportunities for um, some bill signings and whatnot. So um, we are going to go back to Amendment 38. 38. Will the clerk please read Amendment 38? Amendment 38 by Senator Rich, Amendment and Gross Bill, page 443, line 4 in the Senator item Rich. Title. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm going to just try something a little bit different here. 
because uh, I know that occasionally our JPC members come up here and they say, you know, we're getting to zero. So, Amendment 38. I move Amendment 38. That's a proper motion to the amendment. Thank you. This amendment is about decreasing expenditures in the general fund, striking 10764 to 7764 and in the general fund, that would come from, uh, in the general fund, it would strike 7,946 to 4,946. And then on page 443, line five, we would strike 122.7 F FTEs and substitute 89.6 FTEs. This would result in a savings of $3 million with a corresponding decrease in FTEs of 33.1 in the Public Health and Environment uh, Department Division of D D Disease Control and Public Health Response. I would hope that our JBC members would like to see us trying to save some money. And we're going to give it to any further hospital. discussion. And give it to the rural hospitals. Yeah, you say it again. And we're going to give that Senator, three Senator, million dollars Senator. to rural hospitals. Yeah. I would. Lo I'd love to make sure that everybody listening to this amazing debate knows who's speaking. There we go, Senator Will. Go ahead, brother. Ah, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. I got excited. It's all good. <clears throat> we're going to spend that three million for rural hospital care. Mm. Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want you all to know that the Joint Budget Committee, when this request came in, that we did reduce it by 25%, um, trying to work with the Governor's Office and the Department of Public Health. So um, I respectfully ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 38. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The no's have Amendment 38 is lost. Would the clerk please read the title to Amendment 39? Amendment 39 by Senators Liston and Pelton R. Amendment and Gross Bill, page 443, line 4, in the item and subtotal columns, strike 10 million seven. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, I move J140 to uh, House Bill 1430, otherwise known as Amendment 39. To the amendment, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, colleagues, uh, excited to bring this amendment and uh, to answer the first question this is not a new general fund ask what this amendment proposes to do is move less than 10 percent of the uh, budget of within cdphe for disease prevention and control uh, to the within cdphe to the emergency medical services uh, fund with a line item that these funds be used for ground ambulance licensing Colleagues, this is about funding our, our EMS providers, the people in our state who help us when we are in danger and when we are in need, um, often travel great distances and provide extraordinary care. As many of you probably know, they operate uh, in the red or with very slim margins and need more support from the state to continue doing good work. Uh, this is about our rural EMS departments, of course, but uh, really every EMS department in the state could use this support. Um, this is a modest uh, shifting of money within CDPHE to help out our first responders and would ask for an I vote. Any further discussion? Senator Peltonar. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and this is very needed. Uh, my last year as a county commissioner, our ambulance uh, department became uh, almost insolvent, and it's just gotten worse to ever since. And out in rural Colorado, our ambulance crews are sometimes the difference between life and death. So I think this is a very great amendment and ask for a yes vote. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, once again, I'm uh, proud to be uh, one of the uh, uh, co-sponsors of this needed amendment for rural Colorado. Uh, you know, quite frankly, we all know that the ambulance services, they're not only underfunded, uh, a lot of times they're not even paid by, uh, by the insurance companies or the people who utilize their services. They're at the bottom of the pecking order trying to just uh, collect what they can. Uh, this is really very, very needed. Um, uh, and like the good senator from Frisco said, uh, this does not take money from the general fund. Uh, it makes perfectly good sense. We respectfully ask for an I vote for Amendment 39. Thank you. Any further discussion? 
on Amendment 39. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you very much, uh, members. Um, I, I understand the, the goal of this amendment, and it is definitely a, a worthy one. Um, however, uh, I do believe that there is a, um, a special task force uh, that has been uh, meeting and operating in order to figure out how best to meet the needs of our uh, emergency medical services in the state. And I would much rather uh, follow their recommendations uh, in their task force report because uh, all members of the emergency medical services field have been uh, convening uh, now two years, basically, um, to discuss these issues and to figure out how um, the best way forward would be. And so for those reasons, um, I would say that I think that this amendment kind of gets ahead of itself a little bit. Um, and uh, while good intentions, um, I would have to ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 39. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The ayes have in Amendment 39 is adopted. No. Will the clerk please read the title to Amendment 40? Amendment 40 by Senator Will, Amend Green Gross Bill, page 443, line 4 in the item and subtitle column, strike 10,764,305 and substitute 9,264,305. And in the general fund column, strike 7,946,425 and substitute 6,446,425. Page 443, line five, in the item and subto subtotal column, strike 122.7 FTE and substitute 106.1 FTE. Yeah. Okay. Adjust effective Thank totals you. accordingly. Page 577, after line two, insert. Appropriation to- Senator Colorado. Will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I move amendment Four zero forty. That's a proper motion. J one seventy three. The House Bill fourteen thirty. So what I'm what I'm doing here is asking for a million and a half dollars general fund and uh, sixteen point six FTEs for the from the Division of uh, Disease Control and Public Health Response, and um, I'm moving that to the uh, Wildlife Safe Passage Fund. And you know, every year is about $80 million uh, in road strikes and vehicle strikes and road kills and our state highways cost Coloradans about $80 million and, uh, from those collisions. But these, uh, these dollars here I'm asking for will be very well invested and saves lives and it uh, makes it safer for a motoring public. We ran those bills with safe passages before and um, this is just a way of, uh, protecting our motoring public, uh, making our highways safer, saving money, and uh, we'll also leverage a lot of federal dollars by having this, uh, getting matches from fe federal dollars to do this to improve our highways and create safe passages for a wildlife resource of this state. This is an excellent amendment. Vote yes. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, wanted to come up here and rise in strong support of this amendment from the good senator from Newcastle. He and I have worked on this issue for several years now, as others in this chamber have uh, two years ago, three years ago, passed the Safe Pass Crossings Fund. And this isn't just about building safe crossings for animals. Of course, uh, this helps improve wildlife health and biodiversity by creating safe passages, but this is about keeping our, our, colleague, our citizens safe on the roads. Um, if you've ever driven between Silverthorne and Kremlin uh, in my district on Highway 9, or there are other great examples, the wildlife crossings they've put in in that section of highway have reduced collisions for passengers and uh, drivers by over 90%. Uh, almost immediately, which saves everybody money. It saves you on your insurance costs. Uh, so bills like this and, and amendments like this are supported not only by people who advocate for wildlife, but by insurance carriers and AAA and those who try to keep people safe on the road. And I just want to underscore the federal match opportunity in this. I wish that CDOT had pushed this in their original budget request because right now a f four to one federal match is available. For every dollar we put in at the state level, we get four from the federal government. We could really do some great work and build more safe passages and wildlife crossings in Colorado if we invested more from our state side. So um, I understand this is a challenging budget, but I wanted to uh, rise in support of this amendment and hopefully we can continue conversations on this issue uh, for many years to come. Senator Zinzinger. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, speaking of safe passages, I wish I could have one right now <laughs> to take me somewhere. Um, unfortunately, uh, as the good senator mentioned in his description about these um, uh, safe passages for wildlife, they are uh, an amazing uh, opportunity. We like this program. But in fact, CDOT did not come forward and request it. Had they done that, we might have thought about it. We might have found a way to accommodate that request in the budget already, but they didn't. Because apparently, they don't think that it is necessarily a priority at this point. Um, and it's certainly not a priority at the cost to our public health. So um, I, I don't... Um, uh, disagree with uh, the good standards and the good um, outcomes of these wildlife crossings, but uh, we would prefer that the funding not be taken away from our public health and environment um, uh, division in order to um, fund this um, uh, particular program. And uh, for that, I would ask for a no vote. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of Amendment 40. Um, have any of you ever hit a wild animal on the roadways? One, two, three, four, limited number of us. We've had that experience, uh, not good for the animal, not good for us. My parents almost died in a car accident. It was not in Colorado, it was in an adjacent state where they hit an animal. Um, this is a very important public health, in my opinion, amendment. It's exactly what we need to be doing with public health. So that's argument number one, is it just makes good policy sense. Argument number two is, do we work for CDOT? No, I don't think so. I think at the end of the day, CDOT works for us under the hopefully good management and good offices of the governor. But in terms of deciding where and when, I think we have a greater authority on this conversation than does CDOT. That's argument number two. Argument number three, ladies and gentlemen, we have an opportunity to perform magic. $1.5 million right here. This amendment, as we put it into the yes voting machine, comes back to us as $7.5 million. That's a $6 million plus up of federal funds. I mean, pick your argument. I think I've given you three good arguments. Any one of those arguments should compel a yes vote on Amendment 40. I frankly like the first one because it's about keeping people safe, protecting public health. But at the same time, you know, I'm kind of a finance guy. And somebody says to me, for every dollar you put down, I'll give you four more. I take that deal. And that deal is on the table right now, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to sound like an auctioneer, but you have the opportunity <laughs> to turn a million and a half dollars into seven and a half million dollars. Please join in support of Amendment 40. Senator Liston. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, members, I rise in support of Amendment 40. I'll just give you a quick uh, vignette. Uh, this was about two years ago, three years ago. Uh, I was driving home from southern Colorado, rural Colorado, on the interstate, uh, I-25. I remember uh, right where it was, uh, south of Pueblo, north of Walsenburg, and I was going 70 miles an hour in the daytime, and I saw a buck, a big buck, about, I don't know, two, three hundred yards out. He was coming across the highway. I started slowing down, slowing down, and he wasn't slowing down. Make a long story short, I did clip him. I don't know if I killed him, but I think back, if I had been going uh, at dusk uh, or twilight at uh, 70 miles an hour, as big as this buck would, I mean, uh, no telling what kind of damage, uh, I would have probably been dead. You know, some of you may cheer about that, but, <laughs> but uh, anyways, the uh, public safety aspect, people do inadvertently hit uh, wild game. Uh, and we're not talking uh, small game. We're talking bucks and stuff like that, rhinoceroses, elephants, you name it. 
moose, yeah. Uh, while the animal always generally loses, so does the uh, occupants of the uh, high, uh, in the car. So this is a good, well-reasoned amendment. I would urge an I vote on Amendment 40. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 40. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The noes have it, and Amendment 40, even though no one said no, is lost. Will the clerk please read a title to Amendment 41? Amendment 41 by Senator Fenberg. Amendment in gross bill, page 447. Senator Fenberg. Seven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment 41. To the amendment, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Amendment 41 is uh, uh, adding $229,000 to the um, Department of Public Health and Environment for the implementation of the Gamete Bank and Fertility Clinic Program. It has been the honor of my life to talk to you all individually over the last few hours about gametes. And I'm surprised how many of you don't know what a gamete is until we had our little, little chit chat. However, this is about implementing a bill uh, that we passed a few years ago. Um, senator Gardner, or the good senator from El Paso County, was on it with, with me. And um, it, it is about regulating uh, uh, sperm and egg banks in order to protect the children uh, that result from donor conception. Um, this, uh, the CDPHE and the department have been doing a lot of really impressive stakeholding and good work. We will be the first state in the country to implement a program of this sort. And after all that stakeholding and learning from the industry and impacted folks, they felt like they needed a couple more FTE. And I think it'd be appropriate to do that to make sure this is a successful program and ask for an I vote. Any further discussion on Amendment 41? Senator Gardner. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, I, I join uh, with uh, the Senate President in asking for an I vote on Amendment 41. This is the good Amendment 41. Um, uh, members, it was uh, an important bill that the President and I carried, um, and, and sort of groundbreaking in terms of regulating um, the the gamete and, and fertility clinic uh, programs uh, around the country, and uh, uh, to do so in Colorado. Um, our, our bill actually made the New York Times. I didn't read it there. Someone told me about it. Uh, but in order to do what is a very important program, uh, we need uh, this appropriation, uh, this $229,000. Uh, so I urge an I vote and uh, uh, believe uh, that it is in a, a very good cause that we do this. Any further discussion on 41? Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I just love it that you're both standing here next to me because I looked up what gamut means and it talks about uniting. Mm. Haploid mm. male germs. Mm. It's about uniting haploid male germs. Just thought I'd point that out. But anyways, um, you know, there's not a whole lot we can say about this bill. I'm it's glad that it was in the... <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting here trying to think of something really clever to say, but then these two and threatened me and, and made me feel like, God, I, I just got to get out of the well. But anyways, um, I don't really have a lot to say on this one, but I would respectfully ask for a no vote because I did not hear from either of the sponsors of this amendment, where you think we're going to get $230,000 of general fund money. Really need that. Really need to know where that is. Where are we getting tonight? Which bank? Which bank are we getting that out of? Mr. President. It, it, we will find it in the sperm bank. Uh, Mr. Chair, I um, appreciate uh, the quick res uh, ability to quickly respond here. If I'm not mistaken, we have, mistaken, we have about $130,000, $120,000 in excess money just laying around. So we really only need to come up with roughly $100,000. And I, I'm confident, I am confident that the conference committee is going to be able to squeeze out $100,000 from this budget. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I learned at our Republican Budget Caucus this morning that 
uh, there's enough underutilized funding in Medicaid to buy a helicopter or two or three every year. So we really ought to, for a very worthy purpose such as this, be able to uh, find $229,000. Senator Kirkmeyer. All right, so it's the governor's pot it is. Thank you very much. Still ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion. The motion is the adoption of Amendment 41. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 41 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of the final, well, close to final amendment, uh, Amendment number 43. Amendment 43 by Senators Buckner, Will, and Fields, Amendment and Gross Bill, page 478, before line 13, insert. Item in subtotal perinatal health, $1,250,000. General fund, $1,250,000. Adjusted package totals accordingly, accordingly, page 493, before line 7, insert, 98A. Senator Public Fields. Health and Environment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We move Amendment 43. To the amendment, Senator Fields. Members, basically what this bill does, it provides $1.25 million to the Department of Public Health to address prenatal care for moms and babies through a statewide hospital health quality improvement program. So we're asking for an I vote. Senator Will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in Colorado, there's, there's almost 40% of all counties in Colorado are maternity care deserts. And that's meaning, meaning they do not have a hospital or a birth center offering obstetric care, or do they have any obstetric providers? Far more counties in rural Colorado face significant challenges in delivering care to pregnant people and their infants due to limited resources and the workforce capacity, also transportation, social support barriers, but patients in these counties are well, the most vulnerable and suffer the poorest health outcomes. I have to say that mothers living in frontier counties of this state are dying from pregnancy-related causes that race nearly four times those of their counterparts living in urban Colorado. Senator Buckner. Thank you. Um, Senate Bill 1, this, this, um, this amendment is about increasing coordination and partnership among the dedicated organizations leading efforts to improve perinatal health to ensure the field is holding together, holding itself accountable for improving perinatal outcomes in Colorado. And Amendment J-156 would ensure that there is sufficient funding for the state to improve outcomes for women of color and women in rural areas. Any further discussion on Amendment 43? Senator Zinzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my colleague uh, from Weld County and I, um, if we were not members of the Joint Budget Committee, would highly encourage people to vote for this amendment. Highly encourage. But unfortunately, Respectfully. we're members of the Joint Budget Committee, so we are going to have to ask for a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 43. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 43 is adopted. Will the clerk please now read Amendment 51? Amendment 51 by Senator Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer amend the Appropriations Committee report to Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move Amendment Number 51. To the amendment, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, uh, members. This amendment is very simple. It just corrects two technical errors that are in the Appropriations Committee report um, by inserting some missing instructions and replacing an amount in the item and subtotal column. So we're just making sure we have all of our T's crossed, our I's dotted, and the right numbers in the right columns. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of Amendment 51. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. Amendment 51 is adopted. Right. Senator Zinzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I remove, renew my motion. Uh, for the adoption of House Bill 24-1430 as amended. Seeing for further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1430. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. 
The ayes have it. House Bill 1430 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title of the House Bill 1389. House Bill 1389 by Representative Sirota and Taggart, Senator Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer concerning providing funding to schools in the 2023-24 budget year for increases in pupil enrollment after the 2023-24 budget year pupil enrollment count day and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you. I move House Bill 1389. To House Bill 1389, Senator Zizinger. Uh Members, um, beginning on October 1st of each budget year, school districts and institute charter schools count their enrolled students, which informs the amount of funding from the state that each school receives. During the annual legislative session, the General Assembly accounts for a mid-year adjustment in school funding in order to accommodate those enrollment changes after the annual pu pupil enrollment count date. Between October 1, of 2023 and February 28 of 2024, Colorado experienced an unprecedented influx of new arrival students enrolling in schools across the state. So for the 23-24 budget year, this bill appropriates one-time funding from the state education fund to the Department of Education for school districts and institute charter schools that enrolled new arrival students after that annual pupil enrollment count date. The total funding will be based on the total number of 23-24 net student population as of February 29th and the 23-24 pupil enrollment as of 23-24 count day. What this will do in this bill is it, it, it defines what a new arrival student is as one who moved from another country to Colorado directly or indirectly, who has been in the United States for less than one year, who is not proficient in English or has limited English proficiency, and whose enrollment in a Colorado public school is the student's first school enrollment in the United States. Uh, school districts and institute charter schools must request funding in order to receive that funding provided in this bill. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1389. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1389 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1400? House Bill 1400 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Kirkmeyer and Zunzinger concerning Medicaid eligibility procedures. Senator Zinzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1400. To the bill, Senator Zinzinger. So members, under last year's Senate Bill 23-182, there were certain Medicaid and CHIP Plus eligibility statutes that were suspended until June of 2024. Now, the reason why we did that is so that the Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing could comply with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services guidelines during the unwinding of the public health emergency. Now, recently, CMS extended those same timeframes for some of the PHE era waivers to December of 2024. Therefore, HICPUF needs to extend the June 2024 deadline for several of these suspended statutes and uh, continue these waivers in order to comply with the new federal guidelines. This extension is not optional. <laughs> It protects HICPUF from future state and federal auditors who may determine that federal funds spent between June and December should be returned to the federal government because state statute conflicts with CMS guidelines for these waivers. In addition, the bill gives HICPUF legislative authority to permanently maintain some of the most critical waivers if, and that's a, an if, the federal guidelines allow for it. Specifically, a few of the waivers make the renewal process easier for members and less burdensome for eligibility partners uh, permanent. So for instance, one of the waivers allows HECPUF to maintain electronic approvals of Medicaid and CHIP Plus renewals. This decreases members' need to return those renewal packages and decreases the county workload burden, and that's a good thing because we want um, these kinds of changes. And so for those reasons, uh, and for the fact that this extension is not optional, we please ask for your I vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1400. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1400 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1401? 
House Bill 1401 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Enzinger and Kirkmeyer concerning making an appropriation to the Department of Health Care Policy and Financing for payments to the Denver Health and Hospital Authority. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Members, I ask for your support of 24-1401. Remember earlier in the day when we talked about um, all of the amendments to the long bill to provide funding to Denver Health? This is the bill that we were speaking about. This bill appropriates $5 million of general fund money to the Department of Health Care Policy and Finance for 24-25 for payments to the Denver Health and Hospital Authority. This is $5 million to Denver Health. Ask for an I vote. Thank you, Senator Kirkmeyer. Please move House Bill 1401. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will. Uh, I move House Bill 24-1401. Proper motion. See in the further discussion. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1401. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1401 is adopted. <laughs> Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1403? House Bill 1403 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Enzinger and Bridges concerning post-secondary education support for students experiencing housing disruptions in high school and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1403. To the bill. Senator Zizinger. Um Members, this is a special bill um, that came to us uh, as at the Joint Budget Committee as one of the Department of Higher Ed's decision items. Uh, they asked us if we would consider uh, creating a scholarship program for students who are homeless. Uh, this would be modeled after an existing program that we already have in place uh, that addresses our foster youth. Um, it uh, would help um, define the eligibility criteria for the uh, Colorado residents who would be eligible for this. And um, the cost of attendance would be outlined and uh, this is simply uh, to uh, institute this uh, new scholarship program and uh, we ask for your I vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1403. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1403 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1408? House Bill 1408 by Representative Sirota and Taggart, Senators Enzinger and Kirkmeyer, concerning expenditures for care assistance programs and in connection therewith making an appropriation. <laughs> Senators Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24 1408. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you. Uh, this is just concerning expenditures for care assistance programs. The bill specifies that the General Assembly's intent that adoption and relative, relative guardianship assistance programs, this is about adoption, folks, um, and these programs are already in place and that they operate as an entitlement program. Um, the bill uh, does not require an appropriation uh, because of existing appropriations to the program were under allocated, so we're just making sure that we can spend the money. Um, and the bill also clarifies that a funding model developed under Senate Bill 21277, which is within the Child Welfare Services Allocation Formula, be used to inform rather than determine the distribution of child welfare capped county allocations beginning in 24-25. I ask for an I vote on 24-1408. Senator Zinzinger. As an entitlement program, uh, the department would be required to reimburse counties for 90% of the RGAP expenditures, regardless of the appropriation. And historically, the RGAP has been underexpended, and whether and how the program should operate as an entitlement has not been called into question. However, the program overexpended general fund for the first time in 22-23, which is what brought this issue to the forefront. And so for those reasons, uh, we ask for your right vote. See no further discussion. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1408. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1408 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1410? House Bill 1410 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Zunziger concerning administration, administrative changes to the Just Transition Office in the Department of Labor and Employment. Senator Zunziger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1410. To the bill, Senator Zunziger. Uh, members, what this bill does is it makes a number of administrative and technical changes to the Just Transition Office and the Just Transition Cash Fund in the Department of Labor and Employment. Uh, when we had our discussion with staff, uh, what we realized is that the um, different uh, funding allocations and models over the years have had different uh, ending dates. They've had, uh, none of it was in alignment with one another. Um, we continued the work from year to year and because of this, um, things were some 
somewhat disjointed. So um, this bill makes a number of just clarifying technical changes, including one, relocating the office from the Division of Employment and Training into the Executive Director's Office. Two, it's clarifying what those allowable uses of the money is in the Just Transition Cash Fund. Number three, it allows funds in the Just Transition Cash Fund to be spent through the end of the state's fiscal year of 2930. Uh, and uh, lastly, it requires that any unexpended or unencumbered money in the Just Transition Cash Fund at the end of that state fiscal year of 2930 be transferred back to the general fund. There is no fiscal impact to this bill, uh, but it, it is necessary in order to make sure that we are all in alignment. Thank you very much. Senator Zinsinger, Zinsinger I failed to ask you to move the Appropriations Committee report. And I move the Appropriation Committee report. And is there any discussion further on the Appropriation Committee report? Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. We um, do have an amendment to offer to the Appropriations Committee report, so wanted to get that on the desk. There is. Adopt it, yeah. Sorry, I'll wait. Right. Seeing no further discussion, is the, the motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and the appropriation committee report is adopted. There's a member of the desk with the clerk. Please read L006. L006 by Senator Hansen. Senator Hansen. Thank committee. you very much. I move L006 to House Bill 1410. To L006, Senator Hansen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, just a slight adjustment from what we did in appropriations committee. Uh, the version of the bill that we looked at yesterday did not have uh, a deadline of when the funds needed to be encumbered or spent. Uh, we moved that in Appropriations Committee to 2029-2030. I then had a chance to talk a little bit longer with uh, the Office of Just Transition as well as several of the labor groups that were affected uh, by this bill and uh, took a hard look at that deadline and this amendment just adjusts it to fiscal year 31-32 uh, to give a little bit more time for those funds to be spent because uh, this current schedule of plant closures would then be covered uh, after we adopt L06. So I ask for your yes vote. Any further discussion on L006? S Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the good Senator from Denver's uh, suggestion and um, we have no opinion on the amendment. So vote your conscience. The motion is the adoption of L006. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it, L006 is adopted. The bill's been properly moved. Any further discussion on 1410? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1410. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it, House Bill 1410 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1415? House Bill 1415 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Bridges and Zunziger concerning the State Employee Reserve Fund and in connection therewith transferring $31,160,000 from the State Employee Reserve Fund to the General Fund. Senator Zinzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1415. To the bill. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, this uh, bill uh, concerns the State Employee Reserve Fund, which was created as a way to capture general fund reversions from personal services and operating line items in all departments in order to use those reversions to offset the annual cost of merit pay and the merit pay compensation plan. Um, because we no longer do uh, merit pay, uh, those funds have not been spent uh, for the past couple of years. And uh, nevertheless, the departments continue to revert uh, their general fund from their personal services and their operating line items to this fund. So what this bill does is it transfers nearly the full fund balance of $31.160 million to the general fund for this year. And uh, members, um, this was uh, a necessary uh, endeavor in order to come to balance in this year's budget, and I ask for your aye vote. See you for a discussion. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1415. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1415 is adopted. We're we'll closing the title of House Bill 1416. House Bill 1416 by Representatives Sirota and Taggart, Senators Bridges and Zendiger, concerning the creation of the Healthy Food Incentives Program and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 1416. To the bill, Senator Zenzinger. 
So members, this came uh, from a suggestion of one of our staff. Uh, what it does is it concerns um, what is known as the Healthy Food Incentives Program, which exists currently in the Department of Public Health and Environment, but does not yet actually uh, exist in our statutes. So for the uh, past couple of years, it has existed in a footnote in our budget. And in previous years, the long bill has indicated that it is the General Assembly's intent for this program to be funded via another program line item. And so what this bill uh, does is it creates the Healthy Food Incentives Program in statute and appropriates the related funding uh, directly to the program. It does require the department to partner with statewide nonprofit organizations in order to provide healthy food incentives uh, that benefit Colorado's low-income populations. And the bill also states that the healthy food incentives must attempt to improve access to fresh Colorado-grown fruits and vegetables within Colorado's low-income communities. Uh, the bill limits the department's and the nonprofit's organization's administrative expenses, and it is necessary to get this out of a footnote and into statute. Thank you. Senator, for discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1416. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1416 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1417? House Bill 1417 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning license fees payable to health care cash funds. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24, 14, 17. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this bill changes the current process by which the Department of Public Health and Environment initiates and the State Board of Health approves fee increases for the general licensure cash fund, the assisted living residence cash fund, and the home care agency cash fund. The bill establishes fees for these funds that will be increased, and the fee increases are based on the need to ensure these cash funds remain solvent and allow the department to maintain staffing at levels that meet minimum secure, minimum survey and complaint investigation requirements for health care facilities. I ask for an aye vote. Seeing a further discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1417. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1417 is adopted. The clerk, please read the title to House Bill 1418. House Bill 1418 by Representatives Sirota and Tigard, Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer, concerning the transfer of money from the Hazardous Substance Site Response Fund to the Hazardous Substance Response Fund. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24-14-18. To the bill. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill makes two transfers from the Hazardous Substance Site Response Fund to the Hazardous Substance Response Fund in fiscal year 23-24 and fiscal year 24-25. Uh, these transfers will help to make sure that the um, funds are, remain solvent and that there is sufficient funding for ongoing hazardous site remediation and maintenance required under the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, the, i.e. the Superfund sites. I ask for an aye vote. Senator, for discussion, motion is the adoption of House Bill 1418. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1418 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1419? House Bill 1419 by Representatives Byrd and Tigert, Senators Bridges and Zunziger, concerning transfer of $10 million from the Energy and Carbon Management Cash Fund to the Stationary Resources Control Fund. Senator Zinziger. I move House Bill 1419. To the bill. Senator Zinziger. Uh, members, this is a simple transfer of $10 million from the Energy and Carbon Management Cash Fund to the Stationary Sources Control Fund. Um, this transfer will take place on June 30th of 2024 in order to ensure uh, funding for the Department of Public Health and Environment's air quality obligations. The bill has no fiscal impact. And for those reasons, I ask for an aye vote. Senator, for discussion, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1419. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Oppose no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1419 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1420? House Bill 1420 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart, Senator Zenziger and Kirkmeyer, concerning the transfer of money from the General Fund to the Colorado Crime Victim Services Fund. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24-1420. To the bill. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill is pretty simple, and we talked about it earlier today. The bill requires the state treasurer to transfer $4 million from the General Fund to the Colorado Crime Victim Services Fund on July 1st, 2024. Ask for an aye vote. Senator, for discussion, motion is the adoption of House Bill 1420. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1420 is adopted. Will the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1421? House Bill 1421 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart, Senators Bridges and Zunziger, concerning modifying funding for grant programs administered administered by the Division of Criminal Justice in the Department of Public Safety and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Zinziger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24-1421. To the bill, Senator Zinziger. 
Uh, what this bill does is it transfers $3 million from the general fund to the Multidisciplinary Crime Prevention and Crisis Intervention, also known as the MCPCI Grant Fund in the Division of Criminal Justice in the Department of Public Safety. Uh, the bill extends the repeal date for that grant program uh, from January 1 of 2025 in order to July 1 of 2027. The bill makes the following cash funds subject to annual appropriation by the General Assembly. That's really important and good news for you for the General Assembly, and it makes an annual appropriation to the MCPCI Grant Fund, the Law Enforcement Workforce Recruitment Retention and Tuition Grant Fund, as well as the state's mission for assistance in recruiting and tra training uh, grant fund, also known as the SMART Grant Fund. Uh, the bill transfers $3 million, and then in addition to that, the bill also appropriates a total of $14.4 million uh, cash funds to the department um, in a variety of ways, and we ask for your I vote. Center for discussion and motions the adoption of House Bill 1421. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1421 is adopted. Would the clerk please your title of House Bill 1425? House Bill 1425, Representatives Byrd and Sorona and Senators Bridges and Kirkmeyer concerning transfers of money for capital construction. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24 1425. And the appropriation committee report. Thank you. And the appropriations report. Thank to, you. The re to the committee report, Senator Kirkmeyer. Can I just read this? We just read Okay, we, we just we reversed the House amendments. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. We reversed the House amendments and we stripped um, stripped it in appropriations, and that's the appropriations committee report. Motions the adoption of the appropriations committee report. Thank All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. The committee report is adopted. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the transfers of money to the Capital Construction Fund. This bill makes the following transfers approximately on July 1st, or makes them on July 1st, 2024. It's approximately 161 million from the General Fund to the Capital Construction Fund. Approximately $85 million from the Controlled Maintenance Trust Fund to the Capital Construction Fund. Approximately $71 million from the General Fund to the IT Capital Account for Information Technology Capital Projects. Uh, $1 million from the Marijuana Tax Cash Fund to IT Capital Account and $500,000 from the general fund exempt account to the general fund for capital construction funds. Um, ask for an I vote, and I do know we have an amendment. amendment. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk, who did? Mm-hmm. Will the clerk please read L014. L14 by Senator, Senator Roberts. Roberts. Henry Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L014. To the amendment, Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you. This amendment uh, is just some uh, legal clarity around uh, any capital transfers that may happen. As the good senators from the JBC noted, they did strip off amendments that the House made. There is an amendment that the House made that they'll obviously talk about in conference committee that gives uh, the Attorney General some concern about putting the state treasurer in a position of violating state or federal law if he made one of these transfers. And so this amendment just makes sure that the AG can provide legal advice before any of those transfers are made. And it will go through the Joint Budget Committee for them to notify the treasurer after that. So with that, I'd ask for an I vote. Any further discussion on those are one for Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the good senator from Frisco bringing that amendment to our attention prior to us getting to this point on this bill. Um, and we consider this a friendly amendment and I encourage an I vote. Senator, for discussion, motions the adoption of L014. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L014 is adopted to the bill. There is. Is this 1425 as well? Oh, sorry. Yeah. An amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L012? L012 by Senator Peltonar, amending and gross bill, page two after line 10, insert section Senator two. Peltonar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what this uh, amendment does is uh, it's for the best grant. Uh, I had an amendment on the, uh, the long bill that will be coming up in a cow, and I need both these uh, amendments to, to pass to. Uh, fund the best grant, so I'd ask for a yes vote. Senator Peltonar, please move L012. Thank you, Mr. Chair, I move L012. Any further discussion on L012? Senator Zinzinger. Um, it's a little unusual to run an amendment um, based on a future bill that has not yet passed. <laughs> so for those reasons, we'd have to ask for a no vote. 
Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of L012. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The no. have it, L012 is lost. Any further discussion on 1425? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1425. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, House Bill 1425 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1426? House Bill 1426 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota and Senators Bridges and Zunzinger concerning transferring the balance of the Controlled Maintenance Trust Fund to the General Fund. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24-1426. Uh, to the bill, Senator Zinzinger. Uh, very simply stated, the bill requires that the state tre treasurer shall transfer all unexpended and unencumbered money in the Controlled Maintenance Trust Fund on July 31st, 2024. Uh, that amount is anticipated to be approximately $32 million, and um, these are funds that we will put to good use in your budget. See you in a further discussion. The motion is the adoption of House Bill 1426. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. You guys have it. House Bill 1426 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1390? House Bill 1390 by Representatives Byrd and Sirota, Senators Kirkmeyer and Bridges. Concerning measures to support certain school food programs in the Department of Education in connection therewith making and reducing an appropriation. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24-1390. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this is the bill that um, where we basically go in and figure out how to fix the healthy school meals, at least for this year, this current fiscal year, and next year. When um, we realized that we were about $25 million short in 23-24 of the Healthy School Meals Program, uh, we did have discussions with the Department of Education to let them know that, quite frankly, that's not acceptable. This is $24 million short of what Proposition FF brought in. It not only impacted uh, fiscal year 23-24, it impacts 24-25. Um, trying to honor the will of the voters, but also having an understanding of what's going on in our budget. We did agree at the Joint Budget Committee, and we put this bill together to say that for the shortfall in 23-24 and the shortfall in 24-25, that we will take out of the state education fund. We did instruct that the Department of Education needs to get a technical advisory group put together as soon as practical so that they can come up for a plan to make sure that they stay within the funds that are um, brought in through Proposition FF to fund the healthy school meals. Um, we did not take this out of the general fund because we did not have monies in the general fund to do this. So we did take it out of, again, the state education fund. We tried to leave the program intact as much as we possibly could and gave them a transition year to get this figured out. Ask for an I vote. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. There is, there is an amendment to the desk. I gave you one earlier. Will the clerk please read L005? L005 by Senator, Senator Marchman. Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say thank you. The, um, I've been listening to a lot of JBC meetings, and the day that um, we collectively found out that there was not enough money to feed all the kids in Colorado was uh, devastating. And so I just really want to applaud the efforts that you guys made, as well as staff, to figure out how to fund this. On that note, I reached out to the Blueprint to End Hunger and the Colorado Department of Agriculture just to see if they might be a good partner to add to the technical advisory group. Um, Department of Ag says that they can probably just absorb that cost, um, but I don't think it carries a fiscal, so I, um, I would just ask for your, I vote on L005. Senator Marchman, thank you. Please move I L005. I always do this. Um, I move L005. That's a proper motion. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We consider this a friendly amendment. Thanks for the additional advice, and uh, we would encourage an I vote on L005. Senator, for discussion, the motion is the adoption of L005. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L005 is adopted. Any further discussion on 1390? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1390. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1390 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1392? House Bill 1392 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Kirkmeyer and Bridges concerning revising the fourth year innovation pilot program and in connection therewith limiting local education provider and school participation and adding program evaluation requirements. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24 1392. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This bill, um, it does limit the four year innovation pilot program, the path forward 
participation to schools or groups of schools participating in the 23-24 school year. The bill does not cap the number of students who may receive post-secondary education scholarships through the pilot program or the related incentives for schools that are currently participating in the program. Um, in addition to annual reporting requirements, the bill adds a final evaluation component of the pilot program's data from each student cohort and analyzing the pilot program's outcomes and cost effectiveness. Ask for an I vote. Sooner for discussion and motion. Oh, there is more discussion. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L001. I should probably give it to you. Yes. Yeah. All right, before we move, but you got the motion. I appreciate that. There is an amendment. This is the one I, I was just doing it by school. All up at that desk. Would the clerk please read L001? L001 by Senator Marchman, amending gross bill, page 4, line 6, after level, insert local education provider type. Now, Senator Marshman, please move um, the amendment. So, thank you so much. Um, I move L001. That's a proper motion to the amendment. Senator Marshman. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I rise in strong support of 1392. This is a wonderful program. Um, and I just wanted to mention in 2026, there's going to be a CDE report that comes out. There is one data type that CDE always, already collects that I would like to add to that. And that's what Amendment L001 would do. It would, prov it would say what kind of a, a local education provider type. Is it a charter school? Is it a traditional school? Is it a facility school? So with that, I would ask for your I vote on L001 and an I vote on 1392. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We consider this a friendly amendment or encourage an I vote on L001. Any further discussion on L001? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of L001. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. You guys have it, L001 is adopted. Any further discussion on 1392? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1392. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1392 is adopted. Would the clerk would you the title of the House Bill 1394? House Bill 1394 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senator Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer concerning funding for charter school institute mill levy equalization and connection therewith, increasing and decreasing appropriations. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24 1394. To the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This um, is a bill that simply is following state law from what we passed last year when we were in the Education Committee and here on the floor in the Senate. So um, I'm asking for an I vote. The long bill includes a total of 49.2 million general fund um, and 49.2 49 million reappropriate funds and $0.7 million cash funds from interest earnings for the CSI mill levy equalization. Again, this is in current law. We are simply budgeting to court, towards current law and um, putting the funds towards the CSI mill levy equalization. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as was stated by my good colleague, um, this is a required transfer. However, uh, rather than um, doing it from the general fund, we chose to do it out at the state ed fund, which is why we have a bill before us today in order to make that transfer. The reason why we chose to do that out of the state ed fund is it freed up $22 million of general funds so that we can meet our balancing obligations. Um, regardless, if um, uh, we did not uh, do this in this bill, it is still in the budget, and there Therefore, um, we ask for an aye vote on this uh, bill. Senator, for, we, there is more discussion. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L003. L003 by Senator Marchman, amendment and gross bill, page three, strike line. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move L003. To the amendment, Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, what this bill, what this um, amendment will do is specify that um, we will only make these tra transfers if available appropriations exist annual appropriations, so not in perpetuity, and it caps the, um, it caps the amount at 29200000 from the general fund. Um, and so I just want to just bear with me for a second, because I've done a lot of looking at, around at this. Um, we have 51 states, count, DC counts, and of those, only um, 10, actually have an independent chartering board like we do. 
And of those 10, um, all of, the, of those, only two, two of them share no local tax revenue. But of the eight that do share local tax revenue, only three states in the nation provide local revenue for state authorized charter schools. Um, Nevada, Tennessee, and Colorado. But let me explain how they're different. In Nevada, the counties pay the state for their state authorized charter schools. And in Tennessee, the districts pay the state for their state authorized charter schools. So I did a little bit of looking to see kind of how this would impact. I mean, we are the only nation in the, I'm sorry, we only state in the nation that funds our charter schools this way. We've in fact, the CSI has become kind of a little national laboratory of charter schools. Um, so I took a look to see what the districts would owe if we just did it the way Nevada and Tennessee do it. And Colorado Springs would owe 11.2 for the students who attend CSI. Adams 12 would be 9.9. .9. Poudre would be $7.6 million. Dugco would owe 5.5. .5. Aurora 3.5. Westminster 2.8. Jeffco 1.8. Durango 1.4. Mesa Valley 1.1. And Brighton 1 million. There are five other school districts below there that would also have to pay for um, that much money. So this is unheard of what we're doing. Of 178 districts, all but six retra uh, retain exclusive chartering authority. So there are 43 CSI schools and they're in 16 districts. Um, we never funded um, the CSI local share until 2018. Interesting, that was a neat year. So the state has spent some money to give local revenues to CSI schools, but it's always been capped at a specific dollar amount until last year's school finance account, or school finance act. That came out and we had less than 12 hours to really review it, and in it, it said, we're gonna give $10 million to CSI, and we're gonna fully fund it. And in doing that, we leapt to number two in the country for charter schools, number two in the country. And friends, we're still at the bottom of the list for traditional schools. So I'm gonna share what was shared in JBC staff, the staff, the nonpartisan JBC staff shared. JBC staff has expressed concern over the years about the disadvantage to the state of the current mill levy override equalization structure. Charter schools that are authorized by their districts have the cost of mill levy overrides covered by local taxing revenue, but CSI school override costs are being covered by the state. JBC staff shares it is in the state's best interest to encourage charter schools to be locally authorized instead of using CSI. By fully funding mill levy equalization, the state is building incentives for schools to seek CSI authorization and districts to support this since state funds rather than local district funds cover mill levy override costs. The JBC staff requested that LCF LCS calculate the exposure. We have in law, we have to fully fund these schools. What does that mean if every district who's got a CSI school passes a mill levy? If the, all of those voters in all of those districts increase their mill levy overrides to the maximum amount allowed, that would be $68.8 million. That's 19.6 more than what's been asked here and it's 39.6 more than what I'm asking for in my amendment. So even if the CSI schools and pupil counts remain stable, over time, the cost of equalizing funding for CSI students will increase based on factors such as total funding and property values. 
If the JBC or General Assembly determines that it does not have sufficient funds to cover CSI, a statutory change would be needed so that state funding could be capped at a specific dollar amount. And friends, that's exactly what this amendment would do. It says that, yeah, this is nice. It's great that we've got 2% of the students in Colorado in CSI schools and 98% are not. But we don't have 20 million for best grants and yet we've got 49.2 million for CSI schools. And that math just doesn't work out outside of we're setting up this national laboratory of charter schools. So I would ask for your I vote on L003. Any further discussion on Senator, Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No on Amendment 1 to 1394. Earlier today, when we ran the School Finance Act through here, Senate 188, we celebrated the elimination of the budget stabilization factor. And along with that, part and parcel of how that happened, we said we recognize the fundamental immorality of treating some students in Colorado who choose to go to a school perhaps different than their sibling goes to that is authorized by CSI. It's fundamentally immoral, we said, to fund those students at a lower level. Last year, we said all students, whether authorized by a district authorized charter in a neighborhood school, clearly authorized and controlled by the district, or a CSI school, that 179th school district, they will be funded, those students, at the same level. Amendment 3, I guess it is, I said no to 1, but I am actually saying no to 1, and I rise in opposition to 1 to 1394. Amendment 3 says, you know what, that immorality, that funding different students because they look different? Well, they're authorized or go to a school that looks different and is authorized different. We recognize the fundamental immorality in that. This says, no, you know what? For this group of students, the 20,000 students in 43 schools across Colorado, that are authorized by the Charter School Institute, CSI, the 179th school district in Colorado. Well, we'll fight for the BS factor. We'll fight to make sure that all the other students are fully funded, but these students, they are now once again different. You are hearing me in my righteous indignation that this is a moral issue that we're talking about. I would argue all the students of Colorado who are in public schools should be funded at the same level. And this amendment says, yeah, maybe. I cannot stand for that, and I would urge that you would join me in opposition to Amendment 3. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So L003, um, it does in fact say that we're going to pay for some amount but not a full amount. And I believe that the 98% of students in Colorado who are not in CSI schools are actually suffering because we have chosen to fund in a way that no other state in the nation does. And so for that, I ask for an I vote on L003. Mr. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 98%, 2%, all Colorado public school students. They all deserve the same funding. And to wink at that, I cannot come up with another word but immorality. I urge your opposition to 03. Any further discussion on L003? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of L003. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. 
the noes have it, L003 is lost. Would the clerk please read? Is there any further discussion on 1394? Senator Colker, there is. And a member of the desk. Will clerk please read L004? L004 by Senator Coker. Senator Coker. Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move uh, L004. To the amendment, Senator Coker. Thank you. This amendment does basically the same thing as L003, is that it takes out the reduction. So the fiscal 49 million will stay there, the funding will stay there. But it will keep the annual. It shall still annually review. Because I don't know of any part of our budget where we don't annually review, where we don't look at it and say, OK, do we, how much does it need? Because the, what the bill currently does is it states that we're going to fund it like this. And this is where we're going to go. We're not going to review that amount. We're going to keep going that way. Um, it says, insert subject to available appropriations. Uh, and so in that aspect, we're also striking full funding because we still don't know what full funding means. And what, by that I mean, if you compare, and it takes some digging, if you compare the LCS uh, document that shows the proposed 24-25 fiscal year per pupil rate for every school district that's uh, non-charter by county, and you can compare those per pupil ratings. And I was only able to get through that with um, information from CDE's report, which is on their website, and from the JBC uh, when it comes to the charters, because the charters, you know, we're looking at their per pupil funding. When you add them up, Colleagues, when you look at comparing the schools in the county versus the CSI schools, for example, in Aurora, the Colorado Early College of CSI School will get, I had to turn the page here, so excuse me. Uh, one more page, there we go. $13,200 per pupil, where Aurora, in the School Finance Act, will get 12,354. So it's good to hear the, the Senator from Monument and his indignation on not funding other schools equally. Because by doing this mill levy equalization with this 49 million, we won't be funding them equally. We'll actually be funding the charter schools more than the schools in that county. Adams County schools. If you go to Adams County, Adams five star, Adams 12 five star. Next year's PPR is $11,260. This bill with 49 million will fund them at 13,600 per pupil. $2,400 more than what the county gets because of this mill levy equalization. So if we're going to fund people equally, let's actually take a look at the numbers. Let's do the math and make sure they're equal. And that's what this amendment is going to do is annually review that. And I urge an I vote. Any discussion on L004, Mr. Minority Leader? Senator Zinzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, we would ask for a no vote. Uh, we would just like to remind people that this is um, a bill that is already in law, and we are following the law, and the law is already budgeted for. The reason why we have this bill is because we chose to follow the law by taking the money out of the state ed fund instead of the general fund. It was already going to come out of the general fund and it is already budgeted to come out of the general fund. But we came up short at the end. We needed to find revenue 
we needed to find money in order to balance so that we could do a couple of things, increase the le legislative set aside, uh, meet our obligations to our institutions of higher education, pay off the budget stabilization factor, <laughs> a whole number of things that we needed to do. And so we decided to just do a transfer out of the state ed fund so that there would be a less impact to the general fund. But this money is programmed. It's already in the budget. If we pass this amendment, then we will have to take it out of the general fund. So um, I would ask for a no vote on this amendment, and thank you for your time. Senator Coker. Thank you. Uh, I am still asking for an I vote because that argument doesn't apply to this amendment. We're still asking for 49 million. We're still doing the transfer. Everything's still the same. We're saying for the future to annually appropriate and to review that and not to say it's fully funded because in some cases it's actually overfunding what the school districts are funding by taking the mill levies from the school district, districts and giving more money to the charters who were not authorized by the school districts. These are CSI charters, state authorized charters. So now they're taking more money from the districts when they do a mill levy. And they get it automatically. What this is saying is that's not going to happen. We can change current law. We can do that with this. I urge and I vote on this amendment. Senator Zinziger. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, I was in uh, the legislature when um, uh, then Representative Brittany Pedersen, uh, now a current uh, Congresswoman Pedersen, passed this bill. And uh, we have had an outstanding obligation in order to meet uh, the requirements of that bill. We had been spending it down over time, year by year by year, in order to fulfill the terms of that uh, law, very similar to how we've been spending down the budget stabilization factor, trying to get to full funding. The issue that I have with the amendment is that we, in fact, never know when we have full funding for total program. For the total program, we have to calculate that every year because we never know what it is. We also have to calculate every year how much we're gonna do for our Millevy Override Matching Program because we don't know what it is. We have to recalculate that every year. And therefore, of course, you're going to have to recalculate and figure out how much you need in order to meet our obligations that are currently in the law for CSI Millevy as well. It is not a fixed number because none of these are fixed numbers. They always move every year. And every year, we have to determine what we're going to appropriate in order to meet full funding. That is the same for special education funding. That is the same for a whole host of programming that we do in the state because it's based on conditional factors. And those factors change every year. And so you have to recalculate it according to those factors. However, the intent would be to reach full funding every year, and you would recalculate it in order to meet that obligation. So I would ask for a no vote on the amendment. Senator Marchman. Thank you. I just, I rise in support of this amendment as well. Um, I, you know, I, I struggle with the fact that in, the way that we are funding our schools now, which is at the bottom of the list, we're going to make these arguments that it makes sense to wait every year and just kind of see, well, what new CSI schools are there? Or what uh, community uh, created their mill levy? What I like about this amendment is that it doesn't mean that there is no cap which is what I favor, but it does mean that we will look at it every single year. Um, it says, like, the JVC staff, as a part of why they say don't do this, is because equalization is actually a moving target. 
and it's dependent on local voter decisions, the number of CSI schools, and the number of students attending CSI schools. And again, when we continue to incentivize our school districts to not authorize their own charter schools, because the state's just gonna pay for your charter schools if you go through CSI, I don't think we are in a position anymore to afford that. That's a luxury that Colorado students can no longer afford. So I um, urge an I vote on this amendment. Any further discussion on L004, Mr. Minority Leader. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I rise in opposition to L004. I won't wave my arms quite so much, and I will not raise my vo voice to the lane of the level of righteous indignation I brought on the prior amendment, but I equally strongly oppose this amendment. And it's for the same reasons. My arguments will be the same reasons. You, you got a, a, a list of uh, data that was read out, and I'm a spreadsheet kind of guy. I love spreadsheets. I love the data. Thank you for that. But that was all about districts. The question is about people, human beings, little human beings that we call students. And to raise data that's about districts and make an argument that has nothing to do with what this amendment's about. This amendment's about saying, you know what, those little human beings we call students, the ones at that school, they get different treatment. They get less money, or they have to stand in line for a longer period of time to find out whether or not they're going to get the same funding that their peers get. Again, my argument is, and we, we eradicated it. We took it out last year. It's in the law today that we're funding with this bill. We eradicated this immorality that we were going to treat students differently. They're all public school students. They all deserve the same funding. And there is no CSI school that gets any more money. They don't take money from the districts. They are finally just getting up to par with what? Their peers. In many cases, they could be their own siblings. This is what just amazes me about this. One child goes to a neighborhood school and his, his sister or brother who lives down the hall goes to a CSI school student, and the CSI school student isn't funded at the same level as their sibling? It couldn't be more irrational. This amendment would sustain that disconnect. I urge your opposition to L004. Senator Coker. Once again, colleagues, I just want to reemphasize, we're still funding this but we're going to annually review it because if you look at the total funding, you're getting more funding in the CSI schools than in the neighborhood school. That is traditional. If you look at Adams, if you look at Aurora, those CSI schools per pupil, and if we're trying to be equal, that's what we're doing. In this case, the state is backfilling a mill levy. No, it doesn't come from the locals, but it's the state. We don't backfill other mill levies, but we do this one. So I encourage an I vote. Mr. Minority Leader. Um, I, I rise in final statement of opposition to L004 and urge your opposition to it, but I want to find a, a moment of unity with my colleagues who brought the amendments and say, you know what, my goal, my argument has been all along, let's deal with the School Finance Act a long time before we deal with all the other state budget items. And then these questions that we're quibbling over here wouldn't even be questions. So I close in unity saying, you know, let's run the School Finance Act a month before we run the budget. And then we would have done the most important thing in our policy that we could do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Should I get a picture of that? That was a good handshake. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion, the motion is the adoption of L004. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Aye. The no's have it, L004 is lost. Any further discussion on 1394? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 1394. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, 1394 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of House Bill 1395? House Bill 1395 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senator Zenziger and Kirkmeyer. Concerning delaying a transfer from the marijuana tax cash fund to the public school capital construction assistance fund and in connection therewith reducing an appropriation. Senator Kirkmeyer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24-1395. To the bill. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, this is the bill that um, we had to put through. We, none of us really liked it, but what it does is it delays um, from July 1, 2024 to July 1, 2026, the $20 million transfer from the marijuana tax cash fund to the Public School Capital Construction Assistance Fund. This is that best program that we've all been talking about all day. We appreciate everybody wanting to fund uh, public school facilities. We think it's important too, but the reality is, is that the marijuana tax cash fund is desperately low and um, will not be solvent if we keep taking all this money out of it. So we have to be able to fund the Marijuana Enforcement Division that should be funded out of the marijuana cash tax, marijuana tax cash fund, um, and that's why we delayed this until July 1 of 2026. Any further discussion on 1395? Seeing that a motion is adopted in the House of 1395, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Polls no. The ayes have it. House of 1395 is adopted. We we'll close you the title of House Bill 1413. House Bill 1413, Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senators Kirkmeyer and Bridges, concerning transfers from funds that include severance tax revenue in connection therewith making an appropriation. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 241413. Um, to the bill, Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, this is the bill that um, takes and sweeps dollars to help us balance this budget and fund those capital development projects that we've talked about earlier today out of the severance tax operational fund um, that um, it takes money out of there um, that would have gone into the severance tax perpetual base fund. We've done this before. We also took um, 25 million out of the local government severance tax fund, um, again, to be used for projects. There was this whole scheme going on. This was just the easiest way to do it. Another thing that this bill does, however, is it increases the annual appropriation from the severance tax operational fund to the conservation district grant fund from 450,000 to 700,000, starting in fiscal year 24-25. I urge an I vote. There is an amendment at the desk. Will the clerk please read L002? L002 by Senator, Senator Liston. Liston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move uh, Amendment L002. To the amendment. Uh, yes. Uh, members, uh, uh, what we're doing is we're adding $300,000 to the se uh, severance tax perpex perpetual base fund. Uh, this is what we're using to pay for the study. Uh, I urge an I vote, and as a little, uh, this represents less than 90 days worth of interest um, of the $26 million, so it can easily be uh, paid for. I urge an I vote. Thank you. Any discussion on L002? Senator Marchman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, too, urge an I vote on L002, the long bill amendment number 17 that the good senator from Listonville and I ran, um, El Paso County, um, took, made, made <laughs> set aside money or talked about a study, a $300,000 study, and that's where this is going to come from. So I would urge an I vote on L002. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We consider L002 a friendly amendment. Urgent I vote. Seeing the further discussion, the motion is the adoption of L002. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. L002 is adopted. <laughs> Would the clerk please read? Is there any further discussion on 1413? Oh. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I, I don't have an amendment. I was making a comment. Um, so I, I want to thank the, the you know the members of the Joint Budget Committee who worked very hard to to balance our budget and of course constitutional requirement to balance our budget. Uh, 1413 represents I think a a break from tradition. The the good senators mentioned that this has happened before, but I just wanted to come up and and you know uh, make a point that severance tax funds, as the good senator from Weld County knows, uh, come from energy production. Uh, this happens a lot in the district that I represent, um, as well as other districts. But what that fund, that money usually goes to fund is our water projects in Colorado, or uh, the Energy Impact Assistance Program, which goes to rural communities for economic development and other local needs that are transitioning and, and local communities in rural Colorado need. Uh, I am concerned that this would become a practice in the future. I understand the need for the bill this year, and I am not... Um, uh, faulting the, the sponsors for bringing it. Uh, but if we are going to continue to fund our water projects and our water plan at the level it needs to be funded uh, to secure our future in our state, I think water is the most important issue facing our state for the next several decades. Um, as many of you know and agree, 
we need to make sure that this does not become practice, to use severance tax dollars to balance the budget. Uh, and I thank the, the work of the JBC, um, but just want to lay that down and put that in front of the body is hopefully this is not the norm uh, and is a one-year exception here. So thank you. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the good senator from Frisco. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. Um, that is why, when looking at this, and I know it says that $26 million comes from the severance tax perpetual base fund. That is actually that spillover amount that happened in... Um, that, ha that is happening in this current fiscal year that we would be capturing. So it does not impact any of the water projects that were on the list or even in, on the list in 23-24 or for the list for 24-25. We were very careful to make sure that we did not impact dollars actually that went straight to the perpetual basic um, fund for water projects. That's extremely important. The other thing to... Um, Members, that I just want to make sure that you're aware of is when we were looking at this, this 69 million, and it is an important factor because, uh, you know, these are severance tax dollars that come from oil and gas development in the state of Colorado and comes to the state of Colorado. Um, we have, um, we did look at these. These are essentially being transferred to use to fund projects that are in the capital development list. Um, that would include, include control maintenance one and then also the other um, projects that were funded within that capital control capital development list. And I will tell you that I looked through this with our JBC staff person to make sure that there are essentially $69 million worth of projects to be funded, um, essentially using these dollars for those projects that are in energy and mineral impact communities across the state. So like in Trinidad, which is in Los Animas, where they have um, both uh, energy development now and historical energy development. Um, you could even probably count Adams State in that if you really wanted to. It might be a little bit of a stretch, but because of the historical energy development that occurred in Huerfano County. Um, there are projects in Weld County, um, Garfield County, La Plata County, Mesa County, all of which are truly very impacted counties of the state. And I will also remind you that because the city and county of Denver annexed out pretty close into Weld County out by the airport, uh, they actually are, were at one point the top 10 producing oil and gas counties in the state. So it also covers projects that are within Denver County. So I appreciate what you're saying. I have guarded this fund for like the last 30 years of my life as a Weld County Commissioner um, because of, and I sat on the Energy and Merle Impact Grant Fund um, Committee, um, but we made sure, I made sure in going through it that these funds are being used, you know, basically, I mean, I can make the connection to say that these funds are being used in energy and mineral impacted counties in the state, areas of the state, and again, appreciate your comments. It is something that we have to be very careful about and watch, and it is a conversation that we also had at the Joint Budget Committee. So thank you. And again, I would um, urge an I vote on House Bill 24-14-13. Seeing no further discussion on House Bill 14-13, the motion is the adoption of House Bill 14-13. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and House Bill 14-13 is adopted. Would the clerk please read the title of the House Bill 1422? House Bill 1422 by Representatives Byrd and Taggart and Senator Zenzinger and Kirkmeyer concerning the cost threshold of controlled maintenance projects for capital renewal. Do you want this one? Senator Zinzinger. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I move House Bill 24-1422. And the Appropriations Committee bill, Report. And the... Appropriations. Appropriations. Appropriations Committee Report. To the Committee Report. Senator Zinzinger. Uh, we stripped the House amendments. And that is and, oh, amazing. Oh, and we actually changed the criteria based on a suggestion that we received uh, from stakeholders about improving the uh, index uh, by also uh, choosing a mechanism that would include labor costs as well. Seeing a further discussion, the motion is the adoption of the Appropriations Committee report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. And the Appropriations Committee report is adopted. <laughs> to the bill, Senator Zinzinger. What this bill does is it increases the cost threshold above which a controlled maintenance project of real property is deemed to be, quote unquote, capital renewal from $2 million to $5 million. And it requires that the state architect will adjust that cost cost threshold every three years based on the United States Department of Labor Bureau of Labor Statistics producer price index, which we actually changed um, in our amendment, so I apologize for that. Uh, but um, it's going to be a great new way of making sure that we are able to address our controlled maintenance needs, and I ask for an I vote. 
Any further discussion on 1422? Senator Mullico. There is an amendment to the desk. Would the clerk please read L002? L002 by Senator, Senator Mullico. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll preface this by thanking the JBC for their great work. Uh, I know that this budget was, was extra hard, um, and so really appreciate all the work that, that, that our JBC members put in. Uh, members, I serve on the CDC, uh, and we were able to send a recommendation over to the JBC. Um, and just to kind of paint the picture, you know, this topic came up and the th threshold came up in regards to the dollar amount uh, for controlled maintenance, and currently it's at $2 million, and there was an argument uh, and a desire because that $2 million was too low, but it was also an arbitrary number. Um, in, in, in CDC, we had that discussion, uh, and um, one of the CDC members wanted that to be at $3 million. Um, there was not that desire by the CDC after a vote uh, or after a motion as well because that's an arbitrary number. Uh, 4.1 million uh, was a number that, that, was, that was brought to light based on uh, what uh, this threshold would be if we had accounted for um, inflation over this period of time. And so uh, the CDC sent that recommendation to uh, the JBC for it to be 4.1 million, not the 3 million as suggested by some other member, another member, um, and not the, not the option of 5 million because 5 million we felt was just an arbitrary number. Um, what this amendment does is it takes it back down to 4.1 million. I think that uh, the, the CDC worked diligently uh, to come up with this number, and I think that we have a reason behind that number. And, um, you know, and I think that with the desire not to have arbitrary numbers as a threshold, um, I think it's important that we can back that number up. Um, obviously, it leaves in place uh, the inflationary factor, which I think is important, um, but just instead of 5 million, it puts it at 4.1 million, which was the original uh, recommendation by the CDC. I would ask for a yes vote. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise in support of L002 as well. Serving on the Capital Development Committee, there was a thoughtful approach of how do you set this limit of what's controlled maintenance and where does it move into capital renewal? We had this arbitrary number of two million for many years, and JBC actually went through the process and offered up a couple of options. Do we set another arbitrary number of five million dollars? Or do you go through a process that says, had we taken the two million and adjusted it for the producer price index over that time period, you end up at a cutoff of 4.1 million. Very thoughtful, CDC came together and said, did our job and worked through that to agree this is the right approach to set this at 4.1 million instead of offering just another arbitrary $5 million cutoff. Any further discussion on L002? Seeing none, the motion is the adoption of L002. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have an L002 is adopted. Any further discussion on 1422? Oh. Senator Hendrickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to just rise and, and give my support to 1422. We have had some um, excellent comments throughout the day uh, given on the state of our capital affairs. Uh, and in, in short, the state of our capital uh, portfolio, capital development portfolio, is, is bleak. And it needs, we need significant effort to, uh, to turn around and get towards a long-term sustainable uh, financial management of our capital assets. I want to thank the good senator for Denver, from Denver for his comments earlier, though I don't entirely didn't entirely agree with them uh, on the way prioritization is done. What this bill does is it creates a more accurate reflection of what our uh, of what our repair needs in the state are. And this current outdated uh, function that we have that has not accounted for inflation, uh, dims a light and artificially minimizes those needs and recategorizes some of the critical repair needs of buildings in our state as new construction projects. That's inaccurate. And those projects then have to compete with other projects, and they often get forced down because other truly brand new projects are, for lack of a better term, shiny objects. And so we fail to maintain 
the buildings that we have long invested in our state, that we've promised investment in uh, for our state. And those buildings, often the ones that serve the neediest portions of our populations, are the ones that go into neglect. And so what is accomplished by the policy set forth in 1422 is to more accurately reflect the real costs of what is actually a capital maintenance project rather than a new capital construction project so that those can get the due consideration that, uh, that they deserve. And that will not solve all of our problems, but it will more accurately give a reflection to what our capital portfolio looks like so that those projects that we have long invested in and made promises to the people of Colorado, uh, in many cases for 100 years or more on, get the diligence and priorities before we dig ground on new projects that we also have no idea how we're going to fund the maintenance of 20, 30, 40 years in the future. So thank you for this bill, and I urge an I vote on 1422. Seeing no further discussion of motions, the adoption of House Bill 1422. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1422 is adopted. <laughs> Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, even though we don't have the full complement of senators here in the chamber, this is the moment where I'd like to pause. We're all coming down off this frenetic run that we've been on for hours now as legislators interacting with a document with amendments. Um, the document we're interacting to um, is new to us, but it's been five months plus in the development by the great team at the JBC. And our members, Senator from Arvada, Senator from Weld County, Senator from Denver, who this session dealt with the emotional weight of having a brand new member of his family whose life was lying in the balance in moments and still showed up to do the job. So to the three members of the JBC, I want to say thank you. Thank you so very much for the hard work you do. Thanks for bringing to us a package we can squabble about, work on, try to make better, but it's kind of hard to make it a whole lot better because you guys work so diligently and do so much work. You have great staff that supports you over at the JBC. I want to honor and call them out as well. But I want to speak directly to my colleagues and say thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for the work that you have done in this budget and have done in the years previous as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You got it. Senator Zinsinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I uh, will have um, some remarks tomorrow on third reading, uh, but I did want to take a moment to uh, very quickly, um, if you all wouldn't mind, join me in thanking the JBC staff for all of their work. <laughs> Mr. Harper, please stand. Hey. Thank you. So um, we were under the direction of a new director this year, Director Harper. Um, and uh, I just want to thank um, uh, Director Harper and all of the JBC staff who have been staying up uh, very late into the night for several weeks now, um, even through the night on uh, a couple of occasions um, where we went all night. Um, and the JBC members got in our cars and drove home um, at 2.30 in the morning, and the staff stayed. <laughs> so um, we just want to say thank you for all of your hard work, and um, obviously we will talk a little bit more about our thoughts about the budget, um, but uh, we have no more bills to move at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Majority Leader Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the committee rise and report. The motion for the committee is to rise and report. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. The committee will rise and report.
The Senate will come to order. Senator Coleman. Thank you, Mr. President. The committee has met a number of bills in consideration. Would the clerk please read a report? April 4th, 2024. Mr. President, your committee of the whole begs leave to report as had under consideration the following attached bills being the second reading thereof and makes the following recommendations thereon. Senate Bill 188 as amended, passed on second reading in order to engross and place on the calendar for the reading and third reading and final passage. House Bill 1430 is amended, House Bill 1389, House Bill 1400, House Bill 1401, House Bill 1403, House Bill 1408, House Bill 1410 is amended, House Bill 1415, House Bill 1416, House Bill 1417, House Bill 1418, House Bill 1419, House Bill 1420, House Bill 1421, House Bill 1425 is amended, House Bill 1426, House Bill 1390 is amended, House Bill 1392 is amended, House Bill 1394, House Bill 1395, House Bill 1413 is amended, House Bill 1422 is amended, passed on second reading and ordered revised and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Senator Cole. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the report. The motion is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? All right. There is an amendment on the desk, but only one. There will only be one amendment. We will pick the one randomly. The lucky winner is, will the clerk Please read Amendment 1 to House Bill 1430. By Pelton R. Senator Pelton R. moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to show that the following Will Floor Amendment J179, Amendment 10 to House Bill 1430 did pass. Amendment in Gross Bill, page 10, line 7, in the item and subtotal column, strike 4,749,937 and substitute 4,730,078 and in the general Senator fund Pelton. column. Thank you, Mr. President. I move. Uh, Cow Amendment 001. To the amendment. Thank you. Uh, what this amendment does is it takes uh, $560,000 in 2.8 FTE uh, from the new Office of uh, Animal Welfare within the Department of Agriculture and adds it to uh, the Colorado AgriAbility Project. Ask for a yes vote. Further discussion? Senator Zensinger. Senator Zenzinger. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members, uh, I mean, excuse me, Mr. President. Um, it's not like I've been busy today. Um, so members, uh, we very much appreciated uh, the discussions today. Uh, um, we would like to encourage a no vote for this. Um, we feel that underfunding the animal welfare department is not a good idea, and we particularly don't feel that it would be good to reduce the animal welfare department by 2.8 FTE in order to um, add funding to another program. So uh, I would please ask for a no vote. Is there any further discussion? Will the clerk please mark Senator Bridges as excused? No, I don't. Kind of looks like we have everybody here. We have everybody here. Yeah, you're on stage now. We're good. Okay, great. The motion before the body is the adoption. He's right here. He's just get, helping himself to a cookie. <laughs> Motion before the body is the adoption of Amendment 1 to House Bill 1430. Are there any no votes? Senators Kirkmeyer, Exum, Gonzalez, Hansen, Mollica, Coleman. Exum, I got you. Danielson, Jinal, Kolker, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Zenzinger, Marchman, Sullivan, Hawkes Lewis, Henriksen, Fields, Priola, Buckner, Michelson, Janae, Cutter. Please add the president. With a vote of 12 ayes, 21 noes, you're absent, two excused. 
The amendment is lost. There is another amendment on the desk. Will the clerk please read Amendment 2? Amendment 2, Senator will move to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to show that the following will floor amendment, J-157, Amendment 11 to House Bill 1430 did pass. Amendment in Rose Bill, page 10, line 7, in the item and Senator subtotal will. column strike. For the same. For the ninth grade. Cal Amendment 2, I move Cal Amendment 2. To the amendment. I don't even count it. It's very convincing. Motion for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment. <laughs> Senator will stand in a senatorial five. Yeah. That's for Amendment 11. That's for Amendment 11. That's it's not Cal for Amendment us. 2 for Amendment Oh. Senator Will. Uh, and thank you, Mr. President. So I move Cal Amendment S002. To the amendment. What this amendment was is I, I talked about adding money, uh, $500,000, to the uh, Wolf Depredation Fund. And this is, you know, it's about preventive measures and looking, for, you know, looking forward to a proposal that. Uh, you know, that we've officially reintroduced wolves into this state. And as I said, we've already seen issues with it uh, as of just yesterday even. So, um, and there's in the news today, they're talking about hiring riders, all that to help out of our ag producers and our livestock producers. So what this fund does is just an additional $500,000 to the uh, compensation fund to help out our livestock producers in the uh, state of Colorado. So ask for an eye vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a no vote on uh, this cow amendment. I don't have it in front of me, but I ask for a no vote on it as it relates to um, the former amendment number 11. Uh, we already have a bunch of dedicated funding within the long bill and within the budget for um, the appropriation to the wolf depredation compensation fund. So it's really not necessary at this point and ask for an, a no vote. Motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 2. Are there any no votes? Senator Zenzinger, Kirkmeyer, Exum, Roberts, Col Coleman, Gonzalez, Colker, Danielson, Ginall, Priola, Marchman, Fields, Buckner, Michelson Janae, Cutter, Henriksen, Akez Lewis, Sullivan, please have the president. With a vote of 14 ayes, 19 noes, zero absent to excuse, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 3. Amendment 3, Senator, Senator Pelton, are moved. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cal Amendment 003. To the amendment. Uh, so this amendment is uh, down in Bent County at the county jail. We have a problem uh, with prisoners escaping and coming back, just going in and out as they please. Earlier during the JBC, uh, when they talked about how they, there's a process to go about taking care of this, this kind of project does not fit under CDC. So I would ask for, it's a half a million dollars to go fix this jail to where uh, the prisoners will stay put and it's not a public safety issue. Ask for a yes vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. As for a no vote on this one, um, well, I can appreciate the issues that are occurring at the county jail um, and they're having issues funding it. Um, that really is the responsibility of the county government to take care of their county jail. Uh, we have enough things that we have to fund within our Department of Corrections and take care of all the facilities that we have at the state. This truly is not our bill. This is the county's bill. Um, I would suggest to them that they go after an energy mill impact grant or possibly a CD uh, community development block grant and see if they couldn't get funds there to help them with their county jail. But they would have to provide matching funds. So again, ask for a no vote on Amendment S003. The motion is the adoption of Cal Amendment 3. Are there any no votes? Senators Roberts, Mullica, Exum, Kirkmeyer, Coleman, Gonzalez, Zenzinger, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Danielson, Janal, Marchman, Fields, Henriksen, Sullivan, Hawkins Lewis, Priola, Cutter, Buckner, Michael Sengene. Please add the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 20 noes, 0 absent, 2 excuse, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Cal Amendment 5. Amendment 5, Senator, Senator Pelton, be moved to amend. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cal Amendment 5. To the amendment. Thank you. Again, members, this money takes $2 million from the from the Public Defender's Office and it puts it towards uh, the Prosecution Fellowship Program. These funds will help programs expand and fully fund current enroll enrollments. And I just have to tell you that in rural Colorado, we are, we are hurting to, to, to fill our staff. And the Public Defender's Office is well staffed in rural Colorado, and it's, you know, they have enough money to come down here and hire lobbyists for this building, so I don't know why we're using taxpayer funds for um, that aspect when we need people in the DA's office to protect the people who are victimized of crime. Um, the Public Defender's Office has grown by 4.6%, again, 48 FTEs from 22 to 23. And another 9.8%, uh, 107.5 FTE from 23 to 24. There's a problem with the growth in the department, and, there's, and we don't have any growth in our DAs. They're not able to keep up with what's going on. Earlier, I read from you from our own DA in the 13th Judicial District and how he's had somebody um, willing to, or had somebody waiting forever to be able to fill a position for three years. Still haven't got that person hired. This program will help. This program has helped somebody in this very chamber and work in the DA office. And I ask for a yes vote on cow number five. Senator Kirkmeyer. I wish you all quit moving the microphones. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members asked for a no vote on this cow for its, um, whatever cow number it is, for based on amendment number 22 earlier. Uh, just so we all understand, within this prosecution fellowship program, there's about approximately $356,000 in that program now. I mean, this is quite a huge jump, taking it up to $2 million. I'd also remind you all that basically it is the responsibility of the county or counties within the judicial district to fund the district attorney's office, um, uh, to fund within that, that judicial district, with the exception of $145,000 that we fund towards each district attorney throughout the state of Colorado. Um, I also remind you that um, the state, because of a um, because of a bill that was passed, um, we are now funding an additional judicial district, and we put those funds in this year as well. Also, want you to know that we funded um, within the attorney general's office, the Department of Law, um, some additional funds to assist with rural DAs um, throughout the state and within the rural judicial districts throughout the state. So again, I would ask for a no vote on this cow amendment. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, since I was invoked by the good senator from Sterling, um, I'm currently not a part of this program, to be clear. Uh, but I just wanted to rise uh, to offer my support for the conversation about better funding uh, rural DA's offices and uh, DA's offices in general. The good senator from Weld County is correct that that is the responsibility of the counties. 
but there is a severe inequity right now between the salaries of starting public defenders and even line public defenders through the throughout their career and district attorneys. Public defenders get paid a lot more in most in most cases than than district attorneys, and it is a disincentive uh, for law graduates to choose a certain career path. The Rural Prosecution Fellowship has been a very successful program that this legislature created. I think close to 10 years ago now, where they sponsor three graduates of DU Law School and three graduates of CU Law School to be placed in a rural DA's office for the first year of their career. And it's not even paid for fully by the state. The DA's office pays half the salary, and the state pays half the salary through the program. Um, so I think it's a worthwhile program. We should consider expanding it. I hope the Joint Budget Committee can use this as a means to consider other ways to help support uh, this uh, inequity in funding that we see between dis uh, district attorney's offices and, and the state public defender. Uh, given the different funding streams, it is a it's not apples to apples, of course. But there is a problem. There is a recruitment problem in rural Colorado for this profession, but there is certainly a need, and uh, we need to find uh, better ways to support it. Senator Gonzalez. Senator Pelton from Peltonia, should you care to explain, I've got a question. If you want to fund this program, why has this program reverted back the entirety of its funding the past three fiscal years? Members, let's keep in mind, we don't speak directly or invoke names at the well. You speak through the president to facilitate the discussion. Mr. President, thank you for the reminder. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you. The reason that I rise in opposition to this cow is because the $300,000 that this program, worthy as it may be, has been unutilized for my understanding is the past three fiscal years, they have reverted that funding back to the general fund unspent. Would it be helpful? Absolutely. Is there a crisis for rural attorneys? Absolutely, rural DAs and rural PDs. We heard during our Smart Act hearing about the desert, the dearth, of attorneys in entire counties. Why, therefore, have they not utilized the $300,000 that they've had year after year after year? This year, apparently, they're going to use it. But now, they, the good senator from Peltonia wants to steal, uh, uh, take, from, take from one group to give to another? Just a question. The motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 5. Are there any no votes? Senators Coleman, Kirkmeyer, Exum, Gonzalez, Janal, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Danielson. Zenzinger, Marchman, Priola, Sullivan, Hakez Lewis, Henriksen, Fields, Cutter, Michelson Janae, Kolker. Buckner. Members, please do try to pay attention. I, it's kind of funny when your arm is still up after like <laughs> 45 seconds, but I also called on you, Senator Danielson. <laughs> the, with a vote of 15 ayes, 18 noes, zero absent, two excused, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Cal Amendment 7. Amendment 7, Senator Garner, moved to amend the report of the committee as a whole. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Cal Amendment uh, S007. To the amendment. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, members, this is uh, the corresponds to Amendment 7 during Committee of the Whole, uh, or, uh, an amendment uh, by Senator, uh, uh, the Senator from Avon. Uh, and what this bill does is adds uh, $434,000 um, to the Colorado Access to Justice Cash Fund. Now, to be very clear about this, uh, this is not a great deal of money for the needs, but it is something for those who are victims of domestic violence and need counsel and cannot afford it. Those parents who are involved in custody proceedings and cannot afford counsel. Uh, it's very important, and uh, we ask for an I vote. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you uh, to the good senator from Colorado Springs, uh, and he's exactly right. This is about giving a little extra funding to the Access to Justice Commission that this body last year formalized and empowered in statute nearly unanimously, um, and is to provide civil legal assistance. So these are for folks who come across legal challenges in their lives and cannot afford an attorney, uh, and that, but without an attorney can face even more dire consequences financially or with their families. So this helps them with things like domestic violence and protection orders, with divorce, custody, eviction, public health benefits that they need to get, veterans to get their benefits. Uh, it is very important. The commission is doing a great job already after being empowered uh, by this body, but we did not back that bill up with funding. This modest amount of funding could really help them continue some positive momentum and get people the legal services that they need. Encourage an I vote. Senator Gardner. Uh, and so uh, we ask for an I vote and implore you not to pay any attention to the Greek chorus behind us, the, uh, uh, <laughs> the background singers with the counter melody. Vote I. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I assume that if this does pass, you want us to take the $435,000 approximately out of the legislative pot. So um, anyways, I ask for a no vote. See no further discussion. The motion for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 7. Are there any no votes? Are there any no votes? Oh, yeah. No votes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, unanimous. Senators Kirkmeyer, Zenzinger, Gonzalez, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Janal, Danielson, Henriksen, Coleman, Priola, Jaquez Lewis, Cutter, Buckner, Marchman, Kolker. With a vote of 19 ayes, 14 noes, zero absent, two excused, Cow Amendment 7 is passed. <laughs> Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 8. Amendment 8, Senator Malka moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to show Senator that the following Malka Floor Amendment. Senator Malka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Cow Amendment 8. To the amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, members, uh, this amendment is to reverse uh, what we did uh, earlier. Uh, what this amendment does is it's for school nurses. Um, it would provide $1 million uh, specifically to the school nurse grant fund. Uh, these funds uh, go to put school nurses in our rural schools and our Title I schools. Uh, $1 million would fund four school nurses and four schools for five years. <laughs> Uh, we know how important our school nurses are. We know what they mean to our students. Um, and these are some of our most vulnerable students. Um, I would ask for a yes vote. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of uh, Cal Amendment 8, um, largely for the reasons we debated in uh, Second Amendment. Good program. Get more school nurses into the schools. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the motion is Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. We ask for a no vote on Cal Amendment um, S008. Um, this is something that we've already been working towards and putting money, money towards the school nurse grant program. We had a bill, we put um, money from the JVC in it. So um, again, we've already done this and um, would say it's not necessary at this time and ask for a no vote. See no further discussion. The motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 8. Are there no vote? Are there any no votes. Senators Kirkmeyer, Zenzinger, 
Gonzalez, Priola, Coleman, Jaquez Lewis, Henriksen, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Buckner. With a vote of 24 ayes, nine noes, zero absent, two excused, Cal Amendment 8 is passed. Will the clerk please read Cal Amendment 9? Amendment 9, Senator Malika moved to amend the, re amend the report of the Committee of the Whole. Senator Malika. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Amendment 9. To the amendment. To the amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Members, uh, this reverses a uh, motion earlier that we had uh, on Amendment 27 around food banks um, and food pantries. Uh, what this does is this provides a million dollars to our food uh, pantry or food bank uh, grant uh, program, or if those are merged, any future programs. Uh, members, we know groceries have gotten expensive. The cost of living has gotten expensive uh, in every one of our districts. Um, what this does is this makes sure that we are getting money uh, into these food banks and into these food pantries uh, in which some of our most vulnerable constituents uh, utilize, um, not only our families, but our seniors, uh, and that's throughout our state. Uh, I think this is a really important amendment and um, gives an opportunity for, um, for this body to not only fund uh, some really important things, but to send a message that we care about these folks and we want to make sure that uh, some of our most vulnerable members in our communities are able to, uh, to not go to bed hungry and to, to have food in their, uh, in their houses. And so I ask for a yes vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, members, we passed a bill today that um, basically made permanent assistance, I think it was about $4 million, to food, grant, to food banks and food pantry assistant grant programs. I'm just going to remind you that we passed a summer EBT program. We just put um, an additional $56 million out of the state education fund into healthy meals for um, all kids. Uh, for, the, for this year and next year to fund that program and make sure there's enough money there. Last year we put anywhere from 14 million plus into the food assistance, um, pantry assistance and food bank program. So um, again, it's a million dollars from general fund, just so we all understand, it's gonna have to come out of one of those pots that's on page 181 of your budget. Because if you remember looking at page seven, line 28, um, when we presented this budget to you, there's absolutely no room other than coming out of one of those pots. So at this point, I'm assuming it's either going to come out of one of the governor's pots or it will come out of the legislative pot if this should, if this should pass. So and um, I would encourage a no vote. Seeing no further discussion, the motion for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 9. Are there any no votes? Senators Baisley, Kirkmeyer, Rich, Gardner, Minority Leader Lundin, Zenzinger, Smallwood, Buckner, Gonzalez, Janal, Coleman, Jaquez Lewis. With a vote of 21 ayes, 12 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, Cal Amendment 9 is passed. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 11. Amendment 11, Senator, Pelton. Senator Peltonar. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cow Amendment 11. To the amendment. Thank you. Uh, two uh, legislative sessions ago, uh, $60 million was split between uh, the Rio Grande River Basin and the Republican River for compact compliance to uh, buy up wells and retire these wells uh, so we can stay in compliance. If we go out of compliance, there's a big fine in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, this is asking for 10 million to be split between the two basins and uh, from general fund and from the governor's uh, shared priorities. So I'd ask for a yes vote. See no further discussion. The motion be Senator Zenzinger. We would ask for a no vote on this amendment. While we understand uh, the goals of this program, it is $10 million general fund. Uh, and I just want to uh, remind you that we did put uh, an enormous amount of money, $16 million into this program last year. 
Uh, and uh, we made a general fund commitment to close the gap while we were waiting for uh, the money to come through from the uh, sports uh, gaming. So we covered the gap for that uh, for the year while we were waiting for those funds to collect. Um, this is one of these programs that has a dedicated revenue source. It's supposed to come out of that pot of money, not from our general fund. So I would uh, very much ask uh, that we do not plus up um, this uh, by $10 million, um, and please vote no. Senator Felton. Thank you, Mr. President. Just to remind the JBC, that money is almost depleted. They have done a very good job of retiring acres, retiring wells, so uh, I'd ask for a yes vote. Senator Simpson. Thank you, Mr. President. Just a correction, the funding for this program was one-time ARPA dollars. There is no continuous funding for this program. It doesn't come from sports betting. Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, or Mr. President, excuse me, sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> members, we have severance tax dollars that go into an operational account. We also have severance tax dollars that go into a perpetual base account, and it's in the Department of Natural Resources. Um, within that account is the CWCB, and they fund all the water projects. Currently, there's somewhere over a $200 million reserve in that account that they keep, so there's plenty of money. This project would be appropriate for them to go through the CD CWCB project list and get funded along with all the other water projects throughout the state of Colorado. I would ask for a no vote. Senator Kirkmeyer will be fined for calling me the chair in the amount of $10 million. <laughs> so apologies, Senator Pelton, but there's no money left. <laughs> Senator Kirkmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'll be sure to take that out of the governor's shared priority. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor of that? The motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 11. Are there any no votes? Senators Hansen. Kirkmeyer, Zenzinger, Exum, Gonzalez, Janal, Danielson, Kolker, Marchman, Fields, Henriksen, Sullivan, Coleman, Hakez Lewis, Cutter, Michelson Janay, Buckner, Priola, Majority Leader Rodriguez. Please add the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 20 noes, zero absent to excuse, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 12? Amendment 12, Senator Van Winkle, moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Hall to show the following Winkle. Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Amendment 12. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. This amendment would fund critical projects to manage, conserve water, improve agriculture and much more. It's the basically funding grant applications through the water plan. Uh, 52 water grant applications were distributed, were approved, but more than 70, actually a record, 70 applications came in, and this would take care of the remainder of those to move the water plan along a little bit faster. Thank you, Mr. President, I ask for a yes vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, while I, I truly believe there's a great importance in the water plan, it has a dedicated source of funding and the general fund is not it. So I would ask for a no vote on um, this cow amendment. The motion before the body is the adoption of cow amendment 12. Are there any no votes? Senators Exum, Hansen, Kirkmeyer, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Zenzinger, Gonzalez, Kolker, Danielson, Janal. Marchman, Sullivan, Coleman, Hakez Lewis, Henriksen, Fields, Priola, Cutter, Michael Sinjane. Buckner, please add the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 20 noes, zero absent to excuse, the motion is lost. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 13? 
Amendment 13, Senator Van Winkle moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to show that the following Van Winkle floor amendment, J150, Amendment 45 to House Bill 1430, did Senator pass. Senator Van Winkle. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cow Amendment 13. To the amendment. And what this would do, it's uh, somewhat similar in the same, but a completely different subject, in which this would fund those uh, high need emergency repairs at schools uh, through the school safety disbursement program. Uh, these are schools that applied that said we, we have, uh, we know our schools that don't have cameras, we have broken locks, we have broken doors, uh, something like that. Something that is essentially a tier one high security need uh, that they are looking for money for. We do have uh, the school safety disbursement program which uh, received 125 grant applications and these again are for specific needs. Um, only 66 of the applications were selected to receive the funds this year. They went all throughout the state of Colorado, uh, Adams, Boulder, so on and so forth to, well, 66 different districts, all the way to St. Brain Steamboat, a Tennyson Center, um, all over the state of Colorado. This would fulfill those needs to make sure that every application that came in for an emergency school security need gets fulfilled. I ask for a yes vote. Senator Zenzinger. Thank you, Mr. President. Unfortunately, uh, this cash fund ends at the end of this current year. So um, the fund doesn't exist in the bu next budget year, which is what we are debating today. So please vote no. Motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 13. Are there any no votes? Senator Zenzinger, Kirkmeyer, Roberts, Hansen, Exum, Coleman, Fields, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Danielson, Janal, Marchman, Gonzalez, Priola, Buckner, Michelson Janay, Cutter, Henriksen, Sullivan, Hakez Lewis. Please add the president. With a vote of 13 ayes, 20 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 14. Amendment 14, Senator, Senator Van Winkle, moved to amend. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Amendment 14. To the amendment. Number 14, cow amendment. Number one in your hearts, members. Now, this is actually the same fund as last time. There are, uh, there seems to be some disagreement about this because when the bill was drafted last year and passed. It did get folded into the overall Office of School Security, the Office of School Safety. And uh, at the time, it had a 10-year sunset. It had a one-year appropriation for funding, but the account itself was to be open for 10 years. So unless something has changed in law since then, um, I do believe that the account and the board that oversees the grant program will still be in existence in statute for 10 years. They just need the funding for it, but again, uh, that can be decided at a later point. What faces us and the people of Colorado, Colorado right now is we have funded only 37% of the imminent uh, tier one emergency needs that schools say that they need to fund them. And so what this $4 million was, the previous amendment was for 27 to fund all those grants. This would fund a few more of those grants that are schools coming to us, the General Assembly, schools coming to this grant program and saying we have an absolute need for, uh, it can be all kinds of things. It can be training for the employees of the school. It can be locks on doors. It can be windows. It can be cameras. It can be um, to upgrade um, communication systems so that if there is an incident, the people in the school are able to relay directly with first responders in emergency uh, response doesn't even need to be actually for uh, the worst case scenario. It could be an allergic reaction. It could be things like that that this money is used for to upgrade things like the communications, like the locks and the doors and things like that. Again, we were able to fund only 37% of those uh, high need school security uh, requests. 37% is far too low when we're talking about our kids and the faculty on our K through 12 campuses um, that need true security and true attention. And so I asked for this as uh, only $4 million opposed to the $27 million that would fulfill all those security needs. And um, 
If we need a late build to extend the grant program one more year than we should because there's clearly a need for uh, the people of Colorado and for our teachers and students to have safe learning environments where the kids don't have to fear for their health and safety and the parents don't have to fear sending their kids to those schools every day. So these are schools that came to the General Assembly, they came to the grant program and said, we have this specific need. Please fund it, and only 37% of those got funded. I asked for a yes vote. Senator Lundy. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of Cal 14. So many of the things we do around trying to make the children in our schools safer it, are rooted in great ideas. Sometimes they're rooted in ideological passion. Um, but this is actually something practical. This is the sort of thing that actually just extends and expands what we are already doing to make the students and people that work in our schools safer. I urge your support of 14. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask for a no vote on uh, this amendment. The motion for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 14. Are there any no votes? Senator Zenzinger, Kirkmeyer, Exum, Hansen, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Danielson, Janal, Marchman, Fields, Henriksen, Sullivan, Jaquez Lewis, Coleman, Priola, Buckner, Gonzalez, Michael Sinjane, Cutter. Please add the president. With a vote of 14 ayes, 19 noes, 0 absent, 2 excused, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Cal Amendment 15. Amendment 15, Senator Will. Senator Will. Amend. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Cal Amendment 15. To the amendment. So what we're doing here is taking $13 million cash funds from the State Highway Fund and putting it into the construction, maintenance, and operation. We hear that from our uh, local uh, CDOT employees and stuff that they're budget has been uh, reduced as much as uh, 60 percent in some areas for their uh, maintenance operations so uh, we need to do this and fix our roads. Senator Pelton. Thank you Mr. President. Uh, my district has three different states that border it uh, so I go in and out of those states every once in a while I tell you what, guys, you got to make sure you got your beer open before you cross that state line. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to spill it all over everywhere. So we need this money to work on maintenance, and uh, I'd ask uh, for a yes vote. Doesn't get better than that. Yeah. Senator Kirkmeyer. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I ask for a no vote on Cal Amendment 015. Um, I think there would be issues here with trying to figure out how to um, Appropriate funds for administration and then use it into the construction, maintenance, and operations, $13 million. Um, not sure that it would go specifically to the projects that uh, the good senators are asking for because um, it could go anywhere within the state. It would probably just be put right into a maintenance fund um, into one of their pots over there. So um, I would ask for a no vote on Cal Amendment S015. Motion for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 15. Are there any no votes? Senator Zenzinger, Kirkmeyer, Hansen, Roberts, Mollica, Exum, Majority Leader Rodriguez, Fields, Gonzalez, Janal, Danielson, Parchman, Sullivan, Priola, Henriksen, Cutter, Hakez Lewis, Coleman, Marchman, or sorry, Michael Sinjane, Buckner. Please add the president. With a vote of 12 ayes, 21 noes, 0 absent, to excuse, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 16? Amendment 16, Senator, Senator Pelton. Pelton R. Thank you, Mr. President. I move Cal Amendment 16. To the amendment. You know, I think this is the last cow amendment I've got. Uh, oh my God, thank you. 
<laughs> what this one does, if you are in a department that has a vacancy, this will strip the funding away for those vacancies. So it's a good way to trim back uh, our state government. It's time it has a haircut, and this is a good way to start. So I'd urge the yes vote. The motion for the Senator, Van, Senator Zenzinger. Thank you. Please vote no. The motion for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 16. Are there any no votes? Senators Hansen, Kirk Meyer, Roberts, Mullica, Exum, Zenzinger, Gonzalez, Kolker, Janal, Danielson, Jordan Lee Rodriguez. Marchman, Fields, Henriksen, Sullivan, Aquez Lewis, Coleman, Cutter, Priola, Michael Sinjane, Buckner. Please add the president. With a vote of 11 ayes, 22 noes, 0 absent, to excuse, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 17. Amendment 17, Senator Will, move to amend the report of the Committee Senator of the Will. Whole to show. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Cal Amendment 17. To the amendment. So what this amendment we talked about, it's for the uh, safe passage. Uh, Will, and we're going to take uh, one, one and a half million, and we talked about it's, uh, it's four to one funding, so we're by not doing this, we're really missing out on federal funding, and the good Senator from Monument pointed out that's uh, one and a half million versus uh, 7.5 million. And uh, you know, in, in the United States, there's a, do you know that every 26 seconds, there's a, uh, there's an animal strike on the highways? Every 26 seconds. Yeah, and, and there can soon to be wolves in Colorado. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's also the economic impact is, is huge. And you know, there's a little over 500,000 people employed in, in Colorado, you know, generating about almost $10 billion in local and state tax revenue, but protecting these wildlife corridors is important. There's uh, just in Colorado about an $80 million cost to Coloradans for these vehicle strikes, but um, just for leverage of money, I think this is a good I vote for this amendment. So i ask for an I vote, thank you. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I think everybody needs to remember that for the most part, we don't put general fund into the Department of Transportation except on for, for some fairly rare occasions. So my suggestion would be is that you contact your transportation commissioner and tell them to put this into their budget and take care of their safe passages fund line. Um, with that, I would um, encourage a no vote. The motion for the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 17. Are there any no votes? Senators Pelton B. Hansen. Kirkmeyer. Zenzinger. Exum. Gonzalez, Janal, Sullivan, Coleman, Hakez Lewis, Kolker, Danielson, Marchman, Henriksen, Cutter, Michelson Janay, Buckner, Priola, Fields, Majority Leader Rodriguez. Please have the president. With a vote of 12 ayes, 21 noes, zero absent to excuse, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Amendment 1 to House Bill 1389? Amendment 1, Senator Gardner, Senator Gardner. to amend. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move. Uh, S001 to House Bill 1389. To the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, members, you will not remember voting on this on second reading because I was uh, busy counting votes on something else. But as our rules allow, I can run this amendment on a cow and say that even though I didn't exist, it did pass. Now, uh, this is a very important amendment because it does something somewhat unusual. 
1389 uh, appropriated some um, $24 million to K-12 for the impact of recent immigrants. Now, that $24 million had to come from somewhere, and it came from the state education fund. And we have an obligation under federal law to educate those children, which I think is a positive and important thing to do. But it is a federal requirement. So what do we do? I mean, we've, we've sent letters. I think some of you on both sides of the aisle have participated in letters to Washington saying, step up, bear your responsibility. Um, I haven't seen any money. So what does this amendment do? This amendment says, you know, it says it very legally, but you know, there's some money that we probably, that we got from the federal government and we haven't spent all of it and it would have to be sent back to you. Um, but we're not gonna spend, send back $24 million. We're gonna do what in the law is called a set off. And that is when somebody owes you money and you owe them money and um, you, you gotta go in there, you say, well, I'm gonna, pay, uh, I'm gonna pay you what I owe you, but I'm gonna keep what you owe me. So this is a $24 million set off to the federal government for the impact. Uh, again, this is not about the merits of that $24 million. We needed to do that. We needed to step up and do that. But we need to tell the federal government that uh, of all those federal dollars, when we send them back, we're keeping $24 million. Uh, we're keeping $24 million because that's what the failure uh, to fund or to control or any way you want to look at it uh, has cost us that much and more. So I ask for an aye vote. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the idea here. I sincerely do. I think it's, you know, we're trying to hold the federal government accountable for a problem that was created by the federal government that now our taxpayers are foot in the bill. So I certainly appreciate your comments, um, and I wish we could do it. The problem is this. First of all, we are swapping out, because you're, you're speaking here to using the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, and we are swapping out all of the ARPA funds. Remember, we talked about this before, where we're swapping out the ARPA funds um, with general fund monies so that we end up turning them around and creating one-time general fund monies. This way we are ensured that we have all the funds, don't have to worry about whether or not they're obligated, that we know we will get them spent because we're doing that, and we're doing that by um, swapping out funds for personal services, again, to assure that we get all the funds spent. So first of all, there isn't any money that we are not spending, so we don't have any money that we are sending back to the federal government. Because um, we're spending, we're gonna be spending all the money, and we're swapping it out. The second thing is there are requirements within federal funds that come to the state um, that the state cannot keep federal funds for a different purpose other than the intended purpose by which the federal funds were given to us for. So we would just end up with a disallowance and we would have to basically still pay back the funds. So um, that comes out of the Department of Treasury and other departments at the federal level. So why, again, I appreciate the sentiment here, and I understand what you're trying, to, what you are trying to make a statement on. This is just something that um, the state controller does not get to retain 24 million dollars um, to make up for the 24 million dollars that we are taking out of the state education fund that came from school district property taxes. I, I wish we could, but we just can't. So I would urge a no vote on this amendment for those reasons. Senator Zenzinger. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I agree with my colleague. Um, I would ask for a no vote. Um, the way that we were able to pay for this is, uh, if re you'll recall during the mid-year adjustment, uh, the state's share for education funding went down uh, and our obligation was reduced. And as a result, we took that 
funds, those funds, and we put them in the state education fund so that they would stay within the nexus of education. And that is what we are utilizing for the purposes of this bill. And the reason for that is, is because these students are in our public schools, but were not counted during the October 1 count. Now that always happens every year, um, that you'll have um, uh, students that will not be present during the November 1 uh, count. But this was an extraordinary number of students that came in post the count. Um, so much so that it was creating burdens on our school districts. And so it made sense to us that because we were able to lessen our share during the mid-year adjustment uh, and uh, to pledge these funds that were for the purposes of education to stay within the purposes of education in order to um, uh, accommodate the needs of all of our children that are currently in our public schools. So um, I, I, I too appreciate the sentiment, uh, but we truly feel as if uh, we have this covered um, because of um, our, our the way that we are choosing to spend these reverted funds um, in, in uh, the state education fund. They're there for the purposes of education and that's what we are utilizing them for. And so I would ask for a no vote on this cow. Senator Gonzalez. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I rise in opposition to S001 to House Bill 1389. In June of 1982, the Supreme Court issued Plyler v. Doe, holding that states cannot constitutionally deny students a free public education on account of their immigration status. Quoting from that decision, by denying these children a basic education, we deny them the ability to live within the structure of our civic institutions and foreclose any realistic possibility that they will contribute in even the smallest way to the progress of our nation. The court also said that holding children accountable for their parents' actions does not comport with fundamental conceptions of justice. What we have done by ensuring that students who may be new to country are able to access education and that our schools are able to continue to function, therefore comports with long-standing, long-standing justice uh, precedents uh, from the Supreme Court. To then stay well, we're gonna withhold our reimbursement in order to, um, in order to um, uh, not fully reimburse the Department of the uh, Treasury pursuant to the Federal American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. There's no nexus. There's no plan. I ask for a no vote on S001. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. That was close. Almost cost you that another $10 million. Dollars. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Members, I think there's some confusion here. The amendment didn't ask that we withheld money from funding for the school districts that are being and the children that are in our schools, existing children in our school that are being impacted by these new arrivals. So that's not what the amendment asked for. The amendment said, look, federal government, you caused this problem. You should be paying for it. And the only way that we think we can get you to pay for it is, is if federal funds that come to us that maybe will go unspent for some other reason, that we don't send those back to the federal government and that we keep those here because we think the federal government should fund this. And that's what I was speaking to when I said, I understand where this amendment's coming from, I understand what we're talking about. Because members, um, I hope you all read the legislative declaration with regard to this bill. I know we've all, I know a lot of us approach this funding from a different point of view. 
I think we all understand that there is a federal government directive that requires the states to provide a uniform public education. We have to fund these children, these new arrivals, by which we're calling them. And we can't call them immigrants in the bill, and we can't call them migrants in the bill, because those terminologies have a different definition, and it doesn't work. It just messes things up. We also have a requirement in our state constitution that requires us, again, that we are supposed to fund, the, fund children that are within our schools, that we have to do that. I think we all realize that we are in the midst of a government-made crisis. And I think the good senator from El Paso County was saying the government was the federal government by not securing the border. That they've made a government-made crisis and that people who are not American citizens have come to our country by their choice and have created an issue in terms of the health, safety, and welfare, well-being of the children that are in our schools, the existing children that are in our schools. It's also impacting, as we all know, our citizens in need of medical care, our legal residents who live in poverty, and our hardworking, taxpaying Coloradoans. It's a difficult situation that we are in. But from my perspective, the reason I was willing to put my name on this bill is because I want you to look on page three in the legislative declaration. The influx of new arrival students highlights the critical need for increased funding. This sudden influx has strained existing school infrastructure and staffing led to overcrowded classrooms, stretched resources, and increased complexity to the student learning environment. The schools are scrambling to accommodate this influx. No one is saying that we don't meet our responsibility here. We aren't saying that new arrival students, in fact, this legislative declaration speaks to that new arrival students face unique challenges, including language barriers cultural adjustments, and various academic backgrounds, and that these unique challenges require specialized resources and support services. But what we're also saying is, it's not just about the new arrival students. It is about the existing students that are in our schools. And while there may be hundreds of new arrival students in the Denver public school system, or in the Aurora school system, there may only be five or 10 in the Platte Valley school system, but that five or 10 is disrupting the learning environment for the existing students that are there and putting stress on the entire system. So that's why I put my name on this bill. Why I think this is so important. Schools are sc scrambling. We have trauma on the system essentially. There are a lot of challenges here that we're trying to deal with. We have schools where resources have been directed away and redirected away from existing students to support English learner programs for new arrivals. And I don't think that's fair to our existing students. So when we had this opportunity, because of the reverted dollars, the $24 million of reverted dollars, we are able, we are able to fund this in a way that helps our school districts throughout the state. This is not just a problem throughout the Front Range or in the Denver metro area. This is a problem throughout the state. But for me, it's about making sure that our existing students have the resources and the school infrastructure system that they need so that it doesn't interrupt their learning environment. That's the importance of this. So again, the amendment is not about taking money away. It's not what it's about. The amendment is to say, look, federal government, you caused the problem. You should be funding this. It shouldn't be on our taxpayers here in the state. That's what that amendment says. And if I thought we could actually do it, I'd vote for that amendment. But it's just not able for us to do that amendment the way it's written and I'm not sure that you could write it in a way that we could do it. So that's why I asked for a no vote. Mr. Minority Leader. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President. I rise in vigorous support of House Bill 1389 and also in support of Amendment 1. The reason I support House Bill 1389, as I have argued earlier this evening, and I will argue again, I think, in a few moments, we need to fund all students in Colorado with equity. We need to fund all students in Colorado the same if they're in public schools, whether they're an unanticipated new arrival, just came in last week, or they're a fifth generation Colorado student. We need to fund all students at the same level, whether they participate in the public school system through a district authorized charter, a district neighborhood school, or a CSI authorized charter school. The same, those students in those schools, whether they are an unanticipated new arrival in that school, or whether they are a fifth generation Coloradan in that school. We have a legal responsibility to do that, and I would argue we have a moral responsibility to do that. This amendment says simply, federal government, we live by different rules than you do. We don't print money here in Colorado. You do. We have to balance our budget here in Colorado. You don't. We're going to, because possession is nine-tenths of the law, hang on to money that maybe we were supposed to send back to you, but we're using now to meet the moral obligation to fund all students the same in Colorado and make sure we're caring for them, whether they are new unanticipated arrivals or fifth generation Colorado students, or regardless of what school environment they're in. So I urge your support of 001. It simply says, hey, Uncle Sam, do your part. Senator Gardner. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, um, there seemed to be some confusion about what my amendment does, so I appreciate the senator from Monument making it very clear, um, and I, I agree with him wholeheartedly. And I thank the senator from Denver for, um, for uh, referencing the United States Supreme Court case, uh, rightly decided in my view. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any objection. Uh, I voted for and will vote for on thirds, 1389. But the obligation which we have, which is either, and you can characterize it a couple of ways. You can say that's because I have several thousand, and in small school districts, maybe just two, but two who have great needs and are entitled to an equitable education. And the other way to say it is, well, the school then has to send all that, and our existing children um, don't have the money. It's an impact. It's an impact because the federal government has not done its duty. And if you take objection to that, uh, we can spend some time finding the letters signed by the governor and others in this chamber, both sides of the aisle, saying, federal government, fund your responsibility. Now, um, some, some argued and said, well, you just can't do this. You just can't do this. Well, when I was struggling through law school the second time, I took a particular course at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. on federal appropriations law. And yeah, yeah, they sent the, they sent the money here and said, you got to use it for the, these purposes. Okay. They also had some other law that said things were their responsibility. Um, and the senator from Monument, who can proudly say he never attended law school at all, states one of the fundamental rules of law, which is possession is nine-tenths of it. So if we set it off and we keep it, 
and the federal government says, give it back to me? Are they going to send the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Space Force to, to take it? I think they'll go to federal court. And we'll have that discussion there. We will have that discussion there. That's what the purpose of this amendment is. To hold those $24 million, which is a clear, and I, and I chose it carefully, it is a clear impact resulting from the failure of the federal government to deal with the immigration problem at our border. And again, let me reiterate, elected officials of both parties at all levels have sent letters to the federal government saying, this is yours to deal with, pay the bill. All this is doing is holding the money and saying, you didn't pay your bill. We kept the money. You want to sue me in federal court? Let's have that discussion. I think that'll be the front page of the Denver Post, and I'd love it to be there. It'll probably be the front page of the Washington Post if we do this. And I think that wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, everybody wants Colorado to be number one? Let's be number one. I ask for an I vote. The motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 1 to House Bill 1389. Are there any no votes? Senators Kirkmeyer, Zenzinger, Danielson, Hansen, Roberts, Mullica, Exum, Gonzalez, Janal. Fields, Henriksen, Sullivan, Marchman, Colker, Majority Leader Rodriguez. I got you, Henriksen. Coleman, Hawkes Lewis, Cutter, Michelson Janay, Buckner, Priola. Please have the president. With a vote of 11 ayes, 22 noes, 0 absent to excuse, the amendment is lost. Will the clerk please read Cow Amendment 2 to House Bill 1394? Amendment 2, Senator Coker moves Senator to Coker. amend. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Cow Amendment 2 to House Bill 1394. To the amendment. Thank you. Uh, we have a full, almost full get, uh, staff here today, and everyone's back. Um, we had a nice, lively debate about this amendment originally. Uh, I'm just going to summarize it so that uh, for those that missed out can, can get up to speed. This amendment is saying that the amendment we ran passed, and the amendment that we ran, that I ran for 1394, was to say that the CSI mill levy equalization funds will be subject to available appropriations and that they shall review those annually. Annually. To me, that is a fiscally responsible move, making sure we keep oversight and that we have the money each year. This does not reduce the appropriation for this year. This year's appropriation is 49 million. Does it touch it? Does it change it? One bit. But if you do the math and you have to do some research, you have to look at some spreadsheets, you have to go to CDE, even contact JBC, and look at the PPR, and colleagues, PPR is the, the amount that we spend per pupil, per pupil so that we can Make it apples to apples. Doesn't matter if it's district, doesn't matter if it's school. It's apples to apples. So if we say $10,000 per pupil, that's $10,000 per pupil. They're getting the same funding. This amendment says we don't know if it's full funding because we don't know what full funding is. 
the current amount that we have appropriated actually appropriates more money to the CSI schools, the state approved, state approved charter schools. It actually appropriates more money on a per pupil rate than the schools in those districts. I gave some examples to refresh your memory. Adams, five, five star Adams, 12. Next year's appropriation is expected to be $11,260 per pupil. With the $49 million mill levy equalization, the charter schools in Adams 12 will get 13,600. Again, 13,600 versus 11,260. Again, I'm not changing that. We talked a lot about making sure everyone is funded equally. I'm just pointing out they're not with this $49 million. And that we should, going forward, review and check and make sure that these numbers are equal. That was Adams. In my county that I represent, Jefferson County, their per pupil in the Jefferson County Schools is 11,028 for next year. Based on this appropriation, the, charters, the CSI charters in Jeffco will get 12,500. That's a $1,500 difference per pupil for each little person. That's what they're going to get. So I am not changing anything about the appropriation. I am saying, let's be fiscally responsible. Let's review subject to available appropriations. And I strongly encourage an I vote on this cow amendment. Thank you. Senator Marchman. Thank you, Mr. President. And I too rise in strong support of this cow amendment. Like I said earlier, there are only 10 states in the whole country that have a CSI type state authorizer. And most of those end up just authorizing all the schools. There's not local education associations also doing this. So what we do year after year since 2018, I don't know what shifted in 2018. I was kind of watching this building when I was teaching schools and kind of excited about changes that were happening in 2018 in this building and my hopes for positive school funding. But now I get it. We actually want to be a national leader in charter schools, even though we can't afford it, even though we can't afford it. So I support this amendment because um, Colorado is the only state in the nation today that pays both their local taxes for district charters as well as for state CSI charters. Again, Nevada has their counties pay and Tennessee has their districts pay. And so if we were to get to that type of a model, we'd be looking at $49 million school districts would send to their state to allow CSI kiddos to go to their schools. This amendment will simply cause us an opportunity to stop and say, you know what? There are $20 million of best funds that don't get to go to 98% of our students. And we can't really afford to spend all of this money on the 2%. Um, and so I ask for your I vote on this cow amendment. Senator Kirkmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> and thank you to my colleagues who brought the amendment forward and are having this discussion. I appreciate that we are making sure that we're being fiscally conservative, fiscally prudent, and um, doing our jobs. I think we all strive for transparency and accountability, and I appreciate that you wanna make sure that we're doing our jobs. I would start off, first of all, by just saying that um, the CSI, the charter schools, they are considered public schools. They are a public school. These are public school students who are in charter schools. And the Constitution requires that we have fair, uniform, and thorough public school system, and this is part of our public school system. 
I appreciate that we want to make sure that um, it's subject to available appropriations and that um, we review and look at things annually. <clears throat> the fact that this is not continuously appropriated into any cash fund tells you that we will be reviewing and looking at it annually. We appropriate annually. Everything, everything is subject to available appropriations. Everything is subject to available funds. That's why we spend the hours that we do trying to figure out how we make sure we have a balanced budget. But everything that we do is subject to available appropriations. I mean, sure, we could put it in there again, but the fact of the matter is, it's already that way. <clears throat> we, already are review we already will review annually because, again, we're not continuously appropriating to a cash fund. We're not just transferring money over to a cash fund. I would remind you that as we do um, our school funding, we don't know what total program amount is, but we still fully fund it. We figure out what it is based on the information that we receive in that fiscal year. That's how budgets work. The thing is, when we're looking at mill levies, those are based on property values and assess values, and those change. There could be a different mix between residential and commercial, between residential, commercial, or industrial, but property values change. Assess values change. And I also want to make sure that everybody's aware that the amount of funding that a public school student receives in a charter school is equal to what the amount of funding is in that school district, their peer in that school district in another school. They don't receive more. It's against the law for that to happen. So peer to peer, in that same school district, the funding is the same. They can't fund them more. We can't fund them more in a charter school. So I appreciate the, the discussion, I do. I think it's wonderful that we wanna make sure that we're held accountable, that we're transparent, and that we're being fiscally prudent. But I would still urge a no vote on amendment S002. Thank you. Senator Colker. Thank you. I just want to say one last thing. The bill doesn't say annually, even though the good senator from Weld County says that we're going to be looking at it. I just want to say, let's say it annually. Let's put it in. What's wrong with this amendment? Put it in. Say annually. That's all. Thank you. No, I don't. Mr. Minority Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, um, I won't repeat the arguments I made earlier because I'm pretty sure even those of you who were not in the chamber heard them. I, I was a, a little bit uh, exercised. Um, we, we started the day um, as we passed the School Finance Act celebrating the elimination of the budget stabilization factor, making sure that everybody understands that the funding of uh, the school students of Colorado is our priority <clears throat> and that we will do it at the constitutionally required level. At the same time, with the same bill that we passed last year, the School Finance Act, the language I wrote and was able to carry with the senator from Arvada, we eliminated the disequity, the inequity that we were funding some students in public schools at lower levels than other students. In some cases, I argue, the very siblings that live in the same household. We banished both the budget stabilization factor and that disequity among funding among public school students in Colorado. This particular amendment says, well, we, we kind of sort of want to banish that, but we kind of sort of really want to hold those 22, no, excuse me, I think it's 44,000, uh, that's incorrect, I want to be precise, it's 22,000 students in 40-ish schools. We want to hold them to a different standard, a lower standard. We don't want to treat them as the same as the, their siblings and peers in public education. I, I urge your opposition to this, Cal, thank you. The motion before the body is the adoption of Cal Amendment 2 to House Bill 1394. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Will, Baisley, Rich, Gardner, Minority Leader Lundeen, Zenzinger, Kirkmeyer, Liston, 
Smallwood, Pelton B, Pelton R, Simpson, Hansen, Roberts, Malika, Exum, Janal, Fields, Priola, Coleman, Michelson, Janae, Buckner. Please add the president. With a vote of nine ayes, 24 noes, zero absent, to excuse, the amendment is lost. The motion before the body is the adoption of the Committee of the Whole Report. Are there any no votes? Senators Van Winkle, Smallwood, Pelton R, Baisley. With a vote of 29 ayes, four noes, zero absent to excuse, the Committee of the Whole Report is adopted. Hey, Senate Bill 188 is amended, passed, and taken, reading, ordered, and engrossed, and placed on the calendar for third reading and final passage. House Bill 1430 is amended, 1389, 1400, 1401, 1403, 1408, 1410 is amended, 1415, 1416, 1417, 1418, 1419, 1420, 1421, 1425 is amended, 1426, 1390 is amended, House Bill 1392 is amended, 1394, 1395, 1413 is amended, 1422 as amended, pass on second reading, order revised, and place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Sign the bills. April 4th, 2024, the speaker has signed Senate Bills 21, 35, 56, 99, 138, 148, and 155. Introduction of bills. Senate Bill 198 by Senators Fenberg and Michelson Janay, and Representatives Brown and McCormick concerning measures to support the implementation of the state's regulated natural medicine program. Finance. Senate Bill 199 by Senators Roberts and Wilbur and Representatives McCormick and Catlin concerning an appropriation for species conservation trust fund projects. Agriculture and natural resources. Message from the House. April 4th, 2024. Mr. President, the House, excuse me, the House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Reiser Statutes, House Bill 1230. The House has passed on third reading and returns here with Senate Bill 134 and Senate Bill 128. The House has passed on third reading and transmitted to the Reiser Statutes, Senate Bill 73, amended as printed in the House Journal April 3rd, 2024. Message from the Reiser. <clears throat> April 4th, 2024. We herewith transmit without comment House Bill 1230 without comment as amended, Senate Bill 73. Message from the Governor. <clears throat> April 4th, 2024, honorable members of the Colorado Senate, pursuant to the authority vested in the office of the Governor of the State of Colorado, I have the honor to inform you that I have approved and filed with the Secretary of State the following act, Senate Bill 17, distribution of state share of district total program. Approved on Thursday, April 4th, 2024 at 3.30 p.m., Senate Bill 71, seasonal outdoor adventure day camp program, Approved on, Thursday, approved on Thursday, April 4th, 2024, at 3.30 p.m., Senate Bill 74, jurisdiction over United States military property. Approved on Thursday, April 4th, 2024, at 12.30 p.m., Senate Bill 79, motorcycle lane filtering and passing. Approved on Thursday, April 4th, 2024, at 12.30 p.m., Senate Bill 93, continuity of health care coverage change. Approved on Thursday, April 4th, 2024, at 12.30 p.m., Senate Bill 105, clarifying environmental response surcharge. Approved on Thursday, April 4th, 2024, at 12.30 p.m. Delivery to the governor. April 4th, 2024, to the Governor for signature on Thursday, April 4th, 2024, at 3.45 p.m., Senate Bills 21, 35, 56, 99, 138, 148, and 155. Announcements, announcements, announcements. <laughs> that was what my Boy Scout troop used to do. <laughs> Senator Priola. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, put one of these on your desk. There's going to be a golf fundraiser this uh, summer, June 26th. Uh, at Arrowhead Golf Course, which is one of the more beautiful ones along the Front Range. Hope you can uh, join us. It's for um, substance use recovery fundraiser for the tribe um, recovery homes. Hope you can join us. Mr. Majority Leader. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, for a long day. A lot of work done. Um, Mr. President, I move the Senate adjourn until 9 a.m. Friday, April 5th, 2024. You have heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. No. All those opposed, no? No. The ayes have it, and the Senate will adjourn until 9 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs>